Convincing Him, Book Nine of the Ramsey Brothers Series. Written by Josephine Bintema. Narrated by Josephine Bintema. Chapter One. When Brittany was eight years old, her parents moved to a new house. Everything was new. New nanny, new housekeeper, new school, new teacher, and new students. While Brittany didn't enjoy change, she was told by her daddy she would have to accept that things were going to be different in their new life. He had landed an important job, working with an important man, which meant he couldn't spend as much time with her and mommy. But Daddy knew Brittany would do just fine. All she had to do was focus on her goals, and she could do anything she set her mind to. Two weeks into her new school, Brittany felt like she wasn't fitting in very well. She missed her old friends. It didn't help when one of the girls had called her a teacher's pet. Brittany liked to know the answers. Daddy encouraged her to learn everything she could. He said the more she knew the more successful in life she would be. While she was getting good marks, she wasn't making new friends. Then it happened. One of the boys in her class tripped her at recess. Brittany fell hard on the grass, her knee and wrist stinging from the impact. For a moment she lay stunned on the ground. No one had ever been so mean to her before. Children's laughter filled her ears, and Brittany looked up to see a group of kids giggling and pointing at her. What are you going to do, teacher's pet? One of her antagonists taunted. Are you going to be a tattletale too? Another asked. Maybe she'll cry, a boy said callously. Cry, baby. I won't cry, Brittany viciously told herself. Instinctively, she knew crying would be a bigger humiliation. Ignoring the twinge in her wrist, she stumbled to her feet, biting the inside of her cheek to prevent any tears. Taking a quivering breath, she waited to see what they would do next. Are you okay? Brittany squinted against the sun as she turned to look at the newcomer. He was tossing a soccer ball between two hands, dark hair barely visible in the sun, as it backlit his tall, skinny form. She found herself replying, I'm okay. He gave her a last look before tossing the ball at the boy who had tripped her. Come on, let's play soccer. The boys all followed him out to the field. Left behind, the rest of the crowd scattered to play their own games. Brittany looked around to see one of the nerdier kids reading a book. Hey, who was that? Gabe Ramsley, he informed her, pushing up his glasses. He's a great ahead of us. Brittany looked at her rescuer easily dodging the other boys as he smoothly kicked the ball across the soccer field. He grinned happily as he scored a goal, his team slapping him on the back and high-fiving him. Before meeting Gabe, Brittany had always found the princess movies her nanny made her watch to be a bit silly. Why did the boy prince always get to rescue the girl princess? Why couldn't the princess just rescue herself? Daddy always said people would do whatever they wanted if they just worked hard enough. Brittany often wondered if the girl princesses were just lazy. Now, for the first time in her life, Brittany understood those movies. Being rescued from a hard situation was a nice thing. As she watched Gabe race across the grass, her heart fluttered a little in her chest. The next day, she asked if she could sit beside him at lunch in the cafeteria. He said no. Undeterred, Brittany asked if she could play soccer with his group. He said no because girls have cooties. Brittany thought hard about her situation. He was her rescuing prince. She was a princess since Daddy always called her so. She was smart, and she could solve this just like solving a math puzzle in class. All she had to do was think it through, create a plan, and proceed. It came to her as she lay in bed one night on the pink sheets which her mother had bought. Brittany didn't even like pink. She liked blue, like Gabe's eyes. That's it! Brittany sat up in bed. If Gabe was going to like her, she needed to know everything about him. Like the same things that he did. If they liked the same things, then they were sure to become friends. With a heavy sigh, she fell back onto her bed with all its pinkness. She wasn't around Gabe enough to find out what he liked. 
It wasn't as though she could ask her older brother Jordan either, as he was not in Gabe's class being two years older than Brittany. Thinking hard, she knew she could overcome this problem. As she drifted off to sleep, a new thought came to her. The next day, Brittany put her plan into action. She marched up to her teacher and demanded to know what she needed to do to be put ahead of grade. She skipped a grade to get into my class. She switched school districts to get into my secondary school academy. Now she's trying to get on the all-boys swim team, declaring it is discriminatory to close the team to girls. A 16-year-old Gabe groaned as he flopped onto Noah's bed. It was the annual Ramsley family get-together, and the older boys were all gathered in Noah's room as the younger set took over the basement. I wish I had gone to an all-boys school, but I get the feeling she just cut her hair and petitioned to join anyways. <laughs> Sounds like she has a crush on you, smirked Noah as he grabbed a box of contraband candy out of his closet. He selected a bag of buttered popcorn before handing the box to Max. Their mother, Rachel, was currently on a health diet fad and refused to allow junk food in the house. It's a boys' team? Jake's tone was practical as he selected a candy bar out of the box Max was thoughtfully offering around, which means it would naturally preclude girls from joining it. The girls have their own team which she can join. That's what the coach said, but they're giving her a hearing where she gets to prove her point, and the student council gets to vote on it, said Gabe as he flung an arm over his eyes. My friend Tucker mentioned I like girls with punk green hair, and she dyed her hair. It looks awful. Two years, then you're in college, reasoned Henry. He opened a bag of flavored corn chips. Just don't tell her where you're going, and she can't find you. Two years is too long, lamented Gabe. I need to get her to go away now. Tell her you're playing for the other team, and girls just don't do it for you, shrugged an unconcerned Noah, or get a girlfriend. She has a habit of chasing away anyone I like, groused Gabe. Girls tend to be turned off by a guy who comes with his very own stalker. Well, I'm out of ideas. Noah grabbed a handful of assorted nuts and shared some with Jake. Where is Michael? Stuck with the old dudes talking shop. Jake crunched loudly. I saw them in the study. He's supposed to be getting the drinks, complained Max. How is he going to sneak them past your mom? Asked Henry as he popped open a container of dip chip. Aunt Rachel has eyes in the back of her head. She misses nothing. Once, I tried to bring in a turtle we found on the beach, and she knew instantly. There was no way she could have seen it. It was under my shirt. Michael would have made you put the turtle back anyways, Max advised his cousin, as he looked through their depleted supplies, choosing to open a pack of red licorice. Can we get back to the issue at hand? Gabe opened an eye, removing his arm so he could see his cousin's. What issue is that? Michael asked as he entered the room, shutting the door behind himself. We are thirsty, Max pointed out. There's nothing to drink. Gabe has a girlfriend, added Jake with a cheeky grin. Brittany Crawford is not my girlfriend, Jake declared hotly, his face flushing a little at the thought. She's more of a stalker, clarified Noah. Soda and cups are under the bed. Michael said mildly as he took a seat at Noah's desk. I snuck them in hours ago when Mum was distracted. Just soda? Henry cocked an eyebrow from his seat in the beanbag chair. Just soda, said Michael firmly to the group of teens. I can't wait to be a grown-up, spoke Jake, finishing his candy bar. College parties are going to be so much better than high school ones. They were about the same, shrugged Michael, only the alcohol is bought legally. Somehow I don't see you as the parting type, frowned Jake as his oldest cousin. Guilty, Michael easily responded. Being an adult means being more responsible. May I never get that dull, Max offered Michael a piece of licorice, which he accepted. When I'm an adult, I can get a restraining order, muttered Gabe darkly. Ah, oh, she's not all that bad, chuckled Henry. I thought the song she sang for the talent show was kind of funny. It was embarrassing. Gabe put a pillow over his face. Max fell into a fit of laughter. It was great. She can't carry a tune. 
Plus, everyone knew she was singing about you, chortled Noah as he pulled out bottles of soda from under the bed. You should have seen it, Michael, Jake told him. Everyone loved it. Except me, noted Gabe with a muffled voice. Have you ever just sat her down and nicely told her you aren't interested? suggested Michael. Only every day of my life, lamented Gabe. Michael did say nicely, Max pointed out as he passed around cups he had rummaged from under the bed. I think you've been more forceful than nice. Just have an honest conversation with her. Michael accepted a cup. I'm sure you can manage to let her down gently. She has a list, grumbled Gabe. A list? frowned Henry as he poured out drinks. A list of all the reasons they should be together, Max said gleefully. She calls it her compatibility list. Every time he starts to tell her why he doesn't want to be her boyfriend, Britt pulls it out and starts spouting about how much they have in common. It's laminated. She is determined, commented Michael, a little surprised at the girl's tenacity. You don't know the half of it, sighed Gabe. I can't go anywhere without her popping up. The mall, the movies, the beach. She goes everywhere I go. I'm surprised she's not ringing the doorbell right now. They all froze as they heard the telltale chime from the front door. No way, breathed Jake. Gabe peeled away the pillow, staring at the bedroom door in trepidation as they all strained to hear who might be at the front entryway. Michael checked his watch. It's likely the caterers. They usually come around now to set up. What if it isn't? Noah quirked an eyebrow. Or what if Brittany got a part-time job with a catering company just so that she could come here to chase Gabe? Gabe threw the pillow at Noah, causing him to spill his drink. Paper towels are under the bed, remarked Michael dryly amongst the rest of the boys' laughter. Maybe you should tone it down a little, said Tara doubtfully. Guys like to do the chasing. Where did you hear that? Puffed Brittany as she vigorously pedaled the spin bike. Only in every woman's magazine ever written, replied Tara as she checked the stopwatch to see how long Brittany had to go. Two minutes. I don't have time for magazines. Brittany focused on powering through. I have three more exams, all my club activities, and a Coval Victorian speech to write. Besides, I thought proximity was supposed to win people over. Not in Gabe's case. Tara eyed the sweating Brittany, although lately it has become more of a competition between the both of you to see who can get better grades, better career paths, better everything. I was shocked when they announced the both of you were going to be Victorians together. Even the professors can feel the animosity between both of you. It is not my fault he is too dumb to see that I would be perfect for him, huffed Brittany. I'm getting to the point where I just want to finish college and get into the professional world. I need to leave my childish infatuation of Gabe Ramsley behind where it belongs. Fairy tales and happily ever afters just aren't reality. Well, they do say absence makes the heart grow fonder, said Tara doubtfully. Do you think so? Brittany looked a little hopeful at the prospect. In your case, no. I think absence will help both of you to move on. Tara clicked the stopwatch. You are done. Thank you. Brittany slumped over the bike, dragging in deep breaths. He is watching you. Tara snuck a look at Gabe and his friends. Immediately, Brittany straightened up, grabbing her water bottle and towel, trying to act like her workout had been no big deal. I'm going over to talk to them, decided Tara. What? No, why? Brittany grabbed her friend's arm in alarm. To see if they're going to the year-end party Kim is throwing? Gently, Tara explained. She has a pool. Her parents are away, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, I'm not going if he's going, said a stubborn Brittany. Honestly, Britt, I don't care anymore. I love you to pieces, but this thing between you and Gabe is just too much work, sighed Tara. All I want to know is if Max is going. If he is, I plan on being there and being available. Oh, Brittany felt a little deflated. What do you mean, oh, demanded Tara. Max is hot and fun. 
He is better looking than Gabe. He is not, muttered Brittany a little sullenly. She snuck a look at Gabe, who caught her watching him. He rolled his eyes and turned away to talk to the group of guys hanging out by the weights. To her mind, Gabe would always be the best-looking guy she had seen. Even after all this time, he still made her heart do funny flips and wish for a future that wasn't going to be. Too bad he didn't care about her. She had tried changing who she was to fit what she thought his ideal was. Instead, she had ended up looking like a freak thanks to the bad advice of his friends. It had been one big joke on her. Since then, Brittany had resolved not to change who she was. She knew she was perfect for Gabe and he for her, even if he refused to admit it. She had tried to make him jealous. That had been an utter failure. She had tried to flirt, which was worse than her singing, and Brittany was a terrible singer. She made dogs howl and cats run for cover. Finally, she had just done everything she could to make Gabe almost as miserable as she was. They competed over everything, argued over everything, annoyed each other to the extreme. If Gabe was going to do something, Brittany was going to do it better. She had hoped to make her heart see just what a jerk Gabe could be. That hadn't worked either. The traitorous muscle had still beat harder every time he entered the room. It did jumping jacks every time his blue eyes looked her way. It practically swooned when he opened his mouth and spoke in the rich velvet voice of his. It was absolutely maddening. Now, nearing the end of college, Brittany was tasting failure. Their valid Victorian speech was likely the last time she would see Gabe, except at social events where he did his best to avoid her. It was depressing. Glancing up, Brittany saw Tara flirting happily with the guys. It hurt that Gabe gave her friend a big smile and talked easily to her. What Brittany wouldn't give to have him look at her like he was looking at Tara. With a sigh, she grabbed her towel and went to the locker room. She swallowed past the lump in her throat and tried to ignore wishful thinking. Princes weren't all they were cracked up to be, and sometimes Daddy was dead wrong. No amount of effort was going to make Gabriel Ramsley hers. Gabe heaved an internal sigh as he recognized Brittany Crawford. A little older, a little classier looking, and more put together, she was waiting by the doors of the building, watching him approach. No doubt to offer condolences to the Ramsley family for the passing of his cousin Nathaniel. He wished she wouldn't. Britt and he had never gotten along. She was abrupt, rude, and had a habit of picking on him. She was a know-it-all. Somehow he had gotten paired with her a lot for school projects, plays, and on student council. She had always been around. When Gabe had graduated and gone on to work in the family company that managed a chain of hospitals, he had been more than happy to leave her behind. Here she was again. It was only natural to see her. They hung around in the same social circles. Her dad did business with the Ramsley family. While Gabe was a master of getting out of doing the social whirl, he still had to occasionally do it, and it wasn't something he enjoyed. It was necessary for the continuous fundraising efforts for the chain of hospitals his branch of the Ramsley family managed. Brittany? He managed to keep his voice neutral. It had been a few years since they had last met. Perhaps she had grown up. Or maybe his memories of her were a little flawed by his personal dislike of her. Gabriel, she returned, eyeing him critically, you have gained weight. Good to see you, too, he said wryly, annoyed. She was the exact same, a sharp tongue in a womanly package. You should watch your diet, she advised him, especially after your uncle had a heart attack and now this death. If you are not careful, you will become like your cousin Ben. Ben is fine, defended Gabe. Okay so Ben could stand to lose some weight. The guy was rather hefty. Gabe thought of himself as a little husky. He was only carrying an extra 25 to 30 pounds since his college days. Not something to be worried about. As for Uncle David having a heart attack, they weren't quite sure if that was what had happened yet. The doctors were still running tests. 
If you got a wife, she could look after you and make sure you stay healthy, Brittany pointed out. She followed him into the funeral chapel, oblivious of the fact that her company was unwanted. I'm fine. Gabe was not about to go all veggie tray. Maybe he could step it up at the gym a little. Angrily, he shoved the thought away. He was always letting Britt do this, making him feel insecure. Her opinion shouldn't matter. It didn't matter. He almost missed her next words. You could marry me and I'll look after you, offered Brittany, entirely serious. Gabe's jaw dropped. He was absolutely gobsmacked. He didn't know what to say. It makes sense, continued Brittany. We come from the same social circles. I know everything important about you. We're of a compatible age group. Genetically, our children would be of excellent stock. Do you hear yourself when you speak? asked Gabe, incredulous at her reasoning. She was absolutely out of line. We are at a funeral for my cousin. Another good point in favor of her marriage, stated Brittany firmly, daring him to contradict her. Life is fleeting. I'm sure you would like progeny, as every male with a large inheritance usually does want to pass on his legacy to his kids. Medically, I'm in excellent health, and I should be able to easily supply you with children. I don't believe you. Gabe bit out the words. He moved past her to get a program from the attendant. I had my fertility checked, she followed, getting her own program. I assure you, I'm fully capable of conceiving children. I meant, I can't believe you are saying this. Especially today of all days, he hissed at her. We are not getting married. Brittany blinked. Are you certain you have fully thought this through? I've weighed the pros and cons. The positive list far outweighs the negatives. Not for me, growled Gabe. He abruptly turned on his heel, ignoring if it might seem rude to leave her standing there alone. Gabe wasn't sure he cared. Brittany was disconcerting. He simply wished to get away from her. He found himself in the meeting room for the pallbearers. Gabe drew in a deep breath as he saw Michael, Jake, Everett, and Ben. Michael, Jake, and Gabe were all the oldest of each family of brothers. Everett and Nate had been best friends growing up. Ben and Henry were Nate's brothers. Gabe wondered if Henry had made it back in time from Hong Kong, where he managed the Asian network of Ramsley Hotels. Nate Ramsley had died of a massive heart attack while training for a marathon. Running was something he did all the time. It was the biggest thing in common Everett and Nate had. They had been in all sorts of marathons together, until Everett had gone to Europe to try to expand Ramsley Insurance Corporation into the market overseas. Nate had been young and fit. Now he was gone, leaving behind a wife and two children. It was a hard thing to think about, Gabe reflected. However, it wasn't something that would get him thinking about getting hitched, especially to Brittany Crawford. What worm had crawled into her brain to make her think it was even a remote possibility? She was crazy. Gabe pushed the thought of matrimony out of his head. It had no place with what was happening here today. Are you okay? Ben quirked an eyebrow as he came to stand beside Gabe. You have kind of a funny look on your face. Sometime we'll have a drink and I will explain it all. You'll probably get a kick out of it, muttered Gabe. Everyone except Gabe was usually amused by Brittany's antics. He eyed Ben, who looked like he might have put on a little more weight. Either that, or the suit was a little tight. And if such were the case, Ben needed a new tailor. Gabe resolutely put Brittany's comparison of his possible future physique to Ben out of his mind. How are you holding up? Ben shrugged as he looked away. The kids are asking when Nate's coming back. Cora is a mess. Henry's flight is delayed. If he can't make it here in the next ten minutes, we'll have to get Noah to take his spot. Gabe digested his cousin's words before asking gently, What about you? Ben drew in a steadying breath. I always thought that out of all of us, Nate would be the one to live to a hundred. He was always so healthy. Gabe put a hand on Ben's shoulder in sympathy. At thirty-three, Ben was the youngest of his cousins. Second youngest, Gabe silently amended to himself. 
Now that they knew about Uncle David's extramarital activities, they had more cousins in the Colburn brothers. Addison is sitting out with Cora and the kids, Ben informed him. That's good, murmured Gabe. Addison was the only woman in the slew of male cousins which made up the Ramsley family. Henry. Ben moved forward to greet his brother as a tired Henry set down his carry-on bag. The two embraced, and the rest of the room greeted Henry by turns as they waited for the last of the mourners to be seated before the funeral. What had she been thinking? Brittany wanted to put her head in her hands and just hide in the washroom. Instead, she gathered up what was left of her dignity and left the stall to wash her hands. It was always like this. Somehow, her brain shut off and her mouth started running whenever Gabe was around. It was like he brought out the very worst in her, even while she was trying to impress him. Talking about fertility and her overall health as though the logic of it would convince him to like her. Brittany cringed as she eyed herself in the mirror. For the first time ever, she was a liar. Just two days ago, she had gotten the worst news of her life. Her health wasn't perfect. Brittany had known something was wrong, which is why she had gone for tests. She had pain and unusual bleeding for the past few months. The doctor had informed her she had stage 1 endometrial cancer. He had said she was lucky to have noticed the symptoms and gotten checked out so quickly. Brittany didn't feel lucky when he recommended her uterus be removed. The risk was low the cancer would spread quickly but surgery was considered the optimal solution. Followed by rounds of drugs to be certain the cancer was eradicated and scheduled screenings to see if it came back. If she had the surgery, she would never be a mom. Oh, she might adopt, but to never be pregnant, to never know what it was like to feel a baby kick, to have life grow inside her. It was something precious to her and millions of other women. Brittany had always thought she would have kids. It had never been a question in her mind she would get married. However, she had never wanted to marry anyone other than Gabe. No matter who she dated, they just never measured up, never made her heart beat even the tiniest of bits faster. By the look of horror on his face when she had made the ill-timed suggestion, Brittany was the last person Gabe would ever want to marry. She didn't know why she had let her mother guilt her into coming. It was something about how the Crawfords and Ramsley families needed to support each other since Daddy and David Ramsley had done business together. You know why you came, a little voice inside her head prompted. You wanted to see Gabe again. Brittany gave a sigh. Wash those hands any longer and they'll start to wrinkle, the woman beside her smiled. I'm trying to delay the inevitable. Brittany gave a wry smile in return before shutting off the faucet and reaching for a soft towel. One of the Ramsleys and I aren't getting along too well right now. Oh? she gently pried, waiting for Brittany to explain further. I might be to blame. I have a bad habit of opening my mouth and inserting my foot. He always brings out the worst in me somehow, grimaced Brittany. I'm sorry, I don't even know you, and here I am being indiscreet again. Holly Urshman. Holly extended a hand. I came with Molson Colburn. Ah, the Colburns. Brittany acknowledged the connection to the Ramsleys. What are they like? Impossible at times, but much softer than they try to appear. Bethany Searson came out of a stall and joined them at the counter. Hello, Brittany. It's good to see you again. Mother told me you were going out with the older Colburn, said Brittany as she eyed Bethany. She looked happier than Brittany had ever seen her before. I'm engaged to him. Bethany gave her a smile as she finished washing her hands. We we're working on wedding plans. Congratulations. Brittany tried not to feel jealous. She was happy for Bethany. Everyone deserved their heart's desire, and it was obvious Bethany was pleased to be getting married. She just wished it was herself announcing an engagement. Suddenly, there was so little time in her life for two of the biggest milestones a woman could experience. It was nice to meet you. Holly checked her watch. We should be getting seated. It's almost time. Good to meet you as well, Brittany's mother's drills on good manners made her say. 
She followed them out into the hallway, then watched in curiosity as they were seated with two handsome men inside the chapel. Not as handsome as Gabe, but still handsome enough, she supposed. The affection between the brothers and their girlfriends was easy enough to see as Bethany latched onto the arm of the older one, and the younger brother put an arm around Holly's shoulders, whispering something in her ear. Bethany looked around, spotting her mother. Naomi Crawford had saved a seat for Bethany. Erwin Crawford, Brittany's father, wasn't in attendance. Right now, he was sitting in prison with the FBI, grilling him for harboring a known felon. Daddy had given sanctuary to David Ramsley while David was on the run, trying to escape charges of drug smuggling and money laundering. Daddy had even gone so far as to try to drive David to a private airport to help him evade capture by the authorities. Daddy's loyalties to the man who had made his lifestyle possible knew no bounds. The two men had made countless business deals over the decades. Now Irwin was facing the very real possibility of spending some time in prison for his aiding David. Brittany had mixed emotions over the whole thing. She could admire Daddy's loyalty. However, he had been breaking the law. It made her wonder just how involved he really was in the whole Ramsley scandal. She had tried to voice her concerns to her mother multiple times, but had been shut out. Naomi refused to discuss the matter, saying it was men's business and Irwin was taking care of it. Because Daddy did so well at taking care of things lately, Brittany thought with some sarcasm. After all, he was the one in prison awaiting trial, and it was Brittany footing her mother's bills since Daddy's bank accounts were frozen by the FBI. Benjamin Ramsley has gained some more weight, tutted Naomi, her lips pursing in disapproval as she watched the men walk past. Is Henry's suit even ironed? It's a poor job of it if it even was. He looks far too thin next to Ben. They've gotten the order mixed up. I thought it was Henry, Nate, Garrett, Addison, and then Ben. Brittany bit the inside of her cheek. Did she really sound like her mother when she spoke? Gabe had once accused her of being critical and rude like Naomi. Or maybe it just happened when she was around Gabe. For some reason, she could never be normal around him. She wasn't much of a people person to begin with, but she wasn't as bad as when she was around Gabe. Tamping down her feelings of inadequacy, Brittany opened her program, staring at the pages as the last of the family was seated. Gabriel Winston Ramsley Brittany tried to ignore the familiar words. She had written them countless times with hearts connected to her own Brittany Helena Crawford. Annoyed with herself, she flipped through the pages only to be distracted by her mother's gasp of astonishment, which was joined by many others in the congregation. "'What happened?' whispered Brittany as she jerked her head up to see someone flag down the funeral director and some of the Ramsley men go forward to one of the benches. "'James Ramsley just collapsed,' reported Naomi as she stood for a better view. Brittany blinked in surprise. She hadn't realized Gabe's father would be in attendance at Nate's funeral. All of Gabe's uncles were currently in prison, each charged with his part in David Ramsley's schemes. Had James not participated in his brother's illegal activities? Her heart in her throat, she came to her feet like many others, to try to see better what was going on. While the rest of the people might be looking to see how James was, Brittany had only eyes for a worried Gabe. Chapter 2 I'm fine, groused James as Gabe and Marshall maneuvered his frail 77-year-old frame onto a chair in a private room at the funeral parlor. It's all the drugs the doctor has me on. Every time I go for a checkup, he puts me on another set of pills. The man is a quack. Your doctor is fine countered Dorothy, as she followed Parker into the room and shut the door. Why don't you just tell the truth? What do you mean, tell the truth? asked Gabe with a frown. What is going on, Mom? Dorothy took a seat in the chair Marshall provided beside James. She turned to her husband before narrowing her eyes. It is past time to tell them, James. Now, Dottie, he muttered before capitulating with a sigh after being on the receiving end of her significant gaze. You all might as well sit down, boys. 
It's not good. Gabe tried not to scowl over the fact that their father still called him and his brothers boys, despite the fact that they had been managing the family business for years and were quite grown adults. The old man never seemed to realize his kids weren't children anymore. Parker lined up some chairs, and they took a seat, waiting to hear what their family patriarch would have to say. "'I'm dying,' stated James badly. "'It's the cancer. The doctors have done everything they've been able to do, and now it's a done deal. I don't have much time left, so I suppose the next funeral will be mine if one of my fool brothers doesn't beat me to it.' "'How long have you known?' a stunned Gabe questioned as Dottie slipped her hand into James's pale and gnarled one. Eight years, Dottie's reply was quiet. We've been battling it eight years. The disease is one, James cleared his throat. It has spread everywhere. Are you absolutely certain? asked Parker. Perhaps one of the cancer centers can do something. Have you checked with them? We own the best doctors, James declared hotly. We run hospitals, or at least your brothers and I do. Maybe you do some work when you're not surfing. Parker snapped his mouth shut with an audible click. He leaned back in his chair, resolutely saying nothing, to be drawn into the old argument which existed between father and son. How long? Marshall tried to deflect James's ire from Parker. Did the doctors give you an estimate? They did. I was supposed to croak four years ago. James had a cynical laugh. I guess you could say I'm past my expiration date. That's not funny, Dad. Gabe automatically responded to the joke made in bad taste. No one said it was, he snapped back. Parker muttered something under his breath as Gabe ran a hand through his hair in frustration. James was a prickly man, and today he was angrier than his usual self. While Gabe understood it was likely from his embarrassment at collapsing in front of a crowd of people, it didn't excuse his father's behavior. James had never liked to be seen as weak. "'I've talked to the lawyers,' suddenly announced James. "'I have had Ramsley Hospital and Medical Corporation cleared of the investigation with the FBI. We've paid our fine for the initial money laundering I did when I was young, and stupid, before I told David I wouldn't put the company at risk any more. It's all been dealt with, so none of you will have to worry about it after I'm gone.' "'When did this happen? You were involved?' wondered Gabe. This was the first he had heard about the matter, and it bothered him that his dad hadn't confided in him before. Gabe was head of the operations for the company chain, and should have been informed. "'When your boys were born and Dottie put her foot down,' James had a racking cough. "'I married a good woman. She knew David was a time bomb, and we needed to distance ourselves from the mess he was making.' "'Doesn't the FBI want to charge you for the money laundering of the drug money?' asked Marshall. "'They already have. I'll plead guilty when the time comes and pay the applicable penalties,' replied James. "'I went to them and turned myself in shortly after I learned the cancer had won. I'm going to my grave with a clear conscience. In return, I have a reduced sentence in a minimum security prison that also has a good palliative care program. I regret I will have to leave your mother.' and that I had to destroy my brother's lives in the process of coming clean. Perhaps they'll learn from their mistakes and be a better men. You started this whole investigation, surmised a grim Gabe, wondering how the other Ramsleys were going to react once they learned the truth. Yes, to keep Ramsley Hospital and Medical Corporation intact, to save your boys' inheritance if you can manage to inherit it, nodded James in satisfaction. What is that supposed to mean? Parker frowned over James's wording. If we can manage to inherit it. I have instructed the lawyers to cut you off, James informed them with some satisfaction. Each of you pull a salary from the company. That is done. Your lavish lifestyles are done. Your net worth is essentially less than middle class now. You no longer can count on inheriting part of my kingdom. I'm kicking each of you out of the condos I bought for you. You have thirty days to vacate. Good luck on those ridiculous car payments of yours, Parker. The three men stared at their father in astonishment. Why? Gabe privately wondered if the cancer had gotten to the old man's brain. None of this made any sense to him. I built this company through hard work, James's flinty eyes hardened. I can do with my wealth whatever I want. 
Mostly, I want my wife to be happy, and I have got one last chance to do that. Dottie wants grandkids. So, if you want to keep your condos, cars, stuff, and inheritance, you will do as I say. Marry within the month, and you keep the condo and salary. Get your wife pregnant within the year, and you will get your inheritance on your fifth wedding anniversary. You are out of your mind. Parker got up and began to pace. Is this even legal? Marshall wanted to know. Oh, it is legal, smiled James in satisfaction. The lawyers saw to it. Is he serious? Gabe directed the question to his mother. Very, nodded Dottie. From the look on her face, it was obvious she didn't fully approve of what James was doing, but was resolute about supporting his decision. Gabe had seen the same look many times over the years, and knew his mother wouldn't budge in her role of supporting her husband. James patted her hand with his free one. It's my last gift to her. Grandbabies. What are we supposed to do? Marshall asked rhetorically with some frustration. Get married within thirty days or be poorer than you've ever been, and learn what it's like to build up your own wealth rather than spending mine, spat James. This is ridiculous. Parker's tone rose. This is not some archaic time where you can just dictate what we do with our lives. True, but there's no law that says I have to give my wealth to you boys either, James surprised him. I can give it all to the dog shelter if I want. What about Mom? Tell me you've taken care of her financially. Gabe wanted to know. Of course I have. James was indignant. Dottie shushed him. I will be perfectly fine. James has seen to everything. And you're okay with him manipulating us like this? Gabe shook his head in amazement, trying to wrap his head around what his dad was doing. You boys have had more than enough time to find someone special. You've all become stubborn old bachelors, she told them. I'm not proud of what he's doing, but I hope it will be the making of you all. The making of us? Parker was incredulous. What's wrong with how we are? Other than the fact that none of you know the value of real work? Huff, James. You're arrogant, stubborn, lazy, prideful, and mostly you're all entitled. Some of it is our fault, admitted Dottie sadly. It's how we raised you. James gave a grunt of dissent. Gabe leaned back in his chair, silent and not knowing what to say. Between Nate's death, Brittany, and his father, Gabe felt the entire world had turned upside down. Parker whipped out his cell phone, his thumb tapping on the screen. What are you going to do? chuckled James. Have your lawyers call my lawyers? Essentially, yes, Parker said shortly. I told you, it's all legal and unbreakable, repeated James. The lawyers have sewn it up shut. Took a whole team of them to do it, and you don't have the time to undo it even if you could. This is crazy. Marshall voiced what all of them were thinking. You have gone crazy. Maybe, conceded James. Maybe not. When you're married to the love of your life, you'll find out what you're capable of doing for another person's happiness over your own. I hardly think I'm going to find the love of my life in thirty days, muttered Gabe. He shoved Brittany's impromptu proposal out of his mind. There had to be some alternative. Any alternative. I need some air. Marshall abruptly stood, heading for the door. Parker followed him, talking wildly on the phone about clauses and caveats. Wow, Dad. Gabe breathed out in frustration. You really know how to go out with a bang. I like to think some day you'll be telling my grandkids what role I played in the happy marriages that ensued from this. James smiled at Dottie. Or perhaps we'll be telling the divorce lawyers about it, said Gabe dampeningly as he rose to his feet. He didn't wait for his father's reply before heading out of the room. There was a funeral attendant waiting nearby and Gabe ascertained from him that his brothers had chosen to go to the parking lot. Pushing open the door of the funeral home's entrance, Gabe joined them. I can't believe it, Marshall bit out. I can, Parker muttered darkly as he ended the call, shoving his cell phone back inside the breast pocket of his suit. He's always trying to run our lives and make us dance to his own tune. This is one last attempt to meddle by the old man. What did the lawyer say? Marshall wanted to know. Parker had a short, bitter laugh. It's ironclad. 
Dad already sent out copies to our lawyers, hired them to give suggestions so they wouldn't be able to argue it. He literally turned our own lawyers against us. Isn't that a conflict of interest? questioned Marshall. Apparently, my lawyer was delighted to give his input. Parker was sarcastic. It's impenetrable. We're officially screwed. The countdown begins as soon as Dad informed us of what he's done, so we literally have 30 days to get wed or walk away from our jobs and our inheritance. Marshall eyed his oldest brother. You are being very quiet, Gabe. Gabe ran a hand through his hair, frustrated. As much as I would like to thumb my nose at him and walk away, I find I don't like the thought of being poor. Nor do I want to give up my stake in the company. I've worked hard to establish myself here. I like what I do. And in this economy, getting a similar position could take years. So, who is the lucky lady? asked Parker in a flippant tone. No idea. Gabe ignored the fact that he had been proposed to within the last hour. Hey, guys. Max popped open the door of the funeral home, raising an eyebrow at them. Is your dad okay? He's officially gone insane, Parker supplied the answer. Flipped his lid. Wacko! Belongs in the mental ward. Dad is dying of cancer, but is otherwise his normal self. Marshall frowned at Parker. It's complicated, sighed Gabe. Max paused for a moment, noting the tension between his cousins, not quite certain how to digest their words. Maybe we should go talk about this later? Right now, there's a funeral that needs to be happen for Nate's wife and siblings. If you could come inside, we could get started. Gabe shared a look with Parker and Marshall. None of them were happy about the situation, but Max was right. Now was not the time to deal with their father's ultimatum. Let's help Mom and Dad back to their seats and put off any discussion about this until tomorrow. His brothers grimly nodded in agreement, and they all followed Max back into the funeral chapel none of them noticing Agent Kepler, as he calmly took a notebook out of a pocket in his suit jacket while leaning against a tree. His icy blue eyes narrowed as he scribbled something in his notes. When he was finished, Kepler put the notepad and pen away, folding his arms as he patiently waited. Throughout the funeral, Gabe's mind was distracted by the ultimatum their father had dictated to him. He had never felt the urge to get married before. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Most of Gabe's relationships were short and uncomplicated. When a woman started suggesting rings or more, he ended it. Gabe liked his life the way it was. Plus, many of his friends and business colleagues were divorced, sometimes more than once. What made a marriage last? Sure, his parents had been married for a long time, but things were different in this day and age. Now, people were fickle. They were always searching for some notion of Hollywood love, which Gabe wasn't sure existed. Some people seemed to get along better than others in marriage. An example would be how his cousins were doing in their relationships, but there were many others that didn't. Max swore that true love existed, and he had found it. What sort of difference was there between true love and love? Gabe frowned. It was all ridiculousness in his opinion. He liked to deal with facts, numbers, and corporate problems. He had never liked to deal with people's feelings. They were complicated and messy. In his experience, someone was always bound to get hurt. Marriage wasn't the solid institution everyone seemed to think it was. One thing was for certain. Gabe wasn't about to lose his position in the company, which he had worked so hard to get. People might think he would have been given the job because he was the owner's son, James had made certain Gabe had jumped through extra hoops just to prove he was worthy. Nor was he going to lose out on his inheritance. Why his father couldn't have already given them their shares, like how his uncles had already done for their sons, Gabe didn't know. It was frustrating. The old man had them over the proverbial barrel. Gabe resolved to ignore the issue until a more appropriate time, trying to concentrate on the eulogy being given about his cousin Nate. How was it that Nate was gone? In his mid-forties, in excellent shape, a health food junkie and a man who appeared to be everything healthy, Gabe wondered at how his cousin could have had a heart attack so young and suddenly passed, leaving behind two boys and a wife. Nate had everything. He was charming, driven, healthy, 
a family man, successful in his work, rich, admired, and it was all taken away in one instant. Gabe glanced at Cora, who was pressing a tissue to her eyes. Was it smart to attach oneself to another person? They could die or divorce. They could leave, and then what happened? Gabe frowned. He had been the recipient of far too many of his friends asking him for help to drown their sorrows over breakups and divorces. The guys complained during marriage, and complained afterward. Gabe just didn't see the point in being married to someone. As for kids, Gabe didn't have much experience with them. He remembered being one, and he had noticed some of his cousins had procreated an alarming amount, begging the question of why anyone would want four or five little humans running around. Kids were messy, noisy, and broke things. They interrupted well-thought-out routines. Gabe didn't expect to have kids. He had always thought Parker would accidentally get someone pregnant, something which hadn't occurred unless his brother had kept it very quiet. And as for Marshall... Marshall would be the type to get married and have two kids. He would be good at being a dad and a husband. Gabe didn't think for a moment he had it in himself to be a good dad or husband. Gabe didn't know the first thing about being a father. His long hours at work would be detrimental to a marriage. His father was wrong. Forcing them to do this was a mistake. Gabe knew there was no point in trying to talk the stubborn fool out of it. James would never capitulate. Either they would fall in line with what their father had demanded, or they were out of the family business. Gabe quickly calculated what he had in savings and investments. It wasn't near enough the amount of funds he needed to keep up the lifestyle he was used to. There really was no alternative. He was going to have to get married. Married within a month and pregnant within a year, Gabe corrected himself grimly. What he needed was a sensible plan, he told himself. He would create a list of respectable potential brides and select the best woman to fit his needs, someone who wasn't demanding, from a proper family, who would be grateful to be his wife. When the baby came, and it would only be one baby, Gabe thought firmly, then they would get a competent nanny, perhaps even two nannies, whatever it took to make sure Gabe's life continued in a smooth and predictable manner. Comforted by the thought, Gabe forced himself to pay attention to the proceedings around him, only to find that it was time for the pallbearers to rise. Regretful of his lapse of concentration, Gabe rose to his feet, following the others to their pre-assigned places by the casket. As they lifted the coffin onto their shoulders and proceeded down the aisle, Gabe briefly wondered why the funeral hadn't been held in a church. When they were kids, the Ramsley family often had attended services on special occasions. Some of the families had been a little more strict than others when it came to frequency of worship. Gabe supposed Nate had fallen away from the practice. So, too, had Gabe, if he were honest with himself. If he was going to get married and have a child, he should probably continue the tradition. The men carefully assisted in putting the casket in the hearse before the short drive to the cemetery. Police had shut down the roadway, and security had been placed at the funeral home and the cemetery. None of the family wished to come in contact with the press today. The line of limousines drove along the paved roadway, sandwiched between green rolling hills, rows of graves, and tastefully placed trees. They bypassed these, traveling to the back of the cemetery, where a large set of plots had been purchased decades ago for the use of the family by their grandparents. It already was a resting ground for relatives who had passed. Now Nate would be laid to rest with them. Gabe tried not to think about it, as he took his place as pallbearer once again. Everyone died. Likely the next funeral would be for his father. What would life be like without his dad wanting to go over the weekly reports? Assisting in placing the casket on the lowering device, Gabe and the other pallbearers then took their places with their immediate families. Standing with his brothers, Gabe reflected his parents, plus his aunts and uncles were getting older. They had been very blessed so far not to have many funerals. Across from the family, Gabe could see Brittany and Naomi Crawford standing with other friends of the family. 
Naomi was whispering something, and Brittany looked a little pained at her mother's gossip. Everyone knew Naomi Crawford was a hard woman with a cutting tongue. It probably explained a lot about Brittany's occasionally odd behavior. Gabe's Aunt Mary had once called the Crawford family vulgar upstarts. They were now on the fringe of acceptability, thanks to Brittany's father, Erwin Crawford. He was in prison for aiding and abetting David Ramsley with his plans to escape the country. Somehow, other than the ongoing FBI investigation, the Ramsley family was managing to weather the storm well, probably due to the programs the family had been putting in place to garner good press and turn public opinion in their favor. Ramsley Pharmaceuticals had lowered drug prices and their profits while funding research on treatment for several diseases. Ramsley Insurance Corporation had given a base discount to all the company's clients. Ramsley HMC were taking on more pro bono work and had changed their payment plan system to be more charitable toward lower income families, much to Marshall's delight. Parker had spearheaded the project, much to James's grumbling, but the move had garnered free press, which had eventually resulted in a better bottom line as more people sought out surgeries and medical treatment at Ramsley HMC. As for Ramsley Hotels, they were a luxury chain whose reputation hadn't been rocked by the scandal, despite Uncle Oliver's involvement. In fact, Nate had insisted the whole episode added a certain cachet to staying at one of the Ramsleys. The Crawfords hadn't fared as well. Rumor had it Erwin Crawford's funds had been frozen, leaving Naomi with a sea of bills and nothing to pay them with. Brittany was in business with her best friend Tara, Gabe didn't know what they did, but it was said Brittany had done well for herself. Probably she was now propping up her mother's extravagant lifestyle. It would probably have been polite to inquire about her father earlier, but Gabe had been too shocked by her marriage proposal. He had no intention of pursuing it further. Brittany was not the one for him. She was like an annoying gnat which kept circling. The past few years with minimal contact had been a blessing. Who knew what was going on in her mind? She was the most unpredictable, infuriating, irritating woman he had ever met. No one managed to make him feel the way Brittany Crawford did. Turning his attention back to the proceedings, Gabe watched as the casket was lowered into the grave. Slowly, people began to disperse as the event was over. Henry helped Cora to her feet, drawing her arm through his as they made their way back to the cars. Cora's sons trailed them, both beside their Uncle Ben, who had a hand on each of their small, thin shoulders. A man approached Addison. Gabe recognized him as Lincoln Waters. Lincoln owned a chain of luxury hotels which were in direct competition with the Ramsley chain. There was a rumor Lincoln and Nate had been so hostile towards each other that Nate had ended up throwing Lincoln out of one of the Ramsley hotels and issuing a no-trespass order. Yet now the man was here, gently offering a condolence to Addison, who appeared to be listening. Until Garrett came forward between the two, growling at Lincoln, You shouldn't be here. I am paying my respects, a deliberately calm Lincoln replied. My sincerest apologies on your loss. You aren't welcome here repeated Garrett loudly. Garrett, hissed Addison, you're making a scene. Gabe noticed a glint of light from a lens behind the trio. Someone was on the lawn, recording from afar, so as to not have security spot them. He quickly approached his cousins. There's a reporter filming. I suggest we all just go to our cars. Garrett gave Lincoln a last glare. Come, Addison. Addison gave Lincoln's hand a squeeze. Thank you, Mr. Waters. The flowers were lovely. You're welcome, Miss Ramsley. He responded with a nod of respect. Addison, growled Garrett. My brother calls. Addison had an apologetic smile before following Garrett toward the line of cars. Mr. Waters, Gabe said in respect, my apologies for my cousin's behavior. No apology needed, replied Lincoln as he watched Garrett and Addison get into one of the limos. Well, Nate, Garrett, and I have had our differences. I would never have wished this upon Nate. It's understandable Garrett would be distressed today. He and his brother were close. That is very charitable of you, observed Gabe as he took the other man's measure. 
He held out a hand in greeting. Thank you for coming. Gabriel, isn't it? Lincoln shook his hand. Pleasure to meet you. Gabe nodded, then joined the Ramsley family as they left the graveyard. Down the row of cars, he spotted Brittany helping her mother into a vehicle. He could hardly believe just a few hours ago she had proposed to him. Catching her eye, Gabe frowned before entering the limo with his brothers. Chapter 3 Twenty-One Days Before the Wedding I'm so happy for you, Daniela, Gabe spoke into his cell phone, looking around the lobby in front of him with some annoyance as he tried to recognize any available woman who might fit the now urgent role of wife. He and his brothers were attending yet another one of the fundraising galas, which were necessary as part of the hospital operating budget. Only this time, they had more on their mind than collecting pledges. I wish you and your husband the best. Ignoring what Daniela might have replied, Gabe ended the call, putting his phone away. It had been a week since his dad's lucritous announcement that the brothers needed to marry. Seven days of full, fruitless phone calls, and chasing down old girlfriends who appeared to have found their soulmates since Gabe and they had parted ways. His list of names for a potential wife was thin. Any luck? inquired Marshall as he came to stand beside Gabe, surveying the crowd. Unless you count Mrs. Edison, who's looking for husband number five, it seems like everyone's suddenly become engaged or is exclusively dating. Gabe's frown deepened. You cannot be serious about marrying the Black Widow. Marshall gave Gabe a sharp look. What about Selina Upstein? asked Gabe. He had no intentions of going near Mrs. Edison who was rumored to have put her previous husbands in the grave. The idea was to live long enough to inherit his share of the company and enjoy his wealth. She's in Australia with her new boyfriend. Marshall supplied the answer. Donna Henderson? Eh, six-week-long rehab. Hopefully it works this time. Gabe racked his brain, trying to remember anyone else who might be on the list. Connie Granger? Mm. Marshall pulled a face. Twenty-one days, Gabe dryly reminded him. It's not like we can be picky. Connie is getting her stomach stapled tomorrow, so she is unavailable. Besides, I heard Earl Milton might have thoughts in that direction if Connie's mother can convince Betty Milton. Parker joined them, handing each of them a drink. A toast, gentlemen. I have solved the bride problem. So easily? Marshall accepted the drink. What is your solution? Parker grinned. A matchmaking service. Excuse me? Gabe wondered if he had heard correctly. I went to a matchmaking service. Overseas bride. She's desperate to get into the country. I'm desperate to get married, so I can keep being a beach bum, as Dad would put it. Parker's eyes had a hard glint, even as he smiled resolutely. They took all sorts of information from me and have assured me they are going to match me with the perfect woman who will happily stay married to me for five years or more, bearing at least one child in the appropriate time frame. Voila! Problem solved. It's amazing what money can buy. You can't just buy a wife, sputtered Marshall. Apparently I did. Parker raised his tumbler in a mock toast before taking a zip. She arrives four days before the wedding. The wedding, echoed Gabe faintly, slightly nauseous at the thought. Didn't you hear? Parker chuckled without any amusement. Dad and Mom have rented a venue. They have the catering, flowers, decorations, small orchestra, preacher, and whatnot, all ready to go. Mom was finishing the invites today. All we need to do is show up with our ladies for a triple wedding. Marshall downed his whiskey. Gabe eyed the amber liquid in his tumbler before handing it to Marshall. I think I need to be sober. Do you even know her name, your bride-to-be? wondered Marshall. Nope. Parker shrugged nonchalantly. It's a surprise. Gabe drew in a sharp breath. Part of him wanted to protest his brother's choice. Part of him knew they were down to a deadline, and Parker was man enough to know what he was doing. This is crazy. Agreed. However, we're stuck in crazy town until we've met the terms of Dad's will. Parker nursed his own whiskey. If either of you want, I can give you the matchmaker's number. 
Mary, a stranger? Gabe shook his head. I don't think so. What about Brittany Crawford? Suddenly asked Marshall. What about her? Gabe's voice took a dangerous tone. She always had a thing for you, continued Marshall, oblivious to Gabe's irritation. If you aren't going to ask her, I will. What? demanded Gabe, staring at his youngest brother in shock. She's good-looking, healthy, and one of us, Marshall pointed out with a shrug. If you're not interested, I will have a go. What is that supposed to mean? Gabe glowered at his brother. It means I'm going to ask her to marry me. I have an engagement ring right here in my suit pocket, and I'm ready to go on one knee. Unless you have a problem with it. Marshall challenged before he finished the second whiskey. Yes, I have a problem with it, Gabe responded with some heat. Then are you going to ask her to marry you? inquired Marshall. No, Gabe automatically replied in protest. If you're not going to marry her, then what's to stop me from making her Mrs. Marshall Ramsley for the next five years or so? Marshall gave the two empty tumblers to a waiter before grabbing another. If I recall, Britt is not a bad sort of person. I'm sure she'll make a decent wife. You can't. Gabe floundered a little. He didn't know why the thought of Brittany and Marshall getting married didn't sit well with him. It must be because he didn't want her for a sister-in-law either. She won't marry you anyways. Won't know until I ask. Marshall downed the whiskey, handing Gabe the empty glass and headed off into the crowd. With a snarl, Gabe shoved the glass at a bemused Parker before following Marshall. It took him a moment to locate his errant younger brother in the mass of people. Gabe's stomach clenched as he noted Marshall's direction, which would take him right to Brittany, who was chatting with some women who were members of the club. He grabbed Marshall's shoulder just before his brother could approach them. Wait, you don't want to do this, Marshall. I don't know what you're getting so upset about, groused Marshall. You always used to complain about how you wish Brittany would leave you alone. Well, now I'm giving her a chance to have someone else instead. I'm not upset. Gabe tried not to allow a defensive note creep into his voice, but wasn't very successful. He tried for a more reasonable tone. Look, you don't want to be her second choice, do you? Knowing she would rather have me but settled for you? Marshall looked at him with some disbelief. We have twenty-one days, Gabe. It's not like she's my first choice, either but the pickings are looking slim this year for unattached females between 25 and 40. I guess I could discount pedigree like Parker's done, but Brittany is right here, so why should I? Like I said, unless you're going to ask her, I will. She is insane. Gabe tried again to persuade his brother not to do this. Do you want your kids to have a chance of crazy in them? She is not crazy, sighed Marshall, annoyed at his brother. She was persistent. Besides, she hasn't pursued you in years. Maybe Brittany is even over you, and it's just your bruised ego that doesn't want her to move on. Gabe swallowed hard and tried to unclench his teeth. She still has a thing for me. Really? scoffed Marshall. I haven't seen any evidence she's still into you lately. You need to get over yourself, Gabe. She proposed to me, he bit out, annoyed at having to admit what Britt had done. When? Marshall challenged. At Nate's funeral, Gabe ran a hand through his hair, suddenly exhausted by the whole business. She told me she would marry me. Before or after Dad's ultimatum. Marshall's eyes drifted over to Brittany, who gave them a curious glance before continuing to chat with the women in the group she was standing with. Marshall shook his head in amazement. Doesn't matter. If you already have her, why are you still looking for a wife? Because I don't want her. Gabe told his brother by habit. His eyes were drawn over to the slim figure of Brittany as she animatedly talked to the other women. She really had grown up from a gangling child into a stunning woman. Too bad she had all of the tact of a bull in a china shop. Then I don't see where's the harm in asking her to marry me, Marshall dryly said in frustration. Who knows, maybe she's sick of being rejected by you. You can't marry Brit, Gabe repeated his earlier statement. Marshall stood in front of his brother, cutting off Gabe's view of Brittany, demanding his attention. Why not? You already said you don't want to marry her, so why not, Gabe? What is your problem with my asking her? I don't know, 
Gabe trailed off lamely. Normally he was known for his logic, his ability to swing arguments his way for persuading others to his point of view. Tonight Gabe was faltering, and he didn't know why. Just the thought of Marshall and Britt put a sick feeling in his stomach. You just can't. Marshall heaved a heavy sigh. Usually I would respect your wishes, but I'm sick of this dance that the two of you have been doing, and time is running short. I'm going to ask her. No. Gabe grabbed Marshall's shoulder as his brother turned to leave. Either I ask her or you ask her, declared Marshall in an ultimatum. One of the two. Can no one just ask her? asked Gabe rhetorically. I'm going. Marshall pulled his shoulder out of Gabe's grasp and headed towards Brittany. With a grimace, Gabe quickly followed, trying to outpace his brother without looking like he was an idiot in a race across a crowded ballroom. Brittany, Marshall had a confident smile. It's been a long time. Marshall, Brittany acknowledged him with an uncertain look before glancing at a disgruntled Gabe. Nice to see you. I was wondering if we could talk privately a moment, Marshall politely asked. Gabe cut Brittany off before she could answer. Excuse me, this is our dance. Pardon? blinked Brittany at Gabe in surprise. She knew for a fact that he hadn't asked her to dance. Gabe had never once asked her to dance. Ignore him. Marshall kept his smile in place, despite the fact only Gabe had Brittany's full attention. Would you care to take a small walk with me? Brit? Gabe held out his hand in expectation. There was a pause as Brittany looked at the brothers in confusion, before slowly taking Gabe's hand. You are going to explain what this is all about? Absolutely, promised Gabe with a grimace. If he doesn't, I will be more than happy to, vowed Marshall as he patted his breast pocket. I don't like ultimatums, Gabe glared at Marshall. Neither do I, yet here we are, acknowledged Marshall grimly. Gabe suddenly became aware of the very curious looks from the group of ladies listening in on their conversation. Excuse us. What is going on, Gabe? Brittany followed him to the dance floor, her hand captive in his. Gabe sighed, irritated that he was being maneuvered into this. He led them through the maze of couples before halting abruptly to pull her reluctantly into his arms so they could dance to the music from the small orchestra. Gabe? She waited expectantly for a reply. He didn't want to give one. Brit was annoying, exasperating, and all sorts of synonyms in relation to those two words. They were like oil and water. He didn't like her. She wasn't going to be easy to be married to. When she had proposed marriage earlier, she had said children in plural, which was not in his plans. He wouldn't even have a marriage plan if it weren't for his father's ultimatum. They likely would end up as a divorced couple at the end of the five years. Somehow, the thought of being divorced, at failing at something, didn't sit well with Gabe. However, the thought of being married, especially to Brittany, was discomforting as well. As much as I enjoy dancing, Brittany interrupted his train of thought, bringing his attention back to her. I would like to know why you've suddenly decided to dance with me. What did Marshall want, and why are you so intent on interrupting him? I have decided to take you up on your offer, announced Gabe suddenly before he could try to back out. My offer? Brittany took a moment to try to think about what he might be talking about. Marriage, he clarified. I accept your offer of marriage. Brittany's mouth fell open in shock as she stumbled during the dance. She couldn't possibly have heard Gabe correctly. Trying to get her thoughts in a coherent order, she managed to squeak out, You do? A flicker of annoyance ran over his face before he gave a brief nod. I have come to the conclusion that it is the sensible thing to do, considering the circumstances. Sensible, echoed Brittany. Wait, what circumstances? Somehow, Gabe didn't think Brittany would just magically accept it if he said that overnight she had become the love of his life, and he didn't want to live without her. Besides, Gabe preferred to tell the truth. They both needed to go into this union with clarity and logic. 
he was going to try to think of it as a business deal. I find myself in need of a wife. You proposed to me earlier, and it seems logical since we fit each other's needs. In need of a wife? Brittany could have kicked herself the moment the words escaped her mouth. She shouldn't be questioning Gabe if he was saying he finally wanted her, even if it wasn't in the most romantic way. My father has demanded it, confessed a rueful Gabe. He's given my brothers and I an ultimatum to get married and start a family or be disinherited and unemployed. A little archaic, but effective. Excuse me? Brittany's heart plummeted. Are you joking? I would never joke about something like this, Gabe told her firmly. I have three weeks left in which to get married, one week less than a year to impregnate you, and must wait five years married to ensure my inheritance. It is a business proposal. You get something you want, and I get something I want. What you want? Brittany echoed again, feeling a little shocked at the conversation they were having. Yes, my job and my inheritance, said Gabe with some impatience. Of course. Brittany cleared her throat and stepped away from him, out of his arms. I need to think about this. What is there to think about? frowned Gabe. They were drawing looks from the other dancers who had to go around them since they were interrupting the flow of the dance floor. You get me as a husband and a future child. I get the money I'm due for working for my father all these years. It's a win-win situation. What was there to think about? He was finally here, standing right in front of her, willing to be with her. Willing to give her an amazing gift of a baby. Gabe's baby. Brittany held the thought close. Even if he divorced her in the end, and all she got was this little piece of him in the form of a child, it would be worth it. After the birth, the doctors could take her cancerous uterus. Gabe's baby was worth any risk to her health. Taking a deep breath, Brittany focused on lessening the pressure of her two tightly clasped hands. If she pressed any tighter, her knuckles would crack. Gabe didn't like it when she cracked her knuckles. At least he hadn't in high school. Brittany hadn't had much contact with him since college. She would have to relearn all his likes and dislikes again. She resolved to be the best possible wife she could be. She was not going to mess up this opportunity. Closing her eyes, she said a silent thank you to Gabe's dad. Opening her eyes just in time to see a scowling Gabe fold his arms as he looked at the crowd around him. Believe me, if I thought I could get another woman to the altar in twenty-one days, I would. But it seems like all my former girlfriends have gotten married. The words cut like a knife through Brittany's heart. Then a firm resolve replaced the hurt. Good for them, Brittany thought. This was her chance, and she didn't need competition. She knew she was pitifully last on Gabe's list of marriageable women. He had made it more than clear. Swallowing down disappointment, Brittany resolved to keep her eye on her goals. It was important to remain focused on what she wanted to achieve. According to the demands of Gabe's father had made, she would have three weeks to get him to the altar a year to get pregnant, and five years to make him see that being married to her was in his best interest. Look, everything is set up. All you need to do is show up in the dress. Gabe went slightly, even as he said the words, Mom has everything arranged. He said it like it's going to happen. Brittany tried to stop the little flutters in her heart. He is committing himself. She resolved to get in contact with Gabe's mother as soon as possible. If it was going to be her and Gabe's wedding, Brittany was going to have a say in it. She had been dreaming of this moment for too long to let anyone else plan the affair. What about the engagement ring? What about it? frowned Gabe. If we're to be engaged, you should give me a ring. Brittany wondered what else she should know about her impending wedding. She was getting married. She couldn't wait to tell Tara about this. You proposed to me, remember? Gabe pointed out before answering. Go to the family jeweler. I'll have my secretary call yours for the address. Pick out anything you want and charge it to my account. No. Brittany almost swallowed the word, but then straightened her spine and spoke clearly. No. I would like you to pick out the ring. I'm not going to tell our children and grandchildren that I picked out the ring. It's not romantic. Gabe bit off what he might have said before taking a deep breath. This isn't about romance. This is an arrangement. 
Then consider it a condition of our arrangement, replied Brittany. One engagement ring to seal the contract between us. Fine. Gabe bit out before abruptly walking away. He moved through the crowd to find Marshall patiently waiting for him. Are congratulations in order? Marshall raised an eyebrow expectantly. Otherwise, you can congratulate me as soon as I talk to Brittany. Gabe abruptly grabbed Marshall by his tux jacket, hauling him close. Snatching the engagement ring out of Marshall's breast pocket, Gabe briefly flashed the diamond in Marshall's face before palming it and briskly turning his back on his brother to merge back into the crowd. What was that all about? Parker handed Marshall another drink as he sipped his own. I think our big brother is about to pop the question, grinned Marshall. Parker gauged his brother's reaction. You set him up, didn't you? Someone had to, shrugged Marshall, completely satisfied with the turn of events. He's been in love with her for years, but is too stubborn to realize it. A little push, and hopefully they'll make a success out of their marriage. Or a complete disaster, mildly noted Parker. They hate each other. They love each other, clarified Marshall. Think about it. What other woman has ever inspired so much passion in Gabe? Parker thought about it, but came up empty. I don't recall any. Exactly. She makes him feel things which terrifies our control freak brother, a smug Marshall said. If he'd let himself go with his feelings, he would realize he loves her. I simply made sure no one else was available to Gabe except Brittany. Now she'll have her chance to convince him to stick with her for the rest of his life. No one was available, frowned Parker. Oh, there are still single ladies who would have liked to be Mrs. Gabriel Ramsey, confided Marshall. However, I am a doctor, and I just had to warn them that he's got a few STDs that somehow don't respond to regular treatment methods. You didn't. Parker looked at his younger brother with awe and a little horror. He will kill you if he ever finds out. The ladies promised to be discreet, shrugged Marshall. I was saving him from a boring marriage and an even more boring divorce five years from now. Please, don't ever save me, muttered Parker. The dancing stilled as Gabe stiffly presented the ring to Brittany. She smiled, holding out her hand for him to slip the ring on. Gritting his teeth, Gabe put the diamond onto her ring finger. Everyone politely clapped. To Gabe and Brittany, Marshall lifted his glass at the toast. May they finally be happy. Cheers. Parker drowned his drink. Now that is settled, who are you going to pick? Don't tell me it's the Black Widow. I have done some thinking, and I have a girl in mind, admitted Marshall. Do I know her? asked Parker. Nope, grinned Marshall. None of you do. She's not even on your radar. I look forward to the surprise, replied Parker agreeably. They watched as people came forward to congratulate a stoic Gabe and a delighted Brittany, admiring the engagement ring she had on her finger. Chapter 4 Nineteen Days Before the Wedding The doorbell was chiming incessantly. Gabe paused his hands abruptly stopping their memorized dance of tying a tie. Laying the fabric down, he frowned as he made his way to the foyer of the condo. The security screen showed Brittany, a frothy frond in hand, and the other hand laying on the chime button. With a scowl, Gabe opened the door. "'Good morning!' a cheery Brittany ducked past him with the plant. "'I'm going to need a key.' "'There is no key. It's a facial recognition program.' Gabe looked in the hall to find boxes waiting. He wondered how she had gotten past security. Why are there boxes in the hall? I'm moving in, announced Brittany. She set the plant near the large windows in the living room. Do these windows have blinds? I don't want Betty to get sunburnt. Betty? asked Gabe in complete confusion. The plant, explained Brittany. She turned the pot a little, then stepped back to examine her work. I think she'll be quite happy here unless it's too much sun. Why are you bringing me a plant? questioned Gabe. He wondered if this was some bizarre ritual he had never heard of. Give a girl a ring, get a plant in return. There are no blinds. The windows automatically tint when the afternoon sun hits them. Betty is mine. I'm certainly not giving her to you. I named her after Earl Minton's mom. It seemed fitting, clarified Brittany. 
Windows can automatically tint? Custom installed sensor technology? Why are you here? An impatient Gabe wondered. He didn't like having his morning routine interrupted. Briefly, he thought about asking why she had named the plant after Mrs. Milton, then decided he really didn't need to know. I'm moving in, declared Brittany with a happy smile. It only makes sense. Do you have a spare bedroom? Otherwise, I'll take the couch. A speechless Gabe watched as she poked around the condo. Finding the spare bedroom, which currently housed a few boxes of items, Gabe had never gotten around to throwing out. When he had moved into the condo, Gabe had thought about a home office or some workout equipment for the room. Somehow, he had never gotten around to it and never even used the extra space. Perfect! An excited Brittany clapped her hands. It's like a blank canvas. I can just move right in. No. The word finally made its way past his lips. You are not moving in. Brittany sighed. We are engaged. We're getting married in less than three weeks. I have decided to sell my condo. It makes sense to move in early, so the realtor will be able to show off the condo to prospective buyers at any time. I'm taking over your spare room. No, you are not, managed Gabe more firmly. Isn't it bad luck to move in together before the wedding? That's seeing the bride on the wedding day before the wedding, answered Brittany. I didn't think you were superstitious sort of person. I don't believe in luck. Moving in before the wedding isn't exactly done. Your mother can't approve, pointed out Gabe. My mother is over the moon that I'm marrying a Ramsley. If I would have told her that I was moving in, she would have packed my bags for me. Of course, she and Dad are hoping I would be marrying Max, shrugged Brittany. She marched to the hallway and grabbed a box, heading for the second bedroom. Max? frowned Gabe. The youngest of David's sons? Your cousin? Brittany raised an eyebrow. My parents thought they would be merging dynasties with Dad's boss, David. They were pretty disappointed where he married Paget. Gabe had no idea what to say to an impromptu confession. This happened often with Brittany, he reflected. She said nonsensical things, leaving her listeners with their heads spinning. Mom doesn't really like you. She thinks you're a snobbish stick in the mud, which is funny because that's what she pretends to be, a snobby socialite. Brittany dumped the box on the floor. My mother would not approve of you moving in before the wedding, said Gabe. He wasn't snobby, was he? He had a quick peek at his watch. He should have been leaving for work right now. He was going to be late. I spoke to your mother last night, smiled Brittany. I really like her. You're so lucky to have such a nice mom. She didn't seem bothered by the idea of my moving in at all after I clarified I would be in the spare room until the wedding night. We have agreed to go over some of the wedding details to tailor our wedding a little bit. I thought a light shade of blue would be our color. I've always liked blue. Dottie seems to like the idea, and since she aggravated the wedding planner so much, the girl quit. Dottie's happy to have me help her out. Somehow, she had convinced his mother. Gabe's heart sank. If he kicked Brittany out, he would have to explain it to Mom, and she wouldn't like it. Somehow, he couldn't find a plausible reason as to why she shouldn't move in, other than having Brittany here was inconvenient. If he was truly honest with himself... Brittany had always made him feel uncomfortable. Fine, he bit out. They were going to have to live together for the next five years anyways, so what was adding three more weeks? I'm not asking for your permission, pointed out Brittany as she hefted another box. Would you mind helping? These are a bit heavy. Why didn't you get a moving team? Grumbled Gabe as he grabbed a box and followed her to the spare bedroom. It was just a few things. I'll bring the rest by later smiled Brittany. You'll have to make it so I can get in the condo. I have an extra pass card for the garage, sighed Gabe. It was sitting unused in a kitchen drawer. He had never given it to anyone before. You will have to be added to the facial recognition system. How did you get past the doorman? Oh, I met this nice lady, Dolores, grinned Brittany. As soon as she heard I was engaged to you, she was more than willing to sign me in as a guest. She lives just down the hall. I think we should invite her to the wedding. Gabe wondered what was the point of living in a high-security building when his neighbors were willing to let anyone in. For all Dolores knew, 
Brittany could have been his stalker. She had been at one point. Great. I thought you would be happy to invite her, chirped Brittany, ignoring his sarcastic tone of voice as they grabbed the last two boxes. She is such a sweetheart. We've offered to exchange meatloaf recipe. Do you like meatloaf? I can make some for dinner. I have a meal service, Gabe informed her. You can cancel it, advised Brittany. I'm more than willing to cook for us. That's not necessary, began Gabe, but he was cut off by Brittany. I love to cook and bake, gushed Brittany. I find it very relaxing. Maybe you should try it sometime. That is not going to happen, firmly stated Gabe. He glanced at his watch. He was now extremely late. I need to get to work. Oh, am I holding you up? Blinked Brittany in surprise. You should have just said so. I can unpack on my own. Gabe grabbed the pass card out of the kitchen drawer, putting it on the counter. In the foyer, he touched a few buttons on a screen. The pass card is what you need for the parking garage and the elevator. I will tell the doorman to add you to the building roster, but you will need to talk to them as well. Stand here and look at the dot on the screen. A confused Brittany stood where he showed her, looking at a dot on an LCD screen. A moment later, her face appeared. Wow, it just took a picture of me. With a couple of touches, Gabe added her to the system. Press the doorbell and look straight at the screen outside the door when you want to come in. The system will recognize you and open the lock. How expensive is this? wondered Brittany as she looked at the screen. Is this even on the market yet? No, it's a before-market prototype. I'm testing it for Ben. Do not take pictures of it or tell anyone, as it's all confidential at this point, advised Gabe as he grabbed his car fob and briefcase. Ben hopes to finish the testing stage this month, then offer it on the market. Wow, I didn't know Ben was into home security, remarked Brittany. He's not usually, but the opportunity presented itself, and he was helping from the technical aspect, answered Gabe. He paused as he opened the door. I guess I'll see you tonight. Absolutely, beamed Brittany. Quickly, Gabe slipped through the door, drawing it closed behind him as he headed for the elevator. Once the doors opened, he stepped inside, hitting the button for the parking garage. Drawing in an unsettled breath, Gabe told himself he could do this. Surviving five years and three weeks with Brittany was worth it. He could make this happen. Glancing in the mirror, he noticed that he had completely forgotten his tie and blazer. He was going to arrive at the office untidy and late. There was also a board meeting today, and Gabe needed to look his best considering this month's investment numbers weren't looking great. Brittany was already having an adverse effect on him. Taking out his phone, Gabe quickly called security to have Brittany added to his tenant agreement before he could back out. He gave as many details as he could, but he simply didn't know some of the most basic information. Gabe knew her birthday, but not the year because she had skipped a couple grades, or was it just one grade? He knew her eye color, yet not her phone number. Where did Brittany currently live, or did he just list her address as his now she was moving in? She was moving in. He hadn't expected things to move quite this fast. When he had accepted her proposal, Gabe had felt like the three weeks until the wedding was long enough away that he didn't need to worry about it. Now it was Monday, and Brittany was moving in, and the wedding was nineteen days away. He was going to have to get a new tux or suit for the wedding. Gabe would have to talk to his mother to see which one, depending how formal she wanted the affair to be. He wondered what else he needed to do. This was going to severely affect his schedule, and not at the best time. Clicking his key fob to unlock the Tesla, Gabe slid into the driver's seat. As he exited the parking garage, he called his assistant Jessica to get a complete suit delivered to his office from his tailor. There was little point in just ordering a blazer and tie because they couldn't match the slacks he was wearing, so a full suit was needed for the board meeting. Driving through traffic, Gabe pulled into the parking garage of Ramsley Hospital Medical Corporation's head office building, which was located on the campus of Mercy Hospital. It was a separate building, but shared the land with the hospital, which was part of the chain of hospitals which the family owned and operated. 
Since James' retirement, Gabe had been in charge of the daily operations of ensuring the company was profitable. Not that James didn't expect a weekly report from Gabe, even though he only gave suggestions now. Gabe parked in his regular spot, heading into the building. He bypassed the coffee and snack cart in the lobby, heading for the stairs. It was faster to take the stairs rather than squeeze in on the elevators with the others, stopping at each level to let people on and off. Besides, Gabe counted it as part of his exercise routine. Once at his office, he greeted Jessica, who handed him a couple of small message slips. The board meeting has been moved up to first thing this morning, warned Jessica, looking over his less than perfect appearance. Something about a conflict for half the members for an emergency meeting with Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. Noah's pulling rank again, sighed Gabe as he looked at the messages. What is the emergency meeting about? Jessica trailed him into his office. You didn't hear from me. But the FBI has frozen the company's accounts for their investigation. The cash flow's dried up, and your cousin needs to figure out how to keep the business afloat. Stopping, Gabe looked at his secretary in shock. How did I not know this? I found out this morning, shrugged Jessica. I put in a couple calls with the secretaries at the other family businesses. The insurance and hotel accounts are frozen as well. The FBI has even frozen Noah, Jake, Dylan, Nate, Garrett, and Addison's accounts. I guess the others were cleared of wrongdoing in the investigation, so they're using their money to help prop up the businesses. But at some point, even they are going to run out if the revenue stream is inaccessible. Agent Kepler is going to run our businesses into the ground, a stunned Gabe murmured. Jessica cocked her head to the side. Why hasn't Ramsley Hospital and Medical Corporation been under scrutiny? We have, Gabe said shortly. My father was investigated. Yet our accounts are fine. She gauged his reaction. Father paid his fines for his initial involvement, reluctantly admitted Gabe. He trusted Jessica to be circumspect with the information. She was a fiend when it came to holding secrets, but getting gossip from others. More than once, Jessica had proved her worth. However, he pulled out of David's schemes years ago. The courts were more lenient, and the matter was settled privately. As much as he trusted his secretary, he wasn't about to tell her that James had instigated the entire investigation by confessing his part in the illegal drug operation and money laundering scheme. It was bad enough. All of Gabe's uncles were now in prison, awaiting trial for their criminal behavior. There is a problem, noted Jessica. It was obvious she knew there was more to the story, but wasn't about to press her boss for details at this time. Your tailor had a mire near fire last night. A coffee machine sparked and the smoke set off the sprinklers. Everything is soaked. Gabe felt a flicker of annoyance. He could go home and change, but Brittany was there. He set his briefcase down on the desk. I'll tell the board that I spilled coffee on myself. Dyson wants to push a motion to stop the pro bono surgeries again, warned Jessica as she stepped out of the office back towards her station. The meeting is at 10, boardroom D. Dyson always wanted to stop any charity work that they did, citing it was draining the company's balance sheets. What Dyson really meant was the skinflint felt the charity work was taking more money from the investors' pockets, including his own. Truth was, the charity work brought in extra funds to the fundraising process and paid for itself. Once again, Gabe would be forced to prove it through the numbers. It was a waste of his time, but Gabe would do it. Most of his job was keeping the company profitable, dealing with any emergencies, press relations, and calming the board and investors. While he took pride in upholding a tradition of family business practices, Gabe sometimes found it a little tedious. However, he had no idea what else he would do. This was what he had been born into and what was expected of him. It was what he expected of himself. Pulling out his laptop and hooking it up to his monitor, Gabe realized in his haste to leave the condo, he had forgotten the USB stick containing the reports he needed for the meeting. It was okay, he reasoned. The USB was just a copy, so he could work from home. The real data was in the data storage device Ben had rigged up for him. Gabe didn't trust backing up his items to some random space on the internet. He preferred to have it in physical form. 
It was gone. Jessica, pressing the intercom on the phone, gave talk to his secretary. Where's the backup storage device for my computer? Ben has it for scheduled maintenance. He'll return it just before lunch, she reminded him. We talked about this on Friday. All you need for the meeting is the USB copy of the reports. The USB stick, which he had left at home. Checking his watch, Gabe had less than 20 minutes until the meeting. There wasn't time to get to the condo and back before the start of the meeting. The only possible solution to his problem was one he didn't like at all. The worst part, he didn't have Brittany's phone number. If she wasn't at the condo, then he had no way to get in contact with her. Pulling out his cell phone, Gabe called his security system phone number, patching himself through the screen system. He could see by video on his phone Brittany was happily searching through his kitchen, humming under her breath as she looked through what he had on hand for food. Faced with empty cupboards and a fridge which contained only basic condiments and a few drinks, she huffed as she looked into a freezer which had only ice. Gabe rolled his eyes and pressed the call button. He waited while Brittany was startled at the chiming of the security system. There was one in the kitchen, and she peered at the screen before pressing the button to accept the call. "'I told you I have a meal service,' he reminded her. "'You have nothing in your kitchen,' complained Brittany. "'What do you do for snacks?' "'I'm really home before seven, explained Gabe. I eat my pre-ordered dinner, go through whatever reports I need to, and go to bed. I get any snacks from the cart service at the office. It's convenient. Now, I need you to do something for me. You need me to make you some real food, inserted Brittany, tucking her hair behind her ears. Something better than from a coffee cart. No, spoke Gabe firmly. I need you to grab the tie and suit jacket laid out in my bed. More important, there's a USB stick in the living room probably on one of the side tables. I need it at the office immediately for a meeting which starts in less than 20 minutes. I will get you cleared through security and you can come directly to my office to drop the items off. I suppose I could, mused Brittany. Then I can grab some more boxes on the way back. Thank you, breathed Gabe. Maybe this having a wife business wouldn't be too bad. Then again, he wasn't prone to forgetting things. If Brittany hadn't interrupted his morning, Gabe would have had the reports and been dressed properly. I really appreciate this. I'll see you in a bit, smiled Brittany before she shut off the call. Gabe could still see her via the cameras installed around the apartment as she gathered the necessary items, found the USB stick, and headed out the door. He had a sigh of relief. Problem solved. Looking a little casual today commented Parker as he entered Gabe's office without knocking. He slouched in one of Gabe's leather chairs. Better finish getting dressed before the board meeting. Tryson is looking to score points and start a mutiny. Tryson doesn't have the votes, scoffed Gabe. He likes to talk big, but he'll never be head of a coup. We need to keep this whole situation under control, warned Parker. Otherwise a coup might be a very real threat. Some of the board is a bit antsy in how things are being handled regarding the whole FBI investigation into our uncle's involvement in criminal activity. We aren't being investigated, pointed out Gabe, which means we're handling the situation perfectly. If they need to be reminded that the circumstances are under control, then I'll be more than happy to tell them who's in charge and how it has benefited them. Parker held whatever doubts he may have had to himself. I've been meaning to talk to you about something. Gabe watched his brother straighten to sit up in the chair. Parker's serious expression didn't bode well for whatever he wanted to talk about. What is it? There's been a theft from Mercy General, answered Parker. It's not big, but the security was breached and no one caught it. When did the theft happen? frowned Gabe. This was serious. What was stolen? About a month ago. I found out about it just yesterday, sighed Parker. He hesitated. The person was caught on camera. They have a key code for the medical supply unit and a pass card. I don't know where they got it. Likely one of the staff thought he was you. Thought he was me? Gabe asked, surprised. Why would they think that? I haven't been near any of the medical supply units. I have no reason to be. It was Garrett, a grim Parker stated firmly. 
The video's grainy, but I know it was him. Our cousin Garrett? Gabe knew his cousin Garrett looked a lot like him, but anyone who knew both of them wouldn't make the mistake of mixing them up. Perhaps the entire hospital chain could use a security system overhaul. Why would he steal something from one of our hospitals? It just doesn't make any sense. What did he take? Medication we use during heart operations. It stops the heart from beating, so procedures to repair a heart can be done. Parker shook his head. The drug is the only thing missing from the inventory and not accounted for, so I have to assume that's what he took. The good news is it wasn't in the narcotics or opiates dispensary, so we know Garrett doesn't have a drug problem. Could there have been a mistake? Gabe grappled with the idea his cousin had stolen from him. It seemed surreal. It's all on the surveillance video, shrugged Parker. I have set up interviews for the staff who were on duty for the day of the theft. I want to fully investigate this before I speak to Garrett about his actions. The best thing we can do is try to keep it quiet for now. Gabe nodded. Agreed. We don't need any more bad press. All the family businesses had suffered because of the negative reporting about the FBI investigations. It didn't seem to matter what they did in regards to creating good press by committing more to charity work. The news media simply hyped the continued story of the money laundering and drug smuggling their uncles had been drawn into. I heard this morning personal and business accounts involved in the investigations are being frozen by the FBI, ventured Parker. I heard it as well. However, my source tells me the accounts have already been frozen for nearly a month, confessed Gabe. It must be a nightmare to operate under such conditions. The only good news about it is that Ramsley HMC hasn't been drawn into the whole debacle. Parker shared a look with Gabe. Only because Dad was the one who turned Uncle David in, and already paid the penalties the government wanted. Groaned Gabe. What are we going to tell the family? What do you mean? Parker asked in confusion. Why do we need to tell them anything? They'll just be angry Dad started this whole snowball of an investigation. You don't think that they aren't going to wonder why we aren't being investigated? Gabe raised an eyebrow. Why our accounts aren't frozen just like theirs? I don't think it's going to be enough that we just tell them Dad and Ramsley HMC wasn't involved in the money laundering, especially since Dad was at the beginning. Sometimes it's better to let secrets be secrets, advised Parker. It's not like anyone has been asking questions. They will. We need to have a united front on how to answer those questions, predicted a gloomy Gabe. He wondered what Parker knew about the secret in their own family tree that pertained to him. Don't just think the family will be the only one asking. Reporters will be digging into it as well. We'll have to get the PR team together and see how we can spin the investigation into some sort of positive press for us. Positive press is easy. Dad did the right thing and paid the fines associated for his prior behavior, replied Parker with some sarcasm. However, the rest of the family is royally ticked off because Dad started the whole investigation by confessing his past misdeeds. That will go over well. Maybe we can sell the truth somewhere in the middle, hoped Gabe. We got caught, we pay our dues. It was less because Dad got out early. We learned from our mistake years ago and had no bearing on our business today as we continue to provide quality services to our patients, investors, and communities. No one needs to know Dad confessed before the FBI even knew to investigate anything. It works a lot better nodded Parker in agreement as he thought it over. Everyone wins in that scenario. Plus, it is the truth. A little edited, but the truth. Gabe sighed, feeling the weight of the decision on him. He didn't like lying, not even by omission, but the consequences would be severe if he didn't. They would lose friends and family from James's betrayal of a family loyalty. As head of the family company, Gabe also had a business and investor interest to protect as well. It was a tough middle ground. Lying and keeping secrets had never set well with him. However, what was one more to add to the ones he already kept? Gabe made a decision. We'll go to the middle ground and hope no one finds out what Dad did. Agreed, concurred Parker. How do you want to handle Garrett? Keep going with the investigation, Gabe told him. 
Let me know when you've compiled more information and when you want to confront Garrett. If you need a second opinion, I'll be here, but otherwise the matter is completely yours to handle. Parker nodded as he checked his watch. I should get going. I'm going to snag coffee from the cart before I go to the meeting. Doesn't your secretary just grab you what you need? Questioned Gabe. Not that Gabe would have Jessica grab his items from the cart. Their relationship was based on certain rules, which included Gabe having his own food items ordered or fetching them himself. In return, Jessica kept him informed of what was happening behind the scenes of other members of the board and in key positions of the hospitals that he ran. His secretary had a network of other secretaries she tapped for the information which she provided him. It was a mutually benefiting relationship. Gabe was more than willing to get his own coffee in exchange to know who actually was loyal to him and the company versus just posturing to Gabe's face while plodding behind his back. Jessica's information was invaluable when it came to predicting how voting with the board would go and who might be swayed before a big decision. I like the exercise, shrugged Parker as he rose from the chair. Plus, it's nice to have a small chat with Mario each day. Mario? frowned Gabe. The guy who runs the cart? answered Parker with a small shake of his head. You really need to start noticing the little people. They have interesting stories. Little people? Gabe raised an eyebrow. You know what I mean, an annoyed Parker replied. People who don't have a direct influence on your life or aren't of your status? The rest of the world, Gabe. Expand your universe. You might be surprised what you find. Go get your coffee, urged Gabe. He didn't need a lecture from his brother on how to be a better person. He glanced at his watch. Brittany should have been here by now. He had forgotten to clear her through security. Gabe grabbed the desk phone, dialing down to the security desk as Parker curiously watched him. Yes, I need to clear someone to enter the building. In fact, if you could give them an escort to my office, it would be ideal. Her name is Brittany Crawford. Parker sat back in the leather seat, all ears to Gabe's conversation. Gabe listened as the security person told him Brittany was at the desk. She's there? Great. Send her up. Hanging up the phone, Gabe faced his brother. Chapter 5 Brittany's here? Chapter 5 Brittany's here? Parker raised an eyebrow, anticipating a good reason for the odd behavior of his brother. I forgot something at home, reluctantly explained Gabe. She's bringing it. Did I just hear that right? asked Parker. He leaned forward in his chair. Brittany is at your place, when you're not at home. She's moving in, clarified a frowning Gabe. It's less than three weeks to the wedding, and she's going to sell her condo. It makes sense. What did Mom have to say about the two of you sharing a place? Whistled Parker. Brittany's in the spare room until after the wedding, came Gabe's sharp rebuke. If you say so, easily conceded Parker as he leaned back in the chair, enjoying Gabe's discomfort. Are you okay with it? What do you mean, am I okay with it? Scowled Gabe. Well, a week ago, you would have avoided Brit like the plague, shrugged Parker. Now you're marrying the girl, and she's moving in with you. I just want to make sure my big brother's okay with this new turn of events. Marrying her is my choice, determined Gabe. He neglected to voice what both of them knew. Maybe there hadn't been a lot of options besides Brittany. Maybe Marshall had pushed him into the decision a little hastily. I will be fine. Okay, nodded Parker, if you say so. Gabe narrowed his eyes, but declined to reply as Jessica knocked on his door, poking her head in. Brittany Crawford, here to see you? Send her in, directed Gabe. A feeling of relief went through him. Now he would look presentable and have the proper files. Brittany gave Jessica an inscrutable look as she passed the secretary into Gabe's office. Holding the suit jacket on a hanger with a cover over it, she nodded to Parker. Hello, Parker. It's nice to see you. Good to see you, replied Parker as he leaned back to watch the show. Don't you have a coffee to fetch? Gabe reminded his brother. That can wait, remarked Parker quite contentedly. Thank you. Gabe took the hanger from Brittany, unzipping the cover and removing the jacket and tie. He draped the jacket over his chair as he pulled up his collar to lay the tie properly against the fabric of his shirt. Where's the USB stick? Right here murmured Brittany as she dug through her purse. 
Frowning, she rooted around. I know I put it in here. Tell me you have the USB stick, said Gabe as he knotted his tie and adjusted his collar. I have the stick, she repeated, pulling out a pack of tissues, a handful of lipsticks, a wallet, and car keys. Brittany began loading up his desk with items from her purse as she searched. Why don't you just use the backup storage? questioned Parker as he hid his smirk behind his hand. It's out for scheduled maintenance, managed Gabe in an even tone as he glared daggers at his brother. You know, if you used an internet-based storage system, you wouldn't have this problem, mentioned Brittany as she put even more items on his desk. Then I would have to deal with the problem of possible cybersecurity threats, answered Gabe as he stared at the growing pile. He shrugged into the suit jacket. Just how much do you fit into that purse? Oh, it has everything I need, an unconcerned Brittany replied, putting a makeup bag down along with another small bag, a container of lip balm, and a set of nail clippers. I can't possibly go without it. It's like a never-ending magical bag, observed Parker with fascination. Can you pull a rabbit out of the purse? What would I need a rabbit for? chided Brittany as she fished out the USB stick triumphantly. There it is. Gabe quickly grabbed the USB stick. Great, thanks. Wait a moment. Brittany followed him out of the office. The meeting is about to start. I need to set up. A rushed Gabe said, striding past Jessica, who gave him a censorous look. Two seconds, insisted Brittany. Gabe! Gabe stopped, turning to face her. Britt, there isn't time. I have a meeting to run. Whatever you want to talk about can wait. You can make supper. Go ahead. Put your stuff wherever you want. I have to go to the boardroom. I just wanted to straighten your tie. I know how you like to have everything perfect when doing presentations, Brittany informed him. She reached up, moving the piece of fabric. Now your tie is straight. Have a good meeting. Feeling chastened, Gabe nodded. Thank you for everything. You're welcome, smiled Brittany. She watched as he made his way down the hall. Well, that was special, mused Parker. Engaged? Brittany lifted an eyebrow as she pulled her gaze away from Brittany's ring to give Parker a sidelong glance. He didn't say anything. It's new, confirmed Parker. Probably will be an announcement in the society paper soon, knowing Mom. I had no idea, admitted Jessica, irritated by the news. Now you know chirped Brittany as she swung a predatory smile on the pretty secretary. Parker, don't you have a meeting or something? I think the lovely secretary and I should have a chat. Oh, I don't know if that's a good idea, mentioned Parker as he looked at the two ladies. I think it's a brilliant idea, cooed Jessica, dripping false enthusiasm. We are going to be the best of girlfriends. I think so, too, gushed Brittany. Oh, boy. Parker muttered. He glanced at his watch. Gabe would not be happy if he was late. Then again, Gabe might not appreciate what was about to happen here. I think I should escort Brittany to her car. I would hate for her to get lost in the building. Sometimes it can be a bit confusing, and even I get turned around. Go away, Parker, requested Jessica sweetly. Brittany and I have things to discuss. I promise she won't get lost going to the parking garage. Gabe would have to handle this on his own, decided Parker. Have a nice afternoon. Brittany waited for Parker to leave before approaching the secretary with a handout. Brittany coffered. Jessica Porter, replied Jessica as she coolly shook Brittany's hand. Let's get a few things straight. I'm the secretary. I do not sleep with the boss. I am efficient and I assure his efficiency. I'm career focused and anything that poses a threat to my boss at being his best and at the top of the company is a threat to me. Gabe is a well-oiled machine and doesn't need to be bogged down with a wife or children. I fully expect him to amalgamate with several hospital change over the next decade, taking Ramsley HMC to the next level. He needs to concentrate on his career to achieve those objectives. Gabe doesn't need a family life, nor is he a family man. You should quit now. Wow, you don't pull any punches, breathed Brittany. She gave Jessica an admiring look. I appreciate your honesty. Jessica waited, then gave Brittany a confused look when she didn't say anything more. 
That's it? That's all you have to say? I'm the one wearing the ring. Brittany flashed her engagement ring with a satisfied smile. I think that says it all. Jessica narrowed her eyes as Brittany went into Gabe's office to collect her purse and everything she had strewn over Gabe's desk in her search for the USB stick. The confrontation with Gabe's secretary was concerning. It was obvious Jessica was jealous, but Brittany did believe her when she said she wasn't sleeping with her boss. Gabe wasn't the type to have an affair with a secretary. Brittany could sympathize with Jessica. She knew what it was like to love someone from afar. However, she wasn't about to let Jessica sabotage her chance with Gabe, not after waiting all these years. Sometimes Brittany could barely believe it. Gabe was going to marry her. Gazing down at the engagement ring, garrisoning her finger, Brittany smiled happily. Moving in this morning had been risky, but ultimately had been the right move. Now she had to finish moving in and start being indispensable to him. Once Gabe came to rely on her, he would never want to let her go. She was going to do this. Her dreams were about to come true. Brittany was going to make Gabe fall in love with her. Flicking the last of her stuff into her purse, Brittany walked with her head high through the outer office. She had dealt with tons of society girls who thought they were better than she was all her life. She could deal with one pesky secretary. Jessica ignored her exit, going so far as to turn her back on her. Well, it wasn't over. Jessica hadn't been in this battle for Gabe for as long as Brittany had been, and no one was as determined as Brittany Crawford. For the next hour, Brittany wandered through Gabe's workplace, chatting to random people and introducing herself. She especially loved Mario, the fellow who ran the coffee and snack cart. He was a friendly fount of information, who happily introduced her to a number of employees. Feeling like she had made some headway, but knowing she needed to get back to her condo before the moving guys came, Brittany said goodbye to Mario, promising to visit again. In fact, she was going to make herself a regular nuisance to Jessica. Brittany planned on bringing lunch every single workday to her dear fiancé. Gabe had said she could cancel his meal service, and starting tonight, he was eating her cooking only. Many popular magazines toted away to a man's heart was through his stomach. Brittany was about to put the theory to the test. A short drive later, and she barely made it to her condo door before the movers arrived. She directed them to take her chair, nightstands, and bed, while she emptied the dresser into boxes to make it lighter for them to carry. She probably should have come home directly after talking to Gabe to be more prepared for the movers, Brittany reflected. However, she had wanted to stamp her mark on Gabe at his workplace, so by the end of the day, everyone would know he was getting married. She should also ask Gabe what co-workers he wanted to invite to the wedding. The rest of the morning was spent trying to keep ahead of the movers, packing up items which were going to her new home. Her new home. Just thinking the thought was exciting. Brittany was about to embark on a new adventure with Gabe. She pushed a strand of hair out of her face as she bent to tape another box shut. The movers had taken the bed apart and were taking the last pieces to the moving truck. Brittany didn't have much time to grab some necessities. While she could bring over boxes on her own, she preferred not to have to take too many trips. "'Why didn't you tell me?' asked Tara as she leaned in the doorway. "'I had to find out through the grapevine. When you didn't answer your phone, I came directly here.' Brittany looked up at her best friend with some trepidation. "'I wanted to tell you. You're the first person I thought of when it happened, but I also thought you wouldn't be happy for me.' "'Brit,' sighed Tara, coming into the room." sitting on the floor beside her friend. If you are happy, I'm happy. I've always loved him, shrugged Brittany. She grinned and showed Tara the engagement ring. We're getting married the last Saturday of the month. What? Tara jerked her eyes off the ring to look at Brittany. Are you kidding? Why so fast? He wants a child, announced Brittany. This is more than about a child, gasped Tara. Spill. Brittany sighed. She had known Tara would want the truth. Tara knew Brittany's troubled history with Gabe and wouldn't be convinced he had suddenly fallen in love with her, realized his feelings, and magically proposed. It was a nice fairy tale, but it wasn't true. His father gave him and his brothers an ultimatum, mumbled Brittany. 
They need to each get married within the month, produce a pregnancy within the year, and on the five-year anniversary of the marriage, the brothers will each receive their inheritance. If they refuse, they lose their positions with the company and are disinherited. Tara stared at her in shock. So Gabe and I are getting married. Brittany tried for a happy tone, which fell a little flat. We're going to have a child together. I've got five years to make him love me. Oh, Britt. Tara wrapped an arm around her friend. You can't make someone love you. They have to choose to love you. I can do this, a determined Brittany said. I will be the best wife anyone could ever have, and Gabe will be lost without me. It's happening again. We're spiraling down the Gabe hole, sighed Tara. This is going to be just like when you dyed your hair green. Except I will be his wife and have his baby, remarked Brittany. If you get pregnant. A lot of women don't get pregnant the first year of marriage, noted Tara. You face an even bigger obstacle with your health. Is your doctor even allowing this? I thought he wanted to perform a hysterectomy. He does. It's best to perform a hysterectomy before the cancer spreads, replied Brittany. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have this baby first. After the baby's born, then they can perform the surgery and I will do the cancer treatments. You're risking your life warned Tara. I want to be a mom. I want to have a normal pregnancy and a happy baby. I'm willing to take the risk, responded Brittany. She clasped Tara's hand in hers. I need you to support me through this. I don't plan on telling Gabe about the cancer. Britt, he needs to know, insisted a shocked Tara. If he does, he'll break off the engagement and find someone else. She squeezed Tara's hand. It will tear up my heart if he marries anyone else. You know that. Gabe can't know about the cancer. Please, Tara, help me through this. Are you sure that this is what you want to do? Questioned Tara. Lying to your husband isn't a good thing. I worry you'll end up like you always do, hurt by Gabe. I want this, Tara, Brittany said firmly. I'm going to take the chance at my happily ever after. It might not work out. But I will always have a piece of him through his child, and that alone will make me happy. Please understand. Torn, Tara looked at her friend in sympathy. You know I will always support you. Thank you. A relieved Brittany hugged Tara. I want you to be my maid of honor. I will be happy to be your maid of honor, said Tara as she squeezed Brittany back. Great, I need all the help I can get with the wedding in nineteen days. Grateful, Brittany gave Tara a smile. We are going to need to make some serious lists, Tara mentioned with a grin. Maybe we can laminate them. Brittany rolled her eyes. Don't remind me. What? It was a cute phase of yours, teased Tara. I still make lists, shrugged Brittany. It's a good way to stay organized. Don't ever change, Britt. Not for anyone. Not even Gabe, advised Tara. Brittany knew it wasn't likely. She would do what she had to in order to keep Gabe as hers. I moved in with him. What? Tara asked in surprise. Is that why the movers are here? Does Gabe know? He gave me a pass card, smiled Brittany. I'm moving into his spare room. Promise me, before you make any other big moves, you will run them past me, appealed Tara in concern. We don't want another talent show exposition or a prom fiasco. We do not talk about prom warned Brittany. That's why I'm trying to prevent another prom-like occurrence, appealed Tara. If you have any ideas which might even be the tiniest bit like prom, tell me so I can talk you down. I have grown up, Tara. I'm not the same Star Trek girl I was before, insisted Brittany. Gabe has his faults and so do I. I'm just trying to compromise a little with the end goal of keeping him in mind. Just as long as you don't lose yourself in the process, advised Tara. How can anyone lose themselves? wondered Brittany. It seems silly. Don't worry, I'll be right here if it happens again, sighed Tara. She looked at the boxes. How much are we moving? Just enough to make me comfortable in the guest room, replied Brittany. Oh, I would like to take some of my kitchen items as well. Do you know he has no food in his condo? Nothing. Gabe has a meal service. They bring him everything and even take the dirty dishes. I called them to cancel. I'm going to be the one cooking. Did you ask Gabe if that was what he wanted? questioned Tara. 
Both of you are in a relationship now. You have to take his wants into consideration as well as yours. I know I go overboard, admitted Brittany as she stood, grabbing the box and putting it in the hall. I get overly enthusiastic, and I forget to be reasonable. However, Gabe said I could. Okay, Tara capitulated. It was obvious this was what Brittany wanted. I'm happy for you. Let's get everything you want moved over. I've always wanted to snoop in a Ramsley condo. Brittany laughed, and the two friends chatted wedding ideas as they sorted through what would stay for now versus what needed to go to Gabe's condo today. It was awkward, Gabe decided. He had come home from work the usual time to find Brittany had kept dinner waiting. She had insisting on eating together at the small dining table, which he never used. Gabe had decided to compromise and indulge her in this, but the small talk was just awkward. They had gone through how his meeting had went. They had discussed the rest of his day. Brittany had been delighted to meet his secretary, which Gabe didn't quite believe somehow, but he also didn't want to delve further into whatever had really happened between the pair. Jessica had been in a snit all day after her encounter with Brittany, and Gabe had simply decided not to react. Sometimes it was better to play a dumb man and pretend he didn't realize anything was wrong. They had conversed ad nauseum about Brittany's moving into the spare bedroom and her experience with the movers who were apparently the most patient and helpful men she had ever met. Gabe neglected to say it was what she was paying them for, since he didn't think he wanted the fallout from such a comment. Finally, dinner was over. Gabe couldn't complain about the cooking. Brittany was exceptionally good at putting a meal together. She was even going to clean it up without any expectation of help. He had offered, although he had no idea how to do dishes. Gabe had never done any amount of household chores in his life. Thankfully, Brittany had turned him down. Now she was puttering around, pulling things out of her boxes and finding new places for them to reside. She still had a small stack of them in the hallway and was slowly bringing them in and unpacking. Gabe was thankful the majority of her stuff was finding its way into her room. However, there were exceptions, which he didn't particularly enjoy. He had made the condo his home, and now he was having to share, which was something Gabe wasn't used to. Trying to ignore Brittany, he concentrated on his laptop, running the numbers again. Gabe frowned, highlighting an area for further investigation. Since he had learned that the family business was being used as a front for laundering money, Gabe had been meticulously going over the accounting to ensure there wasn't any odd activity going on in the past eight years. The FBI was still going over the company figures in the ongoing investigation, and Gabe didn't want any surprises that he would have to explain during his tenure as head of Ramsley HMC. He would scrutinize the business now and be prepared for any eventuality. Glancing at his watch, Gabe realized the time. Shutting his laptop, he set everything away for the next morning and checked to see if he had any messages or texts a moment as he got up to get ready for bed. Gabe abruptly looked up from his cell phone. Something was wrong. His peripheral vision had picked up something that hadn't been there before. Turning his head slowly, he surveyed the room to find the kitchen counters cluttered with all sorts of small appliances in bright red. Tightening his jaw, Gabe narrowed his eyes. Brit? What is it? Brittany asked offhandedly as she walked from the hall towards her designated bedroom with yet another box in her arms. She didn't even look towards Gabe as she walked the short distance. Why are there things in my kitchen? he demanded. What things? she asked, her voice muffled as she put the box in the bedroom. Things, clarified Gabe, waving his phone at them, on my countertops. Things? Brittany had a little laugh as she came into the kitchen. What things? These, Gabe pointed, all these gadgets? They are kitchen appliances. They belong in the kitchen? Brittany raised an eyebrow, half amused at his antics. They can't be here, he told her tersely. Brittany folded her arms and cocked her head to the side. I'm moving in. I have stuff. It needs to go someplace. 
Well, it can't go here, reiterated Gabe, glaring at her red stand mixer. You can leave it in storage. No, I'm not going to put it in storage, as I plan on using these appliances quite a bit, sighed Brittany. Is this about you not wanting me to move in? I agree to your moving in. Gabe gestured at the countertop. I did not agree to allow you to clutter up my condo. Gabe? Brittany stepped in front of him so that he had to look at her. We agreed I would move in so my condo could sell. I am moving in. We are about to get married. This means my stuff will be your stuff, and your stuff will be my stuff. When we are married, I will be moving into the master bedroom with you. It is how these things work. You had to know this was coming. You have too much stuff, he worked out while taking in a deep breath to try to tamp down the panic. We will be getting a house, Brittany shrugged, unconcerned. It will have more than enough room for everything we have. A house? echoed Gabe, his stomach bottoming out. What would they do with a house? Visions of chaos of kids and a dog running through with mud on them were conjured by his brain. Stop looking so pale and like you want to throw up? She rolled her eyes. A baby means even more stuff, and we need at least three bedrooms. This place is just too small. We will get a nice house, preferably somewhere near a park and a good school. A house, breathed Gabe in distress. We are not getting a house. What do you mean a, near a good school? This kid will be a Ramsley. All Ramsleys have gone to Livingston Academy since the institution opened. I was thinking perhaps we could break with tradition. Brittany pertly told him. According to recent studies, most children are happier being brought up middle class. I want our son to be happy, so I think a nice middle class neighborhood and school would be perfect. No, just the security ramifications would be a nightmare, breathed Gabe. Absolutely not. Don't you want your son to be happy? asked Brittany, slightly annoyed at his flat refusal of her plan. I want him or her not to be kidnapped, retorted Gabe. Like it or not, people of a certain class are targeted. It's the reason we pay for security. You can't buy safety, reasoned Brittany. No one can be bubble-wrapped all of their lives. It's just not realistic. Look at your cousins. Many of them have done all sorts of thrill-seeking adventures and have come back more confident, more mature. Max lives on the streets for a while and he was perfectly fine. He and Paget live a middle-class lifestyle. Their boys are perfectly happy. They even share a room. Morgan and Ryder go to Livingston Academy, Gabe quickly pointed out. They go to school with their cousins. Going to a proper educational facility sets the groundwork for higher education opportunities with Ivy League schools. Brittany frowned. Do you hear what a snob you are? I'm just debating the merits of a good educational foundation, reasoned Gabe, knowing he was starting to win the argument when Brittany called him names. It had been that way ever since their first debate against each other at Livingston Academy. Brittany narrowed her eyes, and Gabe's stomach clenched. She was about to deliver a knockout punch. With a sickeningly sweet smile, Brittany responded, I will compromise. Compromise is what a marriage is all about. A house in a middle-class neighborhood near the park, but close enough to Livingston Academy so he can attend, continuing the family tradition. I want to keep our child grounded instead of becoming a complete snobby bore. Gabe frowned. Was she calling him a snobby bore? It pricked his ego to hear her say it. We don't need a house in a middle class area. Yet we are getting one if you want your son to go to Livingston Academy. Brittany left to grab another box. Fine. Gabe decided to agree for now. Once they saw the houses available, Brittany was sure to change her mind and realize it wasn't the type of lifestyle to raise a child in. What they needed was a nice, secure condo building on the edge of the city with a great security system and door person. They could employ a driver to take the child to school each day and a nanny to deal with the mess the kid would leave. It was a good solution. I'm going to reduce my hours at my job. Brittany announced as she came in with the next box. It makes sense, since I'll be staying home with the baby. Once he goes to preschool, I can increase a few hours if I want, but I'll still mostly work from home. Tara and I have already talked about it. She did it when she had her children, and now I will get to do the same. 
Why? frowned Gabe. If you want to work, it isn't a big deal. I'm not a traditionalist like my parents. Even though Mom didn't work, it wasn't like we saw her very often with her charity events. Brittany stopped, looking at him with something akin to pity. I'm staying home and working part-time because I hated being raised by a nanny. Children should be raised by their parents. They should know their mom and dad. Don't you want to spend time with our child? I thought you would teach him how to play catch, ride a bike, bring him up to ball games, that sort of thing. James had never done any of those things with his sons. Gabe remembered his father teaching how to crunch numbers and spot discrepancies in reports. He had learned how to lead a company, not how to play catch. His cousins had taught him how to play and have fun, certainly not James. I don't know. I guess maybe I hadn't really thought about it. Which is why we need a house with a backyard, said Brittany in satisfaction. Maybe even a dog. No. Gabe bit out. I definitely draw the line at dogs. Then a cat. Brittany tossed over her shoulder as she deposited the box on the sofa of the living room. She tore off the tape, sorting through bubble wrap to bring out a lamp. Cats get hair everywhere. Gabe gave the offending stand mixer a last glare before going to the living room to try to reason with Brittany. They aren't good for kids. Says who? She moved aside a stack of printed reports off an end table and put down her lamp, looking for an electrical outlet. Says the kid who choked on a hairball and whatever else cats leave behind? Gabe wrinkled his nose. No pets. Fish? A turtle? Brittany leaned over the sofa, stretching to plug in the lamp. He's going to clean the aquarium, questioned Gabe while he had a look at the view. Berating himself, he tore his eyes away. He didn't like Brit, he reminded himself. I'm certainly not going to. He was marrying Brit. The panicky thought interrupted him. She always argued with him, pushing the envelope. She disagreed with him and wanted to take risks. She wasn't a safe choice. Good point. She straightened, then reached for the box. We'll stick to the dog, then. No dog, he repeated mentally dragging his thoughts back to the conversation. Something small. Brittany put a small framed picture out of the box, looking around the living room with a discerning eye. What does your cousin Dylan have again? You know, those cute little fat things that smile. I don't know, and we aren't getting one. Gabe felt like he was talking to himself for all the listening Brittany was doing. Pets are unhygienic. We don't want our baby around unhygienic things. It's unhealthy. Brittany set down the frame with some satisfaction on a side table near the windows, before turning to face Gabe and decide just how serious he was. He was pretty serious, she concluded. We will revisit it when the baby's a little older. Perhaps just after the toddler phase? It'll be better for him to grow up with a dog. Are you even listening to me? Gabe waved his arms in frustration. Not really. Brittany shrugged and smiled. I have an appointment with the realtor next weekend, so we can look at a house. Gabe stopped still, feeling a little trapped. I'm not available. Yes, you are, she said smugly. I already checked your agenda. There's nothing listed. There is a conference, improvised Gabe quickly. It's mandatory that I be there. There is no conference, repeated Brittany with patience, sticking magnets with cutesy flower designs on them to his fridge his spotless, clean, stainless steel fridge. Sure there is, Gabe stated resolutely, trying to get out of the house hunting with Brittany. I just didn't write it down. You write everything in your planner, Brittany said dryly, and there is nothing for next weekend except reviewing a bunch of boring reports which you can do any time. You're coming with me if you want to have any say where you live for the next five years. Otherwise, I'll just pick it for us. If she picked it, it would no doubt be some horrible pink creation, with trim and knick-knacks everywhere, thought Gabe as he forced a breath through his lungs. She might even want to go so far as a fixer-upper, since Brittany always loved watching those home makeover shows. Gabe had accidentally found out that fact in college. He didn't know why, but facts about Brittany always seemed to stick in his brain, despite his wish that they wouldn't. Gabe was not going to raise his kid and live for the next five years in some wholesome wreck of a house with asbestos and drywall dust everywhere 
while Britt held a crowbar and murmured she hadn't realized it had been a supporting wall she had torn down. Fine, I will go. Brittany gave him a luminous smile, and Gabe could feel his heart skip a beat. It's just fear, he told himself firmly. It couldn't possibly be anything else. Chapter 6 She's in my space, groused Gabe. He was at the gym a couple days later with Parker, the dreaded weekend fast approaching. It was a ritual between the pair to go into the gym for an hour or so before work. Marshall sometimes came, depending on what his schedule permitted as he often was in surgery. She's got a ton of stuff, and she's taking up all my space. She's moving in, grunted Parker as he lifted barbells. It's what they do. Women come with a lot of stuff, some of it you won't even be allowed to use. Apparently, there are towels which are only for guests. Did you know that? I never invite anyone into my space. Gabe put down the weights and began to pace, toweling his face. Not anyone. No one comes to my condo. It's my personal place just for me. Now she's invading it. No one? Parker raised an eyebrow. I know you've had a few girlfriends. No one, growled Gabe. Only the cleaning lady, and she's just scheduled for once a week. You have never brought any ladies to your place? frowned Parker. No. Gabe let out a gusty sigh. It was easier. No entanglements. That's probably smart. Parker thought about it. That's definitely smart. I'm going to have to move out of the condo, Gabe announced suddenly. I've lived there ever since my last year of college, and now I have to move. Why? questioned Parker. You get the condo if you meet the conditions of the ultimatum. I guess I will sell it, or rent it out. Brit wants to buy a house. A house, snorted Gabe. All for a five-year marriage and a kid. A house. You could keep the condo, Parker pointed out. It's a good exit strategy to have an alternate place. Do I need an exit strategy? Gabe stopped and stared at his brother. Do you have an exit strategy? I definitely do, confirmed Parker. I bought this nice little condo years ago, which I rent out. If things get particularly bad, I have at least got my condo since it's paid out in full. I've listed it as excluded in the prenup. You have a prenup? Gabe wondered what else he had forgotten. Yup, verified Parker. You need one too. It's Brit. Gabe shrugged, not convinced either way. For some reason, ending the marriage was as bad of an idea as beginning it. The whole marriage thing was a nightmare in his opinion. I'm sure she'd be okay to split things as we come into the marriage. Not if you buy anything together, Parker advised as he kept working out. What you purchase as a couple will get split differently. You need to set out the rules. Get a prenuptial agreement. It's just good sense, unless you're planning to stick together for the long haul. Even then, you can't really be too careful. People's marriages fall apart all the time. Plus, you know how competitive Brick can be. Imagine her with a lawyer on her side. Parker had a point, Gabe acknowledged. I'll have to talk to my attorney. Good idea, Parker puffed. You do that. What else am I forgetting? Gabe asked. Worried now that he was thinking about things falling apart at the end of the marriage, which was to be expected, Gabe firmly told himself. They were married for only five years. That was all he needed to put up with Brick for. It was certainly long enough. Probably a lot of things. Parker set down the weights and began ticking suggestions on his fingers. Like a bachelor party? A new suit or tux, depending how formal Mom is making this affair. The honeymoon, fertility testing. Fertility testing? Gabe looked at his brother in surprise. We all like to think our swimmers are the best, but we only have a year to prove ourselves, advised Parker. I want to know right out of the gate if there are any issues which might prevent a pregnancy. My missus and I are going to the clinic to get tested. If we need treatments to make a baby happen, then we're getting it done right away. And she's okay with it? wondered Gabe. Parker shrugged. It's part of the deal. We need to have a kid within a certain time frame. Britt said she already had her fertility checked, frowned Gabe. Is that a thing? 
Do women just randomly have their fertility checked when they're thinking of getting married? Maybe once they're past a certain age, offered an uncertain Parker, who really knows what goes through the minds of women. I suppose I should get checked, murmured Gabe, even though he was reluctant to do so. Gabe might run hospitals, but it didn't mean he was fond of going to see a doctor. Do we really need to do the honeymoon? This is just a business deal. First, the brides will expect it. Second, it's a vacation. Why not have a vacation? asked Parker. I don't take vacations, responded Gabe in all seriousness. Which is why you should take one, affirmed Parker. He stood, putting a hand on Gabe's shoulder. Big brother, you are a workaholic. Take at least one week for the honeymoon. Go someplace nice. Don't bring any work with you. What would I do if I didn't bring any work? asked Gabe, thinking the idea over. Explore, relax, enjoy your wife, suggested Parker with a bit of sarcasm. Maybe be less than a robot? You need a better work-life balance, or you're gonna end up being like Nate, pushing a heart attack before you're fifty. Dad worked into his seventies, defended Gabe. He still does to an extent. Dad isn't exactly the best role model, observed Parker dryly. Gabe paused. Parker was more right about their father than he possibly knew. Gabe made a decision. Fine, I'll plan a honeymoon. Where are you going? Oh, no, chuckled Parker. You find your own place. Something Brittany would like. He would do it, Gabe resolved. He would call up Tara and find out where Brittany might want to go. It didn't really matter to him where they went for their honeymoon. He would prefer something which provided decent security and a comfortable living space. Hopefully not a resort. Gabe didn't want to be around other people. He could do this, Gabe reasoned. He would call Tara from the office during his lunch break. Afterward, he would dump the matter into a capable travel agent's hands with a few stipulations and have it all taken care of. I told him we were getting a dog. Brittany sighed as she sipped her coffee. She was sitting in a cozy armchair in Tara's office as her friend tried to design a layout on her desk. A dog? Do you even want a dog? Tara paused, looking up from her paperwork, red pen in hand. Not really, but it was easier to argue about a dog than about buying a house, shrugged Brittany, or me moving into his condo. I don't get it. We agreed it would be the sensible thing to do. I would take the spare bedroom until the wedding, and the realtor could show my condo at any time to potential buyers. It's a win-win situation. He probably feels like everything's happening a bit fast, mentioned Tara. Gabe needs to be guided gently into things. He's skittish. He also likes to think things are his idea. Yes, but it just takes so long for him to come around, complained Brittany. She admired her engagement ring a moment, a fissure of happiness working its way through her body. It was a lovely ring. Then figure out a way to make him think the house is his idea, shrugged Tara. All men can be manipulated. You just need to finesse him a little. Do you manipulate Rex? asked Brittany sweetly. I'm sure he wouldn't appreciate it. On rare occasions, admitted Tara. Mostly he and I compromise, so I don't have to manipulate him. Rex and I understand each other. I have tried quoting scientific studies since Gabe is so logical. I have been compromising on the house and school for our future child. I even held back on putting some of my stuff out because I could see the pained expression on his face every time I clutter up his precious condo, sighed Brittany. I want a house where it's new and fresh for both of us, where there'll be space to put our things. Then perhaps he won't be so territorial. We need to get out of the condo. It's going to be a point of contention if we stay there. Plus, it's too small to raise a child. He agreed to go house hunting, right? Questioned Tara. She put down her pen and leaned back in her chair, conceding she wasn't about to get any work done as long as Brittany was fixated on this subject. Only because if I said he didn't, I would choose for both of us, and then he would have to live in it for the next five years, pointed out Brittany. 
Tara winced. Gabe doesn't take too well to ultimatums. He looked like he was going to be ill, but in the end, he agreed, shrugged Brittany. I guess he just doesn't trust me to pick out a home we'll both like. A house is a big decision. He needs to be part of the process, gently advised Tara. Which is why I had to bully him into it, nodded Brittany. Tara noticed the intercom light on her phone light up. Pressing the button, she answered. Yes, Madeline? Mr. Gabriel Ramsley is on line one, replied Madeline. Thank you, calmly responded Tara. She raised an eyebrow at Brittany before picking up the receiver and putting it to her ear so Brittany could only hear her side of the conversation. Tara Hudson. Brittany made a face at her. Tara made one back as she listened. I'm not certain. I would have to think about it. Abruptly, Brittany set down her coffee, quickly striding toward the desk, her hand reaching out for the speaker button. Tara's hand snaked out and grabbed Brittany's wrist to prevent her from pressing the button. Let me get back to you. Brittany used her other hand to hit the tiny button. Goodbye, Gabe. Tara hung up the phone, leaning back in her swivel chair with a satisfied smile. Why did he call? exploded Brittany. What did he want? I'm not sure I should tell you, a smug Tara answered. It is a private conversation between your best friend and your groom. Tara, I love you, but I will tear every hair from your head and you will be bald in my wedding photos, threatened Brittany. You would not. Tara rolled her eyes. Your mother would have a conniption if you did, and you know you can't abide Naomi when she's having an episode. True, sighed Brittany, deflating. She eyed Tara. Can I bribe you with the best lunch in the city as my treat? A lunch bribe is acceptable, conceded Tara. Mr. Ramsley is curious to know where his bride might want to go for a honeymoon. Brittany sank into the chair across from the desk, feeling slightly dazed. He asked for ideas for the honeymoon? Yes, he did, confirmed Tara. I guess he's a little more involved than I thought. Good for you, Brit. Maybe you can make a go of this marriage. Brittany beamed in delight. Where should I tell him we should go? What about backpacking through Indonesia or Peru? I will take care of this, said Tara confidently. I'm going to find somewhere both of you will enjoy. The last thing you want is a honeymoon where someone is sick, unhappy, or gets hurt. You should start your marriage off happy. I didn't expect a honeymoon, admitted Brittany. I'm so happy. I'll call him back later with a couple of ideas. Tara grabbed her purse. Now, let's go to lunch. The Weekend Fifteen Days until the wedding. The last place we saw was great, protested Gabe as he pulled up to the curb of a quiet neighborhood. The trees were mature on the street, framed in by large traditional houses. A park was in sight with kids playing. You liked the last place because it was all modern. Brittany looked around in delight at the surroundings. It was sharp edges, windows, and glass furniture. Kids need to be raised in places where they can get dirty and occasionally break something by accident. Gabe shuddered. His quiet, risk-free life was being turned upside down. It had all the modern amenities. A pool, gym, proper security. It was a great place. Not to raise a child, declared Brittany as she got out of the car. Are you coming? Gabe admitted defeat and got out of the car. He looked at the two-story house with yellow siding, which their realtor Candy had insisted was exactly what Brittany was looking for. Walking to the driveway, he stood beside Brittany as she gazed in delight at the house, with its large windows and black shutters. Why is the door red? It's a decorative touch. Brittany practically crooned in delight. Can you imagine hanging a Christmas wreath on the door? It will look so pretty. We could light up the small pine tree, and there's room for Santa's sleigh, or maybe one of those inflatable snowmen. Like he was going to have tacky junk on his lawn. Gabe frowned. Why would you want that? Wouldn't it be fun? Kids love those sorts of things. 
Brittany happily grabbed his hand and pulled the reluctant Gabe to the front door. Did you see the park down the street? I want to go to have a quick look after we're done here. We could spend Sunday afternoons there in the summer having picnics and playing with our son. Gabe had the feeling Brittany was romanticizing this whole parenthood thing. Are you certain you don't want to rethink the having a nanny idea? We are not getting a nanny, Brittany calmly repeated. She figured it was progress that he had left his hand in hers as she opened the front door. We are going to raise this child. We already discussed this. Studies show children whose parents are actively involved in their lives are happier. What is your definition of actively involved? wondered Gabe before his question was forgotten by the over-enthused realtor greeting them. You're here, trilled the happy candy. Isn't it just to die for? The perfect family home with four bedrooms, a downstairs office, large open concept kitchen, and modernized bathrooms done in a traditional style. This home is in pristine condition. The roof was just replaced last year. It's hard to believe it's nearly a hundred years old. One of the oldest homes in this neighborhood of this size. They modeled other homes in the area after this one. Roofs need to be replaced? frowned Gabe. He had never really thought about it before. Roofs were just there, keeping the rain out. How often did one replace a roof? What other things would he need to know about being a new homeowner? The condo company took care of maintenance issues. Who would take care of them if there was no condo board to oversee these sorts of things? Just every twenty years or so. Candy gave him an uncertain laugh, wondering if he was kidding or not. Now, you two love birds, take a tour around. I'm sure you'll be more than happy with what you see. Gabe could see Brittany nearly purring with pleasure as she oohed and awed over the moldings, high ceilings, and large rooms. Not nearly as impressed, Gabe followed in her footsteps. A fireplace! Brittany's eyes lit up. Could you imagine a nice wood fire on a cold winter evening? He was not hauling wood and playing with matches. Gabe had zero idea of how to properly do a wood fire, let alone inside a house. Fires are dangerous. Our baby could get burnt, or an ember can fly out and set the rug on fire. Plus, the fireplace itself is always dirty. A baby will crawl in there and then make tracks all over the rug. Brittany's face fell with disappointment. She gave the fireplace one last longing look. I suppose you're right. Gabe suddenly felt like he had kicked a puppy. It was obvious Brittany was falling in love with the house and the silly sentimental ideas which came with it. He had just torn away one of those ideas. Before he could stop himself, Gabe offered a compromise. We could buy one of those things that which cover the hole. A stand? Brittany doubtfully replied. A screen, spoke Candy with confidence as she straightened a vase. It's a fireplace screen. Fine, a screen. Gabe restrained from rolling his eyes. We won't use it unless the baby's put to bed or in one of those foldable pens. A playpen? A laugh escaped Brittany, and her eyes twinkled in merriment. Whatever, gruffly replied Gabe. He tried to ignore the warmth spreading through him as a result of Brittany's amusement. I suppose you'll want a Christmas tree in here. I would like that. Brittany smiled and his heart kicked out an extra beat in response. Gabe scowled. He wandered off into the office as Candy enticed Brittany into the kitchen, the two women talking about counter space and cabinets. Gabe looked around the calm shelves full of books. The big wooden desk and leather chair set just before a pair of French doors which led to the backyard. The room was comfortable. Gabe could see himself working in this room. Not that he wanted to admit it. Opening a French door, he had a peek at the backyard. It was a mess. There was a yellow circle of grass. Hardly any landscaping was there. There was a nice patio area, but nothing much else. Gabe shut the door and went to find Brittany in the kitchen. A quick inventory of counter space told him there wasn't enough area for all the mixing machines and other devices she had accumulated for cooking or baking. Something would have to be done about the need for space, otherwise no one would be able to see the countertop for all her small appliances. 
The worst part was he knew she had ordered more of the equipment on a gift registry for the wedding. Shuddering, Gabe tried not to think of all of Britt's clutter, instead focusing on the backyard. What is wrong with the lawn? What do you mean? questioned Brittany in concern, shutting the oven door to look at him. There's a huge yellow dead patch. Gabe picked up an appetizing apple out of a bowl, only to discover it was plastic. Irritated, he put it back. There are small yellow patches everywhere back there. The owners took down an above-ground pool, explained Candy. There might have been a spill of pool chemicals, which killed a little bit of grass. The yard would have to be fixed, decided Gabe. What sort of people had an above-ground pool and plastic fruit? Does it mean that you like the house? ventured a hopeful Brittany. We haven't seen all of it yet. Gabe withheld his liking for the office. He wasn't going to be sold on a house based on a single room, even if it was the most comfortable room he had seen the entire tour of houses they had been on. Brittany looped her arm through his. Show me the backyard. Gabe tried to ignore how her touch made him feel uncomfortable. He didn't like the way she pressed against his side, or how he became hyper-aware of her. However, out of politeness, he couldn't just push away from her, not in front of the realtor. At least, that was what he told himself. Leading the way into the backyard, Candy tried to make up for the patchy grass. I know it's a little rough, but this could become an amazing oasis for the two of you to relax in. There's room for an in-ground pool and yardage to spare. The trees are mature and strong. Maybe a rope swing from one of them? Or a playset over here? The best part, it's already fenced in, sparing you the expense of fencing it. It is big, murmured Brittany as she gazed at the expanse of yard. It has potential. Exactly, pounced Candy on Brittany's words. Potential is right. Think of it as a clean slate to make your own mark on it and create something specific to your needs. I would love some more flowers. Maybe a flowering tree? Just a small one. A wistful Brittany sighed as she squeezed Gabe's arm. We need a play set for the baby. Something he can grow with for most of his childhood. You do know the baby could be a girl, said Gabe absently. He recalled childhood vacations to his cousin's house, which was on the beach, playing in the sand and waves. The beach was too far from here, but maybe a spot with sand in it? Kids liked sand and sandcastles. At least he had when he was younger, as Gabe remembered. Highly unlikely, Brittany interrupted his revelry. Ramsley men have Ramsley sons over 90% of the time, Michael being the exception with his group of girls. Dylan had a girl, protested Gabe, more out of habit than by wanting a girl or a boy. Whatever they had would be fine with him. Shannon was his oldest before she passed. Still, we're more likely to have a boy, so I'm having the nursery painted blue, a confident Brittany told him. Blue with blue plaid accents. It'll be wonderful for our boy. Congratulations about the baby, inserted Candy. I'm so happy for both of you. We aren't having a baby, Gabe quickly assured her. Not yet. I'm not pregnant, added Brittany. We're planning on starting a family right after the wedding. Candy blinked, then stretched a smile across her lips. Then maybe you'd like to see the bedrooms upstairs. There are four of them, plus there's lots of space in the attic for storage. Shall we? Gabe drawled wondering how long the tours were going to last this evening. He had budget reports which needed his attention. "'Isn't this fun?' whispered Brittany as they followed Candy. Gabe thought about giving her a sarcastic response, but realized he didn't want to. Brittany was enjoying this, he realized. Touring houses and imagining a possible future was making her happy. Most of the time, Gabe hadn't seen Brittany very happy. They had been too busy arguing, avoiding each other, or just driving one another crazy. He kind of liked that he was making her happy. Gabe frowned over the thought. It was unexpected, and he wasn't sure it was welcome. This is the guest room, Candy pointed out. Another bedroom is right there. The nursery is right across the hall from the master bedroom. Go on and explore. I'll be waiting in the living room. Brittany continued to babble 
about how she could make her home office out of the third bedroom and made a beeline for the nursery, dragging Gabe along. The room was a cheery yellow, with odd-looking characters painted on the walls. While Gabe didn't mind the yellow, the cartoonish creatures were creepy. Definitely needs to be repainted, remarked Brittany as she eyed the walls. Oh, look at these tiny clothes. Aren't they just adorable? Brittany held up a small sweater she had found on the top of a dresser. It suddenly hit Gabe. This was real. What they were planning to do was very real and couldn't be undone. Children couldn't be returned to a store. They were living beings who needed parents. He felt a spasm of panic in his chest. He hadn't planned on this future that was being shoved on him. Work hours were long, and having a family meant investing time with them. At least it should. His mother had always lamented how many hours their father had spent working, maintaining, and growing the family business. As a kid, he had only seen his father during scheduled weekly appointments. When he had grown older, James had spent more time with him, grooming him for the position he was about to take over. Gabe worked sixty hours minimum per week. It was what he logged in at the hospitals and at his desk in his work office. He also brought work home, putting in time after hours. It was his duty. Where was he going to get the time to have a wife and kid? Brittany didn't strike him as the type of woman who would just let him keep working as he already was. This was going to change his entire life. He would have to give more work to Parker. Did Brittany expect him to change diapers? He had no idea how to hold a baby, feed one, or what a baby actually needed. Did they need all those clothes, the accessories, the equipment? Was it just a marketing gimmick to make new moms need all this stuff? What if he or she wasn't okay? What would he do with a baby that was sick? What if he dropped the kid? Would it be messed up for life? The question swirled around in his mind, and the room began to feel way too small. Gabe? A concerned Brittany appeared before him. Are you okay? I'm fine, he gruffly said, trying to cover up his unease. You are not fine, murmured Brittany. You look like you did before you went on the slingshot at Seven Roller Coaster Heaven. It was probably a fair enough comparison, reflected Gabe ruefully. He felt like he was about to go on the scariest ride of his life. I just need a moment, managed Gabe before he abruptly exited the room. Don't you want to see the master bedroom? She called out after him. Gabe didn't answer as he headed down the stairs. Exiting out the front door, he walked quickly to his car, taking deep breaths to try to ease the anxiety clawing at him. Taking out his key fob, Gabe unlocked the Tesla and sank into the driver's seat. He closed his eyes, trying to soak in the familiar smell and feel of the car, when a new thought struck him. Where would he charge the Tesla? It was an electric car. The condo had a charging station. Gabe had never even thought about worrying where to charge his car before. The whole situation was turning his life upside down. Yet, what could he do about it? If he didn't try to adapt, then he would lose his position and his inheritance. Gabe dragged in another breath, concentrating on his breathing. Maybe he should take a leaf out of Brittany's book and make a life plan. Gabe constantly planned things out at work in meticulous detail when it came to his working life. He had never bothered planning his personal life because he preferred it exactly how as it was. However, now things were going to have to change. He was getting married. There should be a checklist of things he needed to do to get ready for the wedding, and a checklist for being a father and husband. Obviously, he didn't know enough about the risks involved in child-rearing. It was time to become educated, so he could mitigate as many of the risks as possible. Next time Brittany quoted some study at him, he would be prepared and know the answers, Gabe resolved. Then there was the five-year thing. Gabe didn't like having anything unresolved. He and Brittany needed to figure this out immediately. He was going to get his life in order so the anxiety would stop. The passenger door opened and Brittany settled into the car. I told Candy you weren't feeling well and asked her to reschedule the rest of the viewings. It's too bad you didn't see the master bedroom. It's lovely, 
The closet is huge, and the attached bath has a real traditional feel. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the same rain shower effect that your shower in the condo has, but it's still quite nice. Do you want to buy the house? interrupted Gabe. Well, yes. I like it best of all the places we've looked so far. Brittany frowned in confusion. Why do you ask? We need to decide some things, began Gabe firmly. It's important we get this right, and there isn't much time if we're going to move in directly after the wedding. A house is a major purchase. We should get an inspection, mentioned Brittany. It could take some time. I'm okay with being in the condo for a little while. Absolutely, agreed Gabe with relief. Why hadn't he thought about that? An inspector would know what needed to be done to the house to make it safe. He felt some relief from the burdens on him. We definitely need an inspection. Brittany looked a little disappointed. Gabe, I still do want a house. I'd like to be moved in before the baby is born, preferably for a few months. You want this house, he surmised. Not if you don't want it. She didn't look at him. Instead, she looked down, fiddling with her engagement ring. Gabe made a decision. It was obvious Brittany loved the house. She had lit up when they had viewed it. It had everything she was looking for. While Gabe could see the faults in it and understand where it could use some improvements, Brittany was happy with it. Denying her the house was petty even if the location was going to be an inconvenience to him. One of them should be happy. We need to get an inspection on it, he grumbled. Her eyes lit up with hope as Brittany faced him. She grabbed his forearm in excitement. Are you sure? If it passes an inspection, we'll make an offer, he promised grimly. Brittany beamed in delight and flung her arms around his neck in a tight hug. Before he could move, she surprised him with a quick kiss, then bounced happily in her seat, looking at the house. I love this house. It's going to be a great home for the three of us. No dog. The words popped out before he could stop them. Gabe was reeling from the unexpected contact with Brittany. His next proclamation surprised him even more. Maybe something small, like a hamster or a gerbil. Those can be kept in a cage, can't they? Who will clean the cage out? Brittany questioned with a bit of humor. The kid will, which is why he can't have one until he's old enough to take care of it, declared Gabe. Okay, smiled Brittany in satisfaction. Gabe nodded. He could do this. If he could negotiate her down from the dangerous stuff, maybe this would work. You don't seem happy about the house, she remarked thoughtfully. I like it, he muttered. You don't like it, sighed Brittany. We need to have a home both of us want. I want the house, insisted Gabe. Don't lie to me. Folding her arms, Brittany leveled him with a serious look. I'm not lying, Gabe tried again to convince her. The yard has potential. You hate the yard, responded Brittany. Okay, I hate the yard, agreed Gabe. He paused for a moment, then decided to level with her. It's not what I would choose for myself, but this isn't about me. This is about the both of us. It's about the baby we agreed to have together. It means we both need to compromise. If this house makes you happy and is ideal to raise a family, then we'll buy this house after it's been thoroughly inspected. You didn't like one thing about the house? She asked, a little despondent at his practical answer. Gabe sighed. Brittany wasn't going to be satisfied, unless she thought he liked the house at least a little. Then he thought about the office. I liked the downstairs office. Really? Brittany perked up. What did you like about it? I don't know, he shrugged. It was comforting. I could see having my stuff there and getting some work done. Brittany was more than happy with his answer. Should we call Candy and let her know our decision, or would it be too soon? Call her, said Gabe before he could change his mind, for an inspection only. The last thing we want to buy is a place infested with termites or something worse. When did you get so negative? Half complained Brittany as she rooted through her purse for her phone. When did you get so happy? He retorted. Was he a negative person? Gabe thought of himself as practical. When you decided to marry me, Brittany replied blissfully as she scrolled through her contacts to find Candy. Gabe wasn't sure he wanted the responsibility for making Brittany happy.
Chapter 7 Eight Days Before the Wedding Brittany eyed herself critically in the mirror. It's all the rage, the saleswoman assured her. If it's not the best of your collection, we don't want it, a dismissive Naomi declared as she sipped a fluted glass of champagne from the white sofa. A Crawford cannot be seen in anything but the best. Dear, it makes you look beautiful, sniffed Dottie, holding a crumpled tissue to her eye. Gabe's mom had been nothing but supportive throughout the entire afternoon they had been searching for a wedding dress for Brittany. Brittany was more than glad she had invited her soon-to-be mother-in-law to the bonding experience. The dress is very lovely. Now, in the third shop of the day, Brittany was starting to doubt she would find her dress. It's not the dress, declared Tara as she noted her friend's reaction. I thought dress shopping would be easier, murmured Brittany as she tugged on the silky bodice of the dress. Try on a dress, it fits, and buy it. There are so many choices, and none of them feel right. You'll know it when you see it, assured Dottie. I remember going dress shopping for my wedding. I went to Italy to one of the best designers. We talked patterns and materials. Then a month later I returned and my dress was finished. It was exactly what I wanted. What about a veil? the saleswoman suggested. Sometimes all you need is the final touch to make you see the whole picture. I'm not wearing a veil, decided Brittany. She didn't like these cookie-cutter dresses which were made for models. Tara, could you please help me out of this? Not wearing a veil? sputtered Naomi. You need to wear a veil. It's tradition. Brittany left her mother to expound on the traditions of weddings while she and Tara went to the change room. There's another store just a couple of doors down, noted Tara, as she untied the corset backing. Unless you're getting tired of this. Then we can try another day. I was hoping to get this done today, sighed Brittany with regret. We have the house inspection tomorrow. The bachelor party is this weekend, and I promise to dedicate time to all the little details I have changed about the wedding. Dottie and I are ordering flowers. Do you have any idea how difficult it is to find blue flowers in the right shade at this time of year? Then I have to go over all the new accounts for work. You don't have to look over the new account. I can take care of it, replied Tara firmly. You're getting married in a little over a week. The wedding should be your priority. Slipping off the dress. Brittany breathed a sigh of relief. Why are these dresses so uncomfortable? Maybe we need to select simpler dresses, mentioned Tara, which is hard to do with your mother. Brittany pulled a face. She just wants the best, which means bigger and flashier. It's your wedding, not hers, advised Tara as she set the dress aside on a waiting chair. She is not the one who has to wear it. True, nodded Brittany as she pulled on her clothes. I guess we'll look at the last shop. I'm not holding out much hope, though. We will find your dress, said Tara soothingly, even if we have to hire an Italian designer like Dottie did. I don't have a month, Brittany smiled as she grabbed her purse. I doubt even the best designers could get it done in time, no matter how much money I throw at them. It's just not realistic. I need a ready-made dress, which doesn't require extensive alterations. Are you sure about this? Suddenly asked a serious Tara. It's all happening very quickly. I know you've been in love with Gabe forever, but he's not exactly in love with you. I have five years and a baby to change his mind, replied Brittany. I know you don't like him, but there's no one else who has ever made me feel the way he does. I'm just worried on your five-year anniversary he's going to serve you with divorce papers, a worried Tara said. He has hurt you so much over the years. I just want you to be happy. I will be happy, Brittany assured her. She came forward to give Tara a hug. I know you're concerned about me. Maybe you will have to help pick me up after the five years if I can't convince Gabe to stay in the marriage. But I'm convinced I'm going to be happy for the next five years at least. If nothing else, I'll still have the baby as well. And that is more than worth the experience. I want this, Tara. Tara hugged her friend back. Okay, I'm here to support you. Thank you, whispered Brittany. She gave Tara an extra squeeze. Let's go to the last shop. Maybe fourth time is the charm. The pair headed out to the waiting room to find Dottie and Naomi discussing the merits of gold trim or silver for the place settings. 
Brittany rolled her eyes at Tara and smiled. Either is lovely. There's one more shop we'd like to try tonight, if you're both up for it. Absolutely, confirmed Dottie. I don't understand what the issue is, muttered Naomi as she rose to her feet. Finding her purse, she slung it over her shoulder. Pick the five most expensive dresses out and choose one. I'm not worried about the price of the dress. Quietly, Brittany rebuffed Naomi's thoughts on dress buying. I'm worried about how I feel in it. We will find the perfect dress, assured Tara. The next shop is just a couple of doors down. We can walk to it. Walk? A horrified Naomi asked. Why would we walk when the car is just out front? Mom, it's just a few steps, protested Brittany. It seems a waste to make the car drive all around the block just to drop us off and try to find parking again. I don't know about you, but a walk seems like a good idea to me, inserted Dottie. I need a bit of exercise after sitting down for so long. Perhaps a young woman like you could humor an old lady, Naomi. Mollified, Naomi agreed. Well, I suppose I might be a little stiff as well. As they left the shop, Brittany said a quiet thank you to Dottie, who simply smiled. Passing a couple of stores, Brittany gazed through the glass windows as something caught her eye. There! Pardon? A confused Naomi asked. Brittany was already going inside the store, leaving them all behind. What kind of boutique is this? wondered Naomi, trying to decipher the sign. What does the term a commission shop under this store's title mean? I think it's a second-hand shop, frowned Dottie. Odd that they would have one of those on this street. It's not second-hand, Tara quickly replied. She was certain Naomi Crawford had never been in a store which sold used items in her life. Herding the two older women into the store, Tara looked around several displays trying to find Brittany. Finally spotting her talking to a woman at the back, Tara headed towards her while Dottie admired an old-fashioned tea set. Brit, whispered Tara, I'm not sure your mother's constitution can handle this. Just don't tell her. Brittany quickly instructed before turning back to the saleswoman. Could I try it on, Linda? Absolutely, replied Linda. She led Brittany and Tara to the front window, where she gently pulled a dress off the display mannequin. It is a T-length half-sleeve with lace and tulle, vintage wedding dress from the fifties. The seller's grandmother was a dressmaker, and the bride it was designed for never picked it up. I guess it got put away and the seller found it. She decided it should go to someone who would appreciate it. The seller? frowned Naomi in uncertainty. Don't you mean the designer? This isn't designer, explained Linda. The dress has been handcrafted here in the city. Fortunately, it was stored correctly so the lace and silk didn't yellow with age. Brittany fingered the dress in delight. It is beautiful. This dress is not what we are looking for, sniffed Naomi. Classic, with long lines and a fitted bodice. A designer creation is what we're looking for. There's a change room in the back. Try it on, urged Linda. Brittany nodded, carefully taking the dress, clutching it to her as she made her way to the back of the store. Tara followed her. It is not appropriate, a disapproving Naomi stated. The dress is pretty and unique, mentioned Dottie, like Brittany is. A bride should be called beautiful on her wedding day, not pretty, admonished Naomi. What kind of store is this, anyway? It's filled with all sorts of odds and ends. That's because it's a commission shop, clarified Linda. Everything you see here is previously owned by another person. They and the shop split a commission every time a sale happens. Naomi gasped in horror. You mean the items here are used? Most things in life end up used, dryly stated Linda. Where do you think fully usable items go? I'm sure. I have no idea, huffed Naomi. Brittany! Brittany Helena Crawford! I will not have you wear a used item of clothing! The dress was never worn, pointed out Linda. Naomi, listen to the lady, scolded Dottie. The dress is a lovely vintage piece. Naomi was beyond listening. She screeched, Brittany! Mom! A horrified Brittany approached from the back of the store, tailed by Tara. What is going on? Do you know what this place is? Hissed Naomi. 
You need to get out of that dress right now. It could have bed bugs or fleas. I assure you, it does not. An unimpressed Linda told them. Oh, you are a vision, marveled Dotty. I think it suits you perfectly. There aren't any mirrors in the change room, mentioned Tara. How is she going to see herself? There's a full-size mirror right over here, pointed out Linda. I keep it here because I always like to see how the clothes look on customers. Brittany, this is not a designer gown, whispered Naomi. This isn't what you wanted. Let the girl decide for herself what she would like, spoke Dottie. She's the one getting married. Brittany paused as she caught sight of herself in the mirror. Her expression softened as she took in the length and delicate lace. One moment. I think I have the crowning touches, mentioned Linda. She plucked a flowered headband off a shelf and a pair of silver satin spool heels with blue bows, bringing them over to Brittany. I hope the shoes fit. Quickly, Brittany put on the shoes. Linda gently placed the headband in her hair. It has blue and white flowers. Slowly, Brittany started to smile, looking at the completed picture in the mirror. She moved from side to side, admiring herself. Just the right shade. Tara gave Linda a thumbs up. You look so darling, cooed Dottie. Gabe will be just amazed. Brittany, you can't be considering this whined a concerned Naomi. This is my dress, breathed Brittany in delight. I'm getting married in this dress. I don't even want to take it off. Naomi gave a moan of disappointment. Dottie gave Naomi a pat on the arm as she beamed at Brittany. This is just wonderful. I'm going to love her as a daughter-in-law. I'm looking forward to having three new women in the family. After paying for the dress and accessories, Brittany had each of the ladies dropped off at their homes before the driver took her to Gabe's condo. Careful not to wrinkle the dress, she happily took the items to her new home. The facial recognition software automatically unlocked the door for her, which Brittany had to admit was handy, since she didn't have to fumble through her purse for any keys. Humming, she opened the door to find Gabe working at his laptop. Brittany gave a little twirl with the dress bag, grinning at him. I found it. Perplexed, Gabe looked at the bag she held. It looks a little short. The dress is T-length, she explained happily. I have no idea what that means, he admitted, setting aside his laptop. Did Mom like it? She loves it, beamed Brittany. T-length means it goes just past my knees. Are you going to show it to me? he wondered. No, replied a pert Brittany as she put down her purse and bag of accessories. Surely you don't believe it's bad luck for me to see the dress before the wedding. Gabe scoffed. I want it to be a surprise, chirped Brittany over her shoulder as she put the dress in her bedroom. Coming back out, she grew more serious. There is something we need to do, and I'm not certain if you will agree. Gabe sighed as he got up from the sofa. Is it on the list? I already told you I truly do not care what cake flavor we have. The cake is all up to you. This is not about the cake. This is a little more important to me, admitted Brittany. They had both sat down together and started a list of what needed to be done before the wedding, delegating duties to each other. Brittany had loved how he had participated willingly in the project. She felt like they were finally on the same team working together towards the same goals. Then what is it? frowned Gabe. He could see how nervous Brittany was getting and didn't like it. Whatever she had up her sleeve, she was worried about his reaction. Taking a deep breath, Brittany plunged in. I think we should kiss. Whatever Gabe had been expecting, it wasn't this. Excuse me? First, it would look odd if our first kiss is at the wedding. I mean... We could tilt our head in the wrong way, bump noses, make it terribly awkward. And we don't want to be embarrassed in front of all of our guests, rushed Brittany, trying to convince him. It would come more naturally if we practiced. Second, we're going to have to get used to kissing. There's a honeymoon coming very soon. Third, oh dear, I've forgotten what came third. Brittany's brows pinched together as she tried to think of more practical reasons to get Gabe to kiss her. Gabe mulled over what she had said. His stomach clenched at the thought of kissing Brittany, 
but she did have a point. He did not want either of them to be embarrassed at the wedding ceremony over a simple kiss. Kissing Brittany was bound to be awkward for the first few times. Gabe, ventured a cautious Brittany, interrupting his thoughts. What do you think? I suppose I agree, he admitted. Oh, said Brittany, a little relieved. I thought I would have to try harder to convince you. What you said makes sense, shrugged Gabe. I was thinking perhaps a good night kiss each night, suggested Brittany, hopefully. Gabe swallowed and nodded. There really was no point in putting it off. It was time for what had become their nightly routine. Britt would have the bathroom first, then he would. Then usually they said good night and settled in their own rooms. You don't have to look so grim about it, muttered Brittany as she went to her room. Feeling flustered, Gabe began packing up his laptop, concentrating on the task. Brittany marched out of her room, pajamas in hand as she stalked to the bathroom shutting the door with a little more force than necessary. Gabe shut his mouth. Whatever he might have been about to say left unsaid. Annoyed, he went to his room, yanking off his tie and jacket. Britt was a prickly thing. One moment she was all smiles. The next she was irritating and frustrating to be around. He had agreed with her, hadn't he? Why on earth was she so upset? He just didn't understand her. Undoing the buttons on his cuffs, he came out into the hallway as she was about to deposit her clothes into her bedroom. Gabe ignored the sight of her in the pajama tank top and shorts. It wasn't sexy at all, in his opinion. Why are you mad at me? I agreed with you. She huffed, stalking back towards the bathroom. You had an expression like I asked you to kiss a fish. What? Gabe didn't even know how to respond to what she had said. He trailed her into the washroom. You look like you would rather kiss a fish than kiss me, the woman you're about to marry, explained Brittany as she brushed her hair. It's really confidence-inspiring. If that's the way you look at me right now, like I'm some cockroach you need to deal with, then how is it going to look for all the guests at the wedding? I would like them to think you at least like me as a person, rather than despising me. I don't despise you, defended Gabe. He had no idea how they had gone down this rabbit hole of reasoning. Brittany set the brush down, turning to look at him. You have always disliked me, Gabe. Everyone knows it. I ran into Shelby Greshel today while dress shopping. She was astonished that we were getting married. The first words out of her mouth were, Wow, stalking has really worked for you. You must have worn him down, Britt. I honestly thought it would never happen, especially after prom, but... Miracle of miracles, you must be so happy. I'll send Gabe my condolences. She did not say that. A stunned Gabe managed to reply. She did, affirmed Brittany, hurt in her eyes. She and all the other people of our acquaintance are thinking the same thing, even if they're being nice to our faces. Brittany Crawford, whose family has always been barely respectable thanks to my father's subservience to David Ramsley, has snagged herself Gabriel Ramsley by simply wearing him down after years of making a fool of herself. Who cares what Shelby Greshel or the rest of them think? asked Gabe, trying to digest what Brittany said. I don't, shrugged Brittany. Then she sighed. I do care. I've always cared. They don't accept me and they never will. You think I would be used to being not good enough for them or for you by now, but it still hurts. Who said you weren't good enough for me? frowned Gabe. You did. Multiple times. You, your brothers, and your cousins. Every time I tried to be friends with you when we were young, or when I had my misguided attempts to get your attention later, I was put down and laughed at by the Ramsleys, confessed Brittany. People follow your influence, Gabe. You and the Ramsleys are popular and leaders in society. When you scoffed at me, all the others did too. Bread. Once again, Gabe didn't quite know what to say. He hadn't realized how his actions had affected her. He felt remorse about how he had handled things. I know you're only doing this for your dad's ultimatum. If there had been someone else available, I'm sure you would have picked them. You don't even want to kiss me. And it's time I accept I'm not the one for you. Tara's right. 
I want more from you than you're willing to give, whispered Brittany, looking down at the ring on her hand. She slipped it off, setting it on the countertop. I'm sure your secretary, Jessica, would love to marry you. Stunned, Gabe watched as Brittany walked out of the washroom. Grabbing the ring, he followed her, his longer stride catching up as she opened the door to her bedroom. Go away, Gabe. She sniffed, blindly tossing pillows off the bed onto a chair. He didn't think about it. He didn't try to say anything to change her mind. Instead, Gabe took her by the arm, turning her to face him. With both hands, he cupped her face, lifting it up towards him as he lowered his own, kissing her. It didn't take more than a moment before Brittany softened against him, leaning forward and fisting her hands into the front of his shirt as he took the kiss deeper. So this was what it was like, kissing Brittany Crawford, a foggy part of his brain mused. Champagne, strawberries, and something much more. Something deeper drew him in and left him wanting. He wanted to protect her from anyone who might think she was lesser than them. He wanted to be her champion, her hero. That thought scared him more than anything. Breaking it off, Gabe drew in a roughened breath. Brittany's hand trembled as he put the ring back on. Or maybe it was his hand which was trembling. Gabe tried not to think about it, tried not to look at her parted lips or two bright eyes. Keep the ring on. Gabe's voice was rough as he said the words, rougher than he intended. Abruptly, he walked out of the room, retreating to his own. Unbuttoning his now too tight collar, Gabe leaned against the door, his heart pounding. He could admit to himself he was afraid. Afraid of Brit and all the things she represented. She wanted trust and honesty. She wanted all of him. Everyone had secrets, even those they didn't want to keep. Everyone lied to each other, and relationships weren't built on trust. They were built on keeping the illusion of happiness to everyone around the couple. A simple agreement of keeping up a facade, so no one really knew what was happening behind closed doors. Gabe's stomach turned a little sour. He didn't want an illusion. For a moment, he thought about what it might have been like if his trust in relationships hadn't been shattered long ago. Maybe he would have given Britt a chance at some point, probably during high school, or maybe afterward when he had seen her at a random party at college. He might have given her the benefit of the doubt. Perhaps he would have viewed her feelings with less cynicism and have gone dancing with her at the sock dance in grade nine when she had asked him. Maybe he would have been capable of returning emotions with equal enthusiasm. As it was, all he could feel was this overwhelming doubt he could make this work. Britt wanted a happily ever after. Those were just mirages. She was bound to be hurt once the illusions were broken. How could Gabe be her happily ever after when he was keeping the secret from her that his own father had been the one to start the investigation that had put Erwin Crawford into jail? Chapter 8 Seven Days Before the Wedding Hi, Mario waved Brittany as she passed the coffee and snack cart. Miss Crawford? He jauntily waved in return as he helped a customer. Brittany resolved to see him on her way back to get a little something for herself. She had a busy afternoon ahead. Dropping off Gabe's lunches was taking nearly an hour out of her own day, but Brittany didn't begrudge him one bit, not after they had started kissing each night before retiring. Gabe was an excellent kisser the reality far exceeding her dreams. She loved him even more now than what she used to. Brittany was counting down the days until he was hers. Smiling at the ever-annoyed Jessica, Brittany let herself into Gabe's office. Pulling the lunch she had prepared out of a thermal-lined bag, Brittany began to lay it out on the desk. He is in a meeting, a haughty Jessica informed her from the door. It's not expected to finish for at least another hour or so. I can wait. Brittany gave the breezy response, refusing to be baited by the secretary. She would just work from her phone until Gabe returned. Jessica shrugged. As she left, the office door stayed open. Rolling her eyes, Brittany went to close it, but stopped as she overheard Jessica call out to Parker. 
Parker, trilled Jessica. Is it true the FBI is here? Could you say it any louder? hissed Parker as he came to stand beside Jessica's desk. He hadn't seen the FBI agent around, but was willing to take Jessica's word for it. It is something we would like to keep quiet. I'm so sorry. A not sorry Jessica pouted. I was simply curious. Gabe is talking to some man named Kepler right now. Agent Kepler? I wonder what he wants, frowned Parker. Maybe Gabe will bribe him, just like his father did, shrugged Jessica. Dad didn't bribe anyone, growled Parker. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, your dad didn't. Oscar is too stupid to even think of bribing his way out of a situation. James isn't your father, Parker. Oops. Jessica put a delicate hand to her mouth. That's a secret. Just like it was a secret, Gabe is only marrying pitiful Brittany as revenge. His dad came up with the ultimatum, and what could be more fitting than to marry the girl whose father thought up how to make the drug smuggling scheme more straightforward and profitable? Erwin really was indispensable to David. Otherwise, the Crawfords would never be even respectable enough to enter your level of society. Gabe is marrying scum because he knows it makes his father angry. It's not true. A stunned Parker looked at Jessica. Really? Then he has told his intended his own father is the reason everyone is in jail? Challenged Jessica. James tattled to the FBI, and that's why Irwin and all the rest are in jail or being investigated. You will notice none of James' accounts, his son's accounts, or Ramsley Hospital and Metal Corporation's accounts are frozen. Yet wait! Jessica clicked a perfectly manicured fingernail against her lower lip. Maybe yours will be, Parker. After all, you are the by-blow of Oscar. Perhaps it is the subject of Kepler's meeting with Gabe. You and your parentage. Gabe is trying to save face and make sure the truth doesn't come out, but we all know that secrets always come to light at the most inconvenient times. This is not true. Brittany came out of the office, glaring at Jessica. You're just a jealous cow spewing lies. Parker knows it's the truth, shrugged Jessica. James has hated the sight of him for years. Why? Because he reminds him of his wife's infidelity. Although, who could blame Dottie for having a little too much to drink and sleeping with her handsome brother-in-law when James had been carrying on with his secretary for years? While James and Dottie have forgiven each other and moved on, James can't seem to forgive Parker. You are fired, stated Parker in a voice which was too calm. I don't think so, mused Jessica. I know far too much about this family. You will have to pay me off. It's not true. Brittany looked to Parker for confirmation. He's not marrying me for revenge. Partly revenge, partly to keep the scandal within the family, a smug Jessica told her. Gabe isn't like that, frowned Parker. My brother and I talk about everything. I know him. Jessica looked at him with pity. The same brother who lied to you about your father? Who lied to Brittany about James starting this whole mess, which got her father put into prison? Brittany stepped forward, grabbing Parker by the arm. Did James really get my dad put in prison? Parker's guilty expression told her the truth. Gasping, Brittany let go of him. Brittany, we didn't know until a few weeks ago, explained Parker. No one else knows. Gabe knew before he became engaged to me, breathed Brittany. She wondered if Jessica's other words were true. Was Gabe only marrying her for revenge against his father? Was it any worse than him marrying her just to get his inheritance? Gabe had kept this secret from her. His father had ruined her father. Mechanically, Brittany grabbed her purse from the office. Brittany, Parker followed her in. Don't listen to that spiteful heartbeat. You and Gabe are good for each other. Give him a chance to explain. I need time to think, murmured Brittany. She looked through her bag for her keys. Finding them, she gazed at Parker, questioning. Aren't you mad at Gabe? He lied to you, too. He didn't lie. He just never told me, replied Parker. Splitting hairs. A lie of omission is still a lie, Brittany answered. Parker sighed. I had already suspected. Oscar said something once, and with Dad's constant attitude toward me, 
I put the facts together for myself. I just didn't want to confront it because then Dad might kick me out of the family business. I love what I do, Brittany. This is my calling. If Gabe had told me, I might have had to do something about it. In his own way, he was protecting me. Was he protecting me or just using me? whispered Brittany. You were using each other, remarked Parker. You were using him to fulfill a silly fantasy, and he was using you to get his inheritance. Neither of you should be judging the other. Brittany slowly nodded. While the words Parker spoke hurt, they were true. Gabe and Britt had been using each other. It wasn't love. It was greed. Both of them had been taking and not giving. They were horrible people. She was a horrible person, Brittany decided. She slipped the strap of her purse over her shoulder, heading for the door. Brittany, what are you going to do? asked a concerned Parker. I don't know, she replied as she left the office. She could hardly remember the drive back to her own office. Thankfully, it was a Friday afternoon, and all she needed to do was get through the next few hours, then she could have the entire weekend to think. Did she really need to? Brittany's mind was relentlessly going over what she had learned from Jessica and Parker's inadvertent truth. They were just using each other. Deep down, Brittany knew Gabe wasn't enthused about marrying her. He wouldn't be doing it at all except for the ultimatum his father had made. However, there had been a spark of hope, a belief that since he had chosen her, they might be able to make something of this marriage and eventually be happy together. She had hope in the weeks that they had been together, where she had forced him to spend time with her. He might start coming around to the idea they could make this marriage a success if only they tried hard enough. He hadn't changed at all. Then again, neither had she. Brittany had been using him to fulfill a selfish dream, which was never going to come true. Deep down, Brittany had known this was the case. She had just hoped so hard, and for so long it was otherwise. It was her, not him, who was deluded into thinking otherwise. The realization she was nothing to him, just a tool to be used by him, was a bitter pill to swallow. However, she was no better. She was using him for a baby, for respectability, for acceptance into a society that had never accepted her. Any hope for a real marriage, a real relationship, was extinguished. For once, her heart didn't protest, and her mind didn't try to find a plausible excuse to explain away either of their actions. Brittany felt an emptiness, knowing Gabe would never love her. Had she really loved him, or had her mind just fixated on what he represented to her? When had he become the be-all and end-all of her dreams? Why couldn't she find respectability, a family, and love without him? Why did she need Gabe to rescue her? She was just as bad as the helpless princess from her childhood, whining and waiting for the handsome prince to make everything right. It wasn't fair to put Gabe in that position. He didn't want it. Why couldn't she be enough just as she was? Brittany wondered. Was she in love with Gabe, or just the dream he represented? Either way, it was past time to let him go. Brittany picked up the phone on her desk, dialing her investment advisor, Rex Hudson. Not even waiting for his usual greeting, Brittany got straight to the point. I want to purchase one quarter of Ramsley Hospital Medical Corporation. I want to buy it at twice the going market rate on the condition Gabriel Ramsley will continue to maintain his current position of employment within the company. I know the board will have to approve the sale, hopefully without James Ramsley's input. I would also like you to make the board aware that I will be transferring the shares directly into Gabriel's name after the sale. I believe they will be more receptive to the idea if that is part of the sale. It needs to be done today. There was silence for a moment as Hudson absorbed all Brittany had said. Are you sure about this, Brittany? While Ramsley Pharmaceuticals and insurance stocks have taken a dip, the hotel and hospital stocks are still in good shape. Offering twice the market value is unheard of. It would be nearly equal your net worth. To put your entire fortune into your future husband's name isn't very secure for you. We're not getting married, Brittany told him without much feeling. There was an empty void where feelings should be. 
She wondered if the emotions would come back, and if they did, would they hurt more than normal? Then you'll be nearly bankrupting yourself, warned Hudson. I know. Brittany was impassive. It's my decision, Rex. Ignoring his protests, Brittany hung up the phone. Sitting perfectly still, she wondered if she could go back to the day when she had met Gabe Ramsley and undo what had happened. Instead of letting him rescue her, she should have rescued herself. If she could, Brittany would have saved herself a lifetime of heartache. Brittany, the meeting's about to start. Tara poked her head in the office. Meeting? she echoed. Brittany couldn't remember any meeting scheduled for today. Then again, she could barely remember what else she was supposed to do today. Her brain was still focused on how she was going to get through life without Gabe, how she was going to endure. You know, the meeting, Tara motioned impatiently. Let's go. We're late, and I still have to pick up the paperwork. Our client isn't going to be overly impressed with us. Automatically, Brittany got up from her chair, following Tara. Please tell me you're going to take the lead on this one. I'm not feeling up to it. Tara waved a hand dismissively. I've got it. I totally understand you're focused on the wedding and Gabe. Brittany had a short, unamused laugh, causing Tara to give her a confused look. Sobering, Brittany noticed they weren't headed for the conference rooms. Where are we going? Surprise! Employees happily exclaimed. The cafeteria was ensconced with streamers, balloons, and a banner which read, Congratulations, Brittany. A large cake and gift bag sat on a nearby table. Welcome to your wedding shower, Tara told her happily. We all chipped in for something and signed the card. With a choking breath, Brittany burst into tears, and the applause died down as everyone stared at her in shock. Those are not happy tears, observed Tara with concern. She wrapped an arm around Brittany. Everyone eat cake while Britt and I have a talk. Leading Brittany out of the room, Tara brought her to an office. Have a seat and tell me what's going on. I'm not getting married. Brittany took the box of tissues Tara offered, pulling one out and wiping her eyes as the tears poured. I'm not going to marry Gabe. Honey, you love Gabe. He's finally popped the question and you were over the moon, frowned Tara. What happened? We are both such hypocrites. Brittany found herself spilling everything. She told Tara about James' betrayal to Irwin and the unwitting revelation from Parker. He will never love me. We're both just using each other. Our marriage would be a sham, miserable for both of us. I don't want that for him. He is miserable? Tara ground her teeth. He has a habit of making you miserable. Well, I'm done. Brittany blew her nose and grabbed a clean tissue. I'm not going to marry him. Tara eyed her. There's more to this. I'm going to give him his inheritance, stated Brittany quietly. I'm going to buy Ramsley's stock and gift it over to Gabe. Then he can marry whoever he wants rather than being stuck with me. He doesn't deserve it, Britt, Tara said stoutly. Maybe not, Brittany shrugged morosely. I can't make him love me, and I have to stop trying to find validation in him. The only thing I can do is free him to fall in love with whoever he wants. Then maybe he'll be happy. Tara shook her head in disbelief at Brittany's generosity. With a sigh, she hugged her friend, rubbing Brittany's back. I will cancel the bachelorette party tonight. Thank you, whispered Brittany. I'll have to return all the stuff I bought for the wedding. Plus the gifts, which have already arrived, should be sent back. I'll help you, Tara told her. She hesitated before asking, What about a baby? Brittany's voice was thick as the fresh tears came. I'm going to schedule the surgery. There's no point in waiting. I'm so sorry, Britt, murmured Tara. Me too. Brittany sniffled as she leaned against her friend. Monday Five days before the wedding. Gabe groaned as the chime from the doorbell continuously rung. Glancing at his watch, he realized it was five in the morning. His own alarm was set to go off in an hour. Grumbling, he stumbled out of bed, heading for the door. Brittany's door was still ajar. Gabe was surprised to see she hadn't come home. 
Yesterday, he had surmised she was probably sleeping off the after-effects of her bachelorette party at her friend Tara's house. He felt a small measure of unease. Friday had not gone well. Jessica had disappeared some time after lunch, and Parker had been in a foul mood before avoiding Gabe altogether. Thankfully, Brittany had left him lunch. Gabe had been ravenous after being grilled by board members who were worried about the news that accounts had been frozen for other Ramsley businesses. Gabe had spent until the late evening soothing their fears. He had bolted down Brittany's cold lunch and made his way home to fall into bed. The next day he had spent doing the same thing, quelling the fears of nervous investors so they wouldn't think of selling their shares. He had been in front of the press answering and dodging a lot of questions. Sunday had been a day to catch up on his regular work, and he had been surprised Brittany wasn't home yet. Once, he even thought of calling her just to see if she was okay, but had decided against it. I'm coming, he yelled at the constant harping of the doorbell. Annoyed, Gabe flipped the locks and jerked the door open, only to be surprised to see a couple of moving guys and a cleaning lady. A man in a suit stood nearby. Gabe frowned as he took in the sight of them. "'We're here to clean out Miss Crawford's items,' the cleaning lady said briskly. She held up a paper. "'I have a list of her belongings.' "'Excuse me?' questioned Gabe, entirely confused. "'I don't understand.' "'My name is Rex Hudson,' the man in the suit introduced himself. "'If you could let us in, I'll explain everything.' "'Why don't you just explain it now?' Gabe stepped further into the hallway crossing his arms across his chest and blocking the doorway. Hudson gave him a look of dislike before proffering a large envelope. Yesterday I was instructed to purchase one quarter of Ramsley Hospital and Medical Corporation. I was successful in the acquisition. Those shares have been transferred into your name as a condition of sale. Gabe slowly took the envelope with surprise. You're saying someone bought out my share of the business and is giving it to me? Yes. I'm Miss Brittany Crawford's investment advisor. We met with the majority of the board yesterday and convinced them to circumvent James Ramsley's stipulations on your inheritance. There was an emergency meeting with just enough members to pass the motion. Brittany also preserved your position within the company. Tersely, Hudson informed Gabe. In this envelope are your shares of Ramsley HMC. Gabe slowly opened the envelope, sorting through the papers. He barely noticed the movers and cleaning lady had slipped past him during the distraction. I don't understand. Why would she do this? If you don't know the answer, then you're a bigger fool than I thought, glowered Hudson. You don't know me? Gabe snapped his gaze back up from the paperwork in his hands to glare at the man before him. I would appreciate it if you didn't malign my character. Undeterred, Hudson took a step forward pointing a finger at Gabe in anger. I know more about you than I ever wanted to. You are an unfeeling, self-absorbed prig who doesn't deserve Brittany. Gabe narrowed his eyes as he contemplated the man before him. Didn't she date you in college? Is that what this is all about? You're jealous just because you don't measure up to me in her mind? Are you serious? Hudson had a short laugh before waving his left hand in Gabe's face. I'm married to her best friend, Tara. Britt's our friend. Maybe you would know that if you had bothered to be involved in her life rather than just expecting her to exist in adoration in yours. I don't expect, sputtered Gabe. Really? interrupted Hudson. What's her favorite color? What movies does she like to watch? How many kids does she want? Is she a dog or a cat person? How is any of this relevant? Gabe noticed a defensive tone creeping into his voice. He didn't like the way he felt defensive, which meant he disliked Hudson even more for making him feel inadequate. She knows all those answers about you, which proves you aren't worthy of her. Hudson responded in contempt. He grabbed a letter out of his suit pocket and slapped it against Gabe's chest. Read this. If you ever want to call yourself a decent human being, you either make it right or stay out of her life entirely so she can heal and move on. Gabe grabbed the paper as Hudson stalked off down the hallway. The moving guy slipped past him to follow Hudson with a bunch of boxes on a trolley. The cleaning lady wasn't far behind, as she gave him a curious look before following her cohorts. She had left him. 
Gabe couldn't believe it. Six days before the wedding, and Britt had left him. He retreated into the apartment, noting the mixing stand they had argued about taking up too much space in the small kitchen was gone. He wandered into the spare bedroom, which he had begun to think of as hers, finding it essentially bare. The bed and all the furniture was gone. The closet was empty. It was like she had never been in the apartment. Going back into the living area, Gabe tossed the majority of the paperwork he had been given onto the coffee table. Opening the last envelope Hudson had shoved at him, he quickly scanned the financial document before sucking in a surprised breath as his brain registered what all the numbers meant. Brittany had nearly bankrupted herself to give him his shares of Ramsley HMC. She had taken a loan from Rex and Tara Hudson, equivalent to the current value of the shares in her and Tara's company, combined with her savings plus investments to make the purchase. With her condo, she was barely in a positive equity position. Gabe sat down heavily on the sofa, rereading the paper to make certain he understood it correctly. It didn't look much different on the second reading. Wiping a hand over his face, Gabe could understand Hudson's frustration. Why had Brittany chosen to wipe herself out financially for him? If they had been married for the five years as they had intended, he would have received the shares at no cost to her. Why had she suddenly chosen to back out of the wedding? Pulling out his phone, Gabe decided to call her. An automated message informed him her number was no longer in service. Irritated, Gabe quickly rushed through his morning routine, deciding to confront her at her condo. He wanted to know why she had changed her mind without so much as a word to him. The drive over was quick and uneventful, as he managed to beat the morning rush. Gabe pounded on her door and received no answer. At the noise, one of Brittany's neighbors opened their door and primly informed him Brittany wasn't home. When was the last time you saw her? Gabe reined in his temper to talk to the frail elderly woman. A few weeks ago. She said she was getting married. Owlish eyes blinked up at him. The condo is for sale. Someone viewed it yesterday. They have children and a yappy dog. I hope they don't get it. Gabe turned back to the condo door in frustration. He could only think perhaps Brittany was either with friends or family. Mrs. Crawford wasn't exactly his greatest fan, and he doubted she would give him any information as to her daughter's whereabouts. This meant Tara was his best chance of contacting Brittany. Tara, who was married to Rex Hudson, both of whom were not impressed with Gabe at the moment. He could go to her workplace, but wasn't certain of the reception he would get. It probably wouldn't be a good one, considering the confrontation with Hudson this morning. The man had the audacity to say Gabe wasn't good enough for Brittany. No one had ever expressed such an opinion to him before. To say he wasn't good enough for something, for someone, was a shock to Gabe's system. He was the guy who got picked first for sports, for debate, for projects. He was the guy who had it all. With an oath, Gabe pulled out his phone, dialing a number. He needed to talk to someone who was happily married, someone who would give good advice. Gabe immediately interrupted the person who answered. Just how important is it to know stuff about the person you're in relationship with? Things like their favorite color, how many kids they want, if they're a dog or cat person. Pretty important, answered Max sleepily. It's also pretty standard in a relationship to want to get to know the likes and dislikes of the person you're with. That way you can find out what you have in common. Plus, you can surprise them with things they like every once in a while. Why? Gabe frowned at the ugly picture on the hallway wall. He didn't like surprises. Surprises were often difficult situations. What would be the point? Because it's nice to give to the person you love. It makes you feel good to make her happy. Max's voice grew concerned. Trouble in paradise? Gabe rolled his eyes at the antiquated phrase. There was no paradise in his world. Brit's gone. Good for her replied Max. Excuse me? Gabe snapped back, annoyed at Max's response. No offense, Gabe, but you're not exactly relationship material. 
You're a bit too self-orientated to do well with putting another person first, which is what you need to do in a successful relationship. Max warmed to the subject. For instance, I love my job. It's the best job I have ever had, despite the paperwork pain and dealing with the city council on occasion. I get to blow things up, which is every guy's fantasy. Now, if Paget were to tell me we are not making enough money and the boys need to go to Harvard or some other expensive college, I would quit my job and work some other job I hate to make her happy. Because I know she loves her broadcasting job and I'm not going to make her give it up. I would make myself miserable at work if that's what it would take to make her happy. Fortunately, Paget loves me and would never ask me to give up what I love to do for work. You just called me selfish. Gabe glared at the picture since he couldn't glare at Max. Is that all what you got out of what I just said? Questioned Max. Being in a relationship means loving the other person, putting their feelings, wants, and needs first. If it's an equal relationship, your girl will do the same for you. If you can't do that, you don't deserve to be in a relationship. So you don't think I can put Brit first, challenged Gabe. Honestly? Max's tone was doubtful. The way you treat her is like an afterthought. You don't want to be with her, but you don't want anyone else to have her either. It's a rough place to put her. It's borderline abuse. What is that supposed to mean? Gabe didn't like what Max was saying at all. You could have let her go a long time ago, Max told him. Instead, any time she happened to date someone, you showed up to give her just enough attention so she dumped the other guy. Then, when she was focused on hoping you would finally ask her out, you left her in the cold. It's cruel. I didn't, protested Gabe. Tom Milford? Max put out a name. It wasn't any good for her, Gabe ground out. He was seeing another girl on the side. Charles Thames, responded Max. Who dates a guy named Chuck, said Gabe dismissively. Elton Whiteman. Max kept speaking before Gabe could interrupt. They had a lot in common. He was very sweet on her. He made laminated life plans. Gabe spoke in derision. What sort of nerd does that? He penciled Brit in for marriage seven years down the road like it was a dentist appointment. Brit makes life plans, a quiet Max told him. And if you would let her go, she and Elton might have been happy with their two planned kids by now. I didn't interfere, Gabe floundered a little. I just... You did interfere, reiterated Max. You have interfered every single time. I didn't, Gabe protested uncertainly with a frown. Did I? Yep, Max confirmed it. Even when you and Brittany were avoiding each other, you still knew exactly who she was and wasn't dating. Honestly, I think you've been just as obsessed with her as she is with you. You just didn't want to admit you might have feelings for her. Now Max was out of line and going too far. Gabe leaned against the wall. I am not obsessed with Brittany Crawford. Then why couldn't you let Marshall propose to her? wondered Max. How do you know about Marshall proposing? questioned Gabe. He looked down to see a piece of paper sticking out from under her door. It bore the logo of Mercy Hospital on the corner of it. Frowning, Gabe crouched down to coax it out between the plush carpet and the door without tearing it. Parker told me, Max informed him. Look, either let her go and let her be happy with some other guy, or man up and admit you're in love with her. If you go after her, you're going to have to prove for the first time in your life you're willing to put her first. I am not in love with her, protested Gabe to empty air as he realized Max had hung up on him. Annoyed, he put his phone away and straightened to tear open the envelope that unfold the letter he had found beneath Brittany's door. Backdated by two weeks, it was a formal protest from Brittany's doctor about her decision to have a child, citing the risks of not going ahead with a hysterectomy immediately. Her doctor warned the cancer, while currently contained, may spread and cause further surgical and medical procedures necessary, possibly even threatening her life. While her ability to carry a healthy baby to term was not in question, the likelihood of immediate conception was doubtful, and further delay of the surgery to remove the cancer was inadvisable. Brittany had cancer. 
her doctor wanted to remove it. She had known before she accepted his proposal. Paling, Gabe put the letter in his pocket. His dad had cancer and was dying. It was a scary disease. Gabe didn't like the thought that Brittany had it. It brought an unwelcome sense of fear he wasn't quite ready to deal with. Worry gnawed at him. Britt could die. He didn't even want to explore the thought. Gabe had been so worried about the risks of losing his job, he had never once thought he would lose her. What would become of him if she died and left him with a baby? He couldn't do it alone. Gabe had no idea how to be the sort of father Britt expected he would be with their kid. The realization came swift and hard. Gabe didn't want to lose her. Ever. He didn't want to imagine a life without Brittany irritating him about something. Less than a month ago, Gabe would have scoffed at the idea, but somehow his fiancée had woven her way into his life. Taking somebody's mail is a federal offense, the old lady informed him as she waited in her doorway, openly eavesdropping. Ignoring the old busybody, Gabe strode past her for the elevators. He needed to see Brittany. The most likely place to find her would be Brittany's place of work. If she wasn't there, then Tara would know where she was. He would just have to convince Tara to tell him, which would be easier said than done, since she didn't particularly like him. Once at the office, Gabe confirmed Brittany wasn't in before heading directly for Tara's office. He ignored the secretary's protests that he didn't have an appointment and walked right past her, closing the office door behind him. Gabe tossed the doctor's letter onto Tara's desk before having a seat without invitation. Why didn't she tell me? Good morning, Gabe, remonstrated Tara as she picked up the letter to read it. Why don't you have a seat? She left me, Gabe said shortly. She's not in the office, and now I find out about this. I want to talk to her about it. Why? Tara tilted her head to study him like it was some kind of exotic bug she didn't particularly like. Why talk to her about it? You have gotten what you wanted. Your inheritance and job are secure. You don't even have to marry the girl you despise. It's a win for you. I don't despise her. His tone of voice was impatient. Gabe was still feeling a little sore after the conversation with Max. He didn't know exactly how he felt about Brittany, but he did know he had feelings for her. He wanted her to stay in his life, preferably married to him. I want to know why she wouldn't tell me, why she would put her health, even her life, at risk. Firstly, because you would have dismissed her as a candidate to marry. In case you've been blind, Britt really likes you, Tara dryly responded. Second, you're not a woman, so you don't understand what it's like to want to bring a life into the world, what it's like to feel a baby grow in your womb and the promise it brings. Brittany wanted to be a mom. It's simple. Her doctor advises against it. Gabe tried to keep his voice level against the conflicting emotions he felt about the cancer he knew Brittany was battling. She knew the risks, and she felt it was worth it, Tara informed him. It's her body to do as she wishes. Even if having a baby would kill her? questioned Gabe. A sliver of fear danced along his spine. The fear was rising again, and he could finally admit he didn't want to lose her. He didn't want her to face the same disease that was going to take his father from him. "'Why do you care?' asked Tara shrewdly as she eyed his reaction. "'You don't want to marry her. You don't want anything to do with her.' "'Who said that?' he demanded, feeling a little affronted over her accusations. "'You did? So many times during your lives?' explained Tara with no small amount of hostility. "'She is so messed up from trying to love you.' She and I were good. We were getting along, compromising, insisted Gabe. I don't know what happened. Why would she suddenly leave? Your secretary opened her eyes to the fact that you're keeping key information from her, retorted Tara. Your father is the reason for her father being in jail. You are using her for revenge to get back at your father for his foolish marriage ultimatum. I find it extremely petty. And I think it's good Brittany's finally seeing through you. I'm not marrying her for revenge, protested Gabe. I would never do that. You are overreacting. Overreacting? Tara ground out. She narrowed her eyes. 
Do you love her? Can you actually say you love Brit? Gabe opened his mouth, but he didn't really have a response. Earlier, it had been easy to deny it to Max. He decided to go with honesty. I'm not sure what love is. I see. Tara leaned back in her chair. Then she and I are not overreacting at all. I'm glad you're not getting married. You would have destroyed her. Gabe gave her a sharp look. After Rex's and Max's lectures this morning, he wasn't in the mood to tolerate Tara giving him a dressing down. I think that's a little harsh, don't you? No, she replied. She would have done everything for you and gotten nothing in return. You will never love her. Not when you love yourself more than anyone else in this world. I don't think your accusations are very fair, Gabe started, but Tara interrupted him. Who do you love more than yourself? Tara challenged him. Who would you lay down your job for? Who would you sacrifice your wealth for if they really needed it? Who would you rather spend every minute of every day with if you could? He searched his mind but came up empty. It was a disturbing idea that he might really be so selfish as Max had pointed out. All Gabe knew was that he didn't want to lose Brittany. He wanted her in his life. Gabe, Tara took pity on him. All she wants is your love, and you aren't capable of giving it. Just leave her alone so she can pick up the pieces of her life. He didn't want to leave her alone. Gabe struggled with himself for a moment, knowing they were probably right. He probably wasn't the best person to be in a relationship. However, he didn't want to leave things like this. He didn't want Britt to leave him. Gabe looked at Tara steadily. Where is she? Go away, Gabe. Tara lifted the receiver on her desk phone. Otherwise, I'll call security to escort you off the premises. Then call security. Gabe hoped she was bluffing. I'm not going anywhere until you tell me where Britt is. I want to talk to her. Tara shook her head. Once again, it's all about you and what you want. What about what Britt wants? She wants me, Gabe said with confidence. She has always wanted me. Tara pressed the extension button. Security? Tara, you know this is what she wants, insisted Gabe. Britt wants to be married to me. She proposed to me. If you were her friend, you would know it. I am her friend, exploded Tara as she slammed down the phone receiver into the cradle. It's why I am protecting her from you. Gabe drew in a frustrated breath as he stood. I want her, and I will find her. And when you don't want her anymore? When you decide to throw her away like you always do? What then, Gabe? taunted Tara, rising to her feet to glare at him. She can't deal with another rejection from you. She won't have to, rashly promised Gabe. Chapter 9 a ringing came from his pocket. Gabe slipped out his cell phone, noting the realtor was calling. The house. Gabe groaned. He had forgotten all about the house and the crazy offer he had insisted the realtor make just yesterday. He had been so busy catching up on work when Candy had called him. He had thought it would be a nice surprise for Brittany if they had the house ready for when they came back from the honeymoon. Gabe quickly accepted the call. Candy, I'm sorry I didn't get back to you sooner. You got the house, squealed Candy. It's so exciting. The owners were so pleased by the offer you made, they decided the inconvenience of immediately moving out was well worth it. They are going to live it up at a hotel until they find their new home. I have got the keys and the paperwork. All you need to do is the final payment and the house is yours. Brittany is going to be so happy. I'm so happy for both of you. Gabe closed his eyes in pain over the realtor's misplaced enthusiasm. He tried to say something, but couldn't think of what to do. Did he tell her Brittany had left him? Gabe, inquired Candy, are you still there? Yeah, he managed, just a little overwhelmed. I know exactly how you feel, enthused Candy. Your first home with the soon-to-be missus. Did I tell you I have also sold Brittany's condo? This is a whole new start to your life. Would you like to meet me at the house? You can have the keys tonight if it's convenient to you. Suddenly, a thought came to him. Brittany loved this house. No matter what she chose to do with her life, she would always love the house. 
She had sold her condo and didn't have a place to stay. Gabe could give her the house. It was a chance to make her happy. He was going to do everything he could to make her happy. Gabe would show Brittany how much she truly meant to him. Candy, you have connections in the construction and landscaping industries, right? Gabe asked, excitement churning within him. He had a game plan to try to win Brittany back. I know some reliable contractors who will be able to help, Candy promised. Anyone who can be at the house by tonight? questioned Gabe. I have some work which needs to be done immediately. I want this house perfect before the wedding. I'll need a decorator, too. Someone who can get things done quickly. I already know what Brittany wants. I might be able to make that happen, said Candy thoughtfully. A rush job will likely cost more, but I'll call around to see who's available. Perfect, replied Gabe. He hung up with the promise to meet her and the contractor at the house. Grabbing a sheet of paper and a pen, Gabe set to making a list of all the things Brittany had mentioned during their tour. If he put a few extra items on the list he knew she would enjoy, then it was all to her benefit. Short hours later, Gabe had two sets of keys in his hand, the signed paperwork, and a contract with a contractor. The designer Candy had managed to scrounge up had been great. She came with all sorts of magazines, and right away Gabe and Candy had managed to tell her the vision that Brittany had for the house. Everything was coming together. Tuesday, four days until the wedding. Gabe knocked on his father's door. While the doorman had let Gabe into the heritage building, and the maid had let Gabe into the large condo where his parents lived, Gabe still maintained the habit enforced by his father to knock on the closed study door. The four-bedroom condo was a rare find in the city, with the old-world charm architecture and large windows. As kids, Gabe had hardly paid attention to the scarred wooden floors or the impressive moldings. It had simply been home. Now, Gabe supposed it would pass on to Parker at some point. Come in, came James' raspy reply. Gabe opened the door to find his father sitting behind the large wooden desk. The antique was from a captain's quarters of an old ship which had ferried over the original Ramsley family, however many generations back. Gabe hadn't paid much attention to the details of the stories his father had told about the family. Perhaps he should have. Soon, James wouldn't be there any more to ask. Even now, he had a nasal tube for oxygen seated below his nose and looped over his ears. His color was a dull gray. "'Are you going to keep staring at the oxygen line or have a seat?' challenged the old man as he sorted through papers on his desk. "'I was staring at the mess on your desk,' lied Gabe as he sat in one of the two leather chairs across from his father. "'What's all this?' James batted Gabe's hand away from the sheaf of paper strewn about. Don't you worry about it. I'm just organizing a few things to make it easier for Dottie to find. While I'm at it, I'm doing a little purging. If you need any help, I have a little time on my hands, offered Gabe. Why would you have time on your hands? grunted James. Don't you have some hospitals to run? Not really. Gabe cleared his throat. I resigned to the board today. James stared at his oldest son before exploding. Now why would you go and do a fool thing like that? I didn't meet the expectations of your ultimatum, Gabe quietly informed him. Brittany and I are not getting married before your deadline. I felt it would be better press for the company and family to simply say I resigned rather than have to explain to the board and the public the real reasons. The wedding isn't until Saturday. Huff, James. Find someone else. No. Gabe was firm. There's no one else I'm willing to marry. Why not? demanded James. You're going to give up your legacy for some girl who doesn't even want you? Gabe refused to be drawn into an argument. What's done is done, Dad. I have resigned. I'm sorry if I disappointed you. Disappointed? sputtered James, his face turning red. Are you going to leave the business to Parker? He doesn't know how to lead a company like Ramsley Hospital Medical Corporation. He is a surfing bum. Is he who you want to take your place? He'll bankrupt the business. Gabe narrowed his eyes. He didn't appreciate his father's lack of confidence in Parker. 
Right now, the company has a complex issue, which could involve a very negative impact on this family and the security of Ramsley HMC if anyone were to find out. Do you know who has been handling the issue? Parker. He discovered the problem, has developed a solid strategy to get the company through the problem, and is implementing it. I would say I'm more than comfortable leaving Parker in charge. He has proved himself to me many times. Since you've retired, I've been giving Parker more and more responsibilities, and he has excelled. The only person I would be just as comfortable giving the company to is Marshall. And we both know Marshall would have difficulty not bankrupting the chain of hospitals. He has such a big heart and wants to save everyone. Neither of them are ready for being the head of the company, growled James. You are the firstborn. I groomed you for this. Your ultimatum had unintended side effects, Gabe pointed out. James shook his head in disappointment. You are such a wimp. You are a Ramsley. You could have anyone. I want to be certain when I die, this company that I built from its inception is safe and has a future. I don't want anyone. I want Brit. Gabe could feel his temper rising. He leaned forward in his chair. Why is it this company is more important than your son's happiness? Parker is more than capable of running the company. In fact, he'll be better at it than I am because it's his passion. He loves it as much as you do. Why can't you see that? Why can't you have some faith in him? You're always putting Parker down, always tearing into him. Why? Gabe waited with bated breath. Maybe, finally, his father would just admit the truth. James turned an alarming shade of puce before letting out an aggravated breath. Because I can't forgive him. Finally, murmured Gabe, finally the secret is out. James lowered his brows, frowning at Gabe. What are you talking about? You knew? Parker isn't your son? Gabe leaned back, folding his arms. I've known it for years. You cheated on Mom with your secretary, and Mom cheated on you with Uncle Oscar. It was a party. They both had too much to drink, muttered James, his color abating back to the dull gray. I was away, and your Aunt Mary, well... Let's just say she's not the easiest person to live with. It happened one time. I forgave Dottie the moment she confessed the whole episode to me. As for my affair, it was a mistake. Your mother forgave me. You forgave Mom, but you can't forgive Parker. What choice did he have? It wasn't his fault his father isn't you, challenged Gabe in disgust. Every time I look at him, I see Oscar, grimaced James. I had to be harder on him. Otherwise, he might turn out to be like your worthless, lazy uncle. Oscar always needed constant babysitting. He wasn't a businessman. If he had his way, he would be at a continual party or on some beach. We practically ran his business for him. I had to make sure Parker didn't take after Oscar. And that's why you hate the surfing so much, realized Gabe. Surfing is a bum sport, groused James. Ramsley's play golf. A true gentleman's game. Gabe shook his head in disbelief. You need to forgive and make peace with Parker. He is the one who's going to be leading the company into the future. Not only that, but he's been raised to be your son. You owe him forgiveness and acceptance, or you owe him the truth. A silence stretched out between them as James thought it over. You're certain you're not going to resume your position? When I resigned, it felt right, admitted Gabe. I've never thought of doing anything other than leading Ramsley Hospital Medical Corporation, but leaving my position to Parker was the right thing to do. I believe in him. You think he'll do a good job? A hopeful James asked reluctantly. I know he will, affirmed Gabe. He slowly put a hand out to his father. Thank you for teaching me and trusting me to take your place when you step down. I learned a lot. First time you've ever said it grumbled to please James as he shook his son's hand. Gabe stood up, looking down on his father who was becoming more and more frail. It was about time I did say something. Past time, really. You can visit, you know, a gruff James announced. The prison I'm going to will allow visitors. They have these things called day passes. When are you scheduled to go? A somber Gabe questioned. January 7th, answered James. I'll spend one last set of holidays here. They're being very lenient, remarked Gabe. 
It's part of the deal we brokered with the FBI. James coughed. He waited until he could breathe again properly. I expect Parker and Marshall will be on honeymoon for the holidays. I will be here, promised Gabe. James nodded. That's good. Gabe sighed. I should go talk to Mom now and let her know I won't be getting married this weekend. She'll be disappointed, mentioned James softly. She's not the only one who is disappointed, Gabe said softly. I have a plan to win Britt back, but I'm not sure she'll agree to have me. Gabe saw what might have been sympathy in James's face before giving him a nod of respect and exiting the office. Knowing his mother enjoyed spending time on the balcony with the greenhouse for flowers, Gabe headed there first since it was usually where she could be found unless she was at one of her weekly charity meetings. Stepping past the large potted plants into the small glass greenhouse, he saw Dottie puttering away as she watered her plants, softly humming. Mom, do you have a moment? I have something I want to talk to you about. Smiling, Dottie put her watering can down on an old table. I always have time for my boys. What is it, Gabe? You look a little sad. I have a bit of bad news, Gabe informed her. Brittany and I might not be getting married. Dottie looked down at her gardening gloves. Slowly, she peeled them off and stiffened her back. Are you sure you can't get her to change her mind? Buy her some flowers and apologize for whatever happened. When you're in a relationship, you learn to forgive each other. Otherwise, the problems just sour the marriage. I have been hurting Britt for a long time now, Gabe replied. Flowers aren't going to fix this. I have a plan in mind, but I'm not certain it will work. If it doesn't, I might just have to give her some space before trying again. Space is the last thing a girl needs, murmured Dottie. Space is where separations, breakups, and divorces happen. You need to go talk to Brittany. I promise I will talk to her, vowed Gabe. All he had to do was find her. When he had called Naomi today, she said she hadn't seen Brittany. Not trusting Brittany's mother, he had gotten verification from the housekeeper. Dottie sniffed and wiped away a tear. I'm sorry. For all her quirks, I really do like Brittany. I know you liked her as well. Somehow, the word like just didn't fit, Gabe thought. He more than liked Brittany. He was going to miss her, all her clutter and chatter, if he didn't figure out a way to fix this. I was thinking maybe we could offer my spot to Jake if things don't work out between Britt and I. He and Sterling have wanted to get married for a while now. All our family would be there, and hopefully it's enough time for her family to come. That would be nice, nodded Dottie. However, don't give up hope just yet. I don't plan on it. Gabe gave her a kiss on the cheek. It was time to do the next part of his plan. A short drive later, and he was outside of Tara and Rex Hudson's family home. She had to be there. Gabe laid on the doorbell. There weren't any cars in the driveway, which suited him fine. Tara was still at work, and it looked like Rex had gone as well. Gabe didn't think Brittany had gotten her car from the dealer yet. She had been torn between a minivan or an SUV, and Gabe had been no help with making the decision. As far as he was concerned, she was driving it, and it should be her choice. They had only been planning on having one kid, so what did it matter how many seats were in the vehicle? Brittany had blathered on about playdates and school friends. At that point, Gabe had tuned her out. Now he felt a little guilty over the whole matter. Maybe he should have listened to her a little better. Realizing that no one was coming to answer the door, Gabe peeled his finger off the doorbell button. He tried the knob, but it was locked. Didn't they have a housekeeper to let him in? Scowling, Gabe circled the house, trying various doors and windows to see if they were locked. He hoped the security system wouldn't go off, as trying to explain what he was doing was the last thing he wanted to do. What was he doing? Gabe wondered as he wandered into the backyard. It had been three days since he had last seen Brittany, one day since the fateful conversation with Tara. Part of him thought she was right. He would probably do Brittany more harm than good by being in her life. Gabe had been examining what others had been telling him and found that their concerns had merit. He was a selfish guy. Yet he couldn't leave this alone. He couldn't leave Brittany alone. 
Max was right. He probably was the most terrible guy in the world, but Gabe did have feelings for Brittany. He could finally admit maybe he did feel possessive of her. He didn't like the idea of her finding happiness without him. And maybe he was more than willing to try to put Brittany first for a change. Finding the back patio open, Gabe tentatively entered the house. He carefully sidestepped around a large pile of boxes, following the sound of crinkling bubble wrap into the living room. Gabe looked around in amazement at the number of boxes, full and empty boxes, which surrounded Brittany as she sat on the floor amidst bubble wrap and packing tape. I'm sorry, Brittany wiped away a tear, heedless of who she was talking to as she hugged a large stuffed teddy. I know I promised to get all this packed up and labeled to return to the FedEx guy. I just got a little distracted by the flower ring hair pieces for the flower girls were going to wear. I don't think I should return them. I'll let the girls keep them. They'll have such fun playing dress up with them. Then I saw the bear and I just needed a moment. It's the first toy I bought for the baby and I'm having a hard time giving him back. The thought of putting him in a box and sending him away is like admitting it's all over. Don't worry, I'll get the living room cleaned up. I promised I would get a dent in it by tonight and I will. Brittany's voice trailed off in surprise as she looked up to see Gabe. She blinked at him. I thought you were Rex. I'm not Rex. Gabe carefully came forward, conscious of the overcrowded living room full of boxes and wedding items Brittany seemed intent on returning. Leaning down, he cleared a spot so he could sit down and join her. Why are you here? whispered Brittany as he sat beside her. Avoiding the pain in her eyes, Gabe looked at the bear she was clutching. You bought the bear for our baby? Brittany nodded. There isn't going to be a baby. I should probably return him so some other lucky boy can have him. I think you should keep him. Gabe reached out to touch the ear of the bear. He'll just remind me of what I can't have. She shook her head, holding the stuffed animal a little tighter. You should go. I'm not going anywhere, he quietly told her. Brittany digested his words. Then you can help clean up all this mess. I need it boxed and labeled so the FedEx guy can pick it up tomorrow and all of it can go back. What if it doesn't have to go back? Gabe looked at the mass of items and wondered where it had all come from. It has to go back. Brittany wiped away a tear angrily and drew in a shuddering breath. We are not getting married. We are not having a baby. There's no point in keeping any of it. Uncertain of what to say, Gabe reached out to take Brittany's hand, but she moved it away from him. He could feel the chasm between them deepening, and wasn't sure what to do to fix it. Before, Brittany had always been the one to try to bridge any gap. Gabe cleared his throat. Do you remember when we were kids and our teachers used to make us play what if to teach us critical thinking skills? I don't want to play what if, said an exhausted Brittany. What if I want to return the shares you gave me? Gabe absently picked up some bubble wrap, fiddling with it. What if I've seen my lawyer and I have already given them back to you? Brittany looked at him solemnly. It's your inheritance. What if I bought the house? the one with the ugly yellow nursery within walking distance of the park that you like so much. Gabe popped a plastic bubble, the one you wanted to make into our home. You didn't. Brittany held the bear a little tighter. You didn't buy the house. You are not giving me back the shares. Stop playing what if. I don't want to hear it anymore. I did. Gabe dropped the bubble wrap and pulled the paperwork out of his jacket, holding it out to her. Your name is on the deed. When did you buy it? She made no move to take the proffered papers. A couple of days ago, Gabe informed her. I put the shares back in your name this morning. Why? Why would you do it? Brittany's voice broke. You have everything you want. You've got your inheritance, you've got to keep your job, and you don't have to marry anyone. You got exactly what you wanted, so why would you do it? Because I realized there was something I wanted more, he admitted. Someone I wanted more. I want you, Brit. No. Brittany closed her eyes. You don't. You never have, and I have finally accepted it. I was a jerk, okay? 
a huge, colossal, monumental jerk. Gabe reached out to cup her face in his hands. I don't deserve you. I'm the one who was an idiot all these years, trying to deny what I felt for you. To deny us. I'm sorry. I want to start putting you first, to put us first. I want to be all in on this relationship. Stop. Brittany sobbed in earnest, pushing his hands away. I can't do this. Please just stop. We can get married whenever you want, wherever you want, he rashly promised. We can have a baby. I'll be with you every step of the way. No matter how freaked out I get, I'll stay with you in the delivery room. I'll be there when you have the operation to remove the cancer. We can adopt more kids if that's what you want. No divorces, no prenups, no deadlines. We'll do whatever you want. I want you to love me, she whispered. Can you do that? Brit. Gabe reached out to her, but she moved away. He swallowed hard over his discomfort. What did he know about love? Was it this need that he had to keep Brit in his life? Was it this panic in his chest over the thought that he was permanently losing her? Was it all the gooey things Max said it was, which Gabe didn't seem to feel? What really was love? Gabe honestly didn't know. I want to love you. You want to love me, she echoed slowly. Yes, Gabe affirmed quickly. Please give me another chance. I gave you so many chances, Gabe, sighed Brittany. We aren't good for each other. All we do is hurt one another with our ideas of what the other person should be. We just mess it up. I know, I messed it up. But I won't mess up this time, vowed Gabe. I don't want to lose you. You never had me, Brittany said dully. I never had you. Brit, please try one more time, he asked desperately. I'll be right there trying with you. Please leave me alone. She pressed her face against the plush bear. Just go away. Brit, pleaded Gabe, just one more time. It's too hard, Brittany told him exhaustedly. I'm broken and tired. If I try one more time and it doesn't work out, I won't be able to pick myself back up again. I will pick you up if it comes to that, but I don't see it happening. With both of us working together, we can make this relationship solid. Gabe's voice trailed off as Tara came into the kitchen, staring at him in shock. What are you doing here? I thought I told you to leave her alone. Tara came forward, crouching beside Brit and enveloping her in a hug. Tara? Gabe ran a hand through his hair. All I want, all you want is to make her unhappy again. Tara glared at him. You are toxic, Gabe. A monumental pile of trash. If you don't leave... I'm going to call the police and file charges for trespassing, harassment, and whatever else the lawyers can think of. Tara, please. He sighed, tired and aggravated. Brit and I need to talk. What you need to do is get out of my house, she stubbornly insisted as she pulled out her cell phone, fingers hovering over a call button. Get out. Now. This isn't over, Gabe vowed quietly, as he took a last look at a crying Brittany. He rose to his feet. Tara tilted her head back to look up at him. If you have any feelings for her at all, it will be over. You will leave her in peace so she can figure out how to live her life without you in it. You need to stop destroying her. I want to try again, Gabe tried to convince her. I want to try to be the person Brit needs. You will never be that person, Gabe. Tara rubbed Brittany's back. You don't know how. You don't know how to love someone other than yourself. That's not necessarily true. Gabe defended himself. At least he hoped it wasn't true. There was a lump in his throat preventing him from speaking. He wasn't going to lie and say he loved Brit. It was the ultimate question every woman wanted answered, and he couldn't answer it. He had no experience with love. He knew all about duty, pride, loyalty, and family obligations, not about love. It didn't matter. He had no answer, and Tara knew she had won the argument. Gabe had lost and had no recourse to appeal. He reached into his pocket and withdrew a set of keys. He laid them on top of the papers he had brought, which were now on the floor, unwanted, like him. What are those? asked Tara with suspicion. The keys to her house, 
Gabe informed her. Sell it or keep it, it's hers to do with what she wants. As he left, Gabe wondered if love felt as though he was leaving a piece of himself behind, and he would never be quite whole again. Chapter 10 Thursday, Two Days Before the Wedding Two days later, and Gabe was desperate. There was progress on the house. A couple of walls had been moved. The new ensuite bath was perfect by Brittany's standards, keeping in the traditional feel of the house. Paint was drying. Wallpaper had been hung. Furniture was moved in and covered with dust cloths to keep it clean. A cleaning crew was wiping down everything so the final touches could happen. Gabe was waiting on an entire order of deluxe kitchen countertop appliances in matching red because it would fit with Brittany's stand mixer. However, nothing had happened in the backyard. Flowers, small trees, sod, and a jumbo of wood for the new playset had been delivered and sat abandoned beside a stack of paving stones. A sprinkler system and lighting system waited in boxes. The wedding was coming ever closer, and this might be his last chance to convince her to marry him. The house had to be done, and perfect for when she finally had a look at it. So today was the day Gabe showed up in his gym clothes. He had no idea what he was doing, but apparently all the landscaping companies were too busy to take his money, no matter how high he bid the job. The joke was on him. He couldn't buy his way out of this situation. The local hardware store had helpfully delivered a bunch of tools he might need. Gabe was now the proud owner of a bunch of guys' items he never even remotely handled before. Some of the tools, he didn't even know what they were for. Too bad he had never elected to take shop. Grabbing a shovel, Gabe reasoned he could take the old patchy grass off the yard first and throw it in the dumpster. It was as good of a place to start as any. Then he could set to pulling out any plants in the way of his new flower bed scheme. After that, he would put out all those bags of potting mix he bought. Then, plant the sod, the plants, read the directions on the lighting, sprinklers, and playset. Somehow, he would get it done. With a plan in mind, Gabe set to working up a sweat. Hours later in the hot sun, Gabe looked at his empty water bottle with regret. The cleaners had been through the house, and there was no way he could go inside to refill the container being covered in dirt from head to toe like he was. Taking the lid off his water bottle, Gabe opened the tap, listening to the water course through the hose. Using the nozzle on the end, he sprayed a generous amount into the container before taking a big, thirsty gulp and spitting it back out. Hot! he choked in shock, touching his aching lips with dirty fingers. You have to run it a little while for it to cool down, a man advised. The hose heats up in the sun. Thanks. Gabe looked around to see a blonde man peering over the fence. I'm Tom, the man cheerfully supplied. I guess we're neighbors. Nice to meet you, Tom, replied Gabe as he ran the hose, testing it with his finger before refilling the water container. I'm Gabe. Looks like you're doing a little yard work, Tom observed the obvious. I noticed there's been a lot of activity around the house for the past couple days. I'm trying to get it ready by the weekend, replied Gabe, taking a swig from his water bottle. He wondered if all his new neighbors were going to be as nosy as this one. I want it to be perfect for Brittany. Don't you have any help? wondered Tom. Looks like a big job. It is, admitted Gabe. He looked at the lumps of dirt of uneven soil where he had dug out the grass. He would have to fix it before laying down the sod. Otherwise, the entire yard would be lumpy. Gabe frowned at the amount of work before him. I don't really have a choice. The first landscaper bailed because he was double booked. I can't find another one to take over in time to get the job done, so I have to do it myself. Gabe looked around, but it appeared Tom had left. Or at least the tuft of blonde hair, pink forehead, and eyeballs that had been looking over the fence had left. Gabe shook his head. He had another good drink of water and started digging again, tossing clumps of grass and dirt into the wheelbarrow. He was going to get this done today, even if it killed him. I thought you could use a hand, said Tom from behind him, causing Gabe to jump in surprise. 
I'll need you to tell me what to do since I have no experience at this. I'm an accountant during the day. I mostly work from home and it's a little slow right now, so I can help you out for a few hours if you'd like. Thanks. I would appreciate it. I run a chain of hospitals. Gabe grimaced at his mistake. Actually, I just resigned from running a chain of hospitals. It's recent. I guess the real question is, do you golf? Asked Tom in mock seriousness. A lot of guys on the block golf. You should join us sometime. I would like that. Gabe set the shovel to the ground and held out a hand in greeting. He winced as Tom gave his blistered hand a hearty shake. Boy, those are big blisters, commented Tom. You should wear some work gloves. Hey, I've got an extra pair. Gabe gratefully took the extended pair. Truth is, I have no idea what I'm doing trying to landscape this. I just know I have to get it done. Well then, put me to work, Tom volunteered. Hours later, and some handy advice from the contractor, Gabe and Tom had made significant headway. Taking a break, the pair sat in a set of folding lawn chairs Tom had dug out of his garage, since they didn't want to get the new patio set dirty. Eating Chinese food from a local restaurant out of containers with a couple of beers, the men contemplated their work. I'll call someone to repair the sprinkler system on Monday, mentioned Gabe. I'm sorry about that, apologized Tom. I really didn't see the line when I dug the hole. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Gabe waved the apology away. The plants are going to need to be watered, advised Tom as he speared another spring roll with his plastic fork, putting it on his paper plate. Every evening they should be watered until they're established. Gabe frowned. I suppose I can. Who else is going to do it? Tom asked rhetorically. It's not like you can afford a gardener. Gabe reflected Tom was right. He couldn't afford a gardener. Gabe was distinctly middle class now, only because he had a great investment portfolio. His liquidity position was horrible. Right now, he was reduced to sleeping at Marshall's place. But Gabe didn't know how long he would be welcome there, since Marshall was getting married this weekend. He supposed he would have to find an affordable apartment and get a new job. Dragging his thoughts out of his personal worries, Gabe regarded the ornamental tree they had planted in the flower bed. The tree still looks crooked. We've planted it over a dozen times, replied Tom dryly. No matter which way we plant it, the tree is still crooked. Nothing's going to change it. Do you think it's defective? wondered Gabe as he frowned while contemplating the flowering tree. Maybe those plants are supposed to be that way, shrugged Tom. How would we know? We're not gardeners. Although, after today, I think we've earned some of our green thumb. Look at the treehouse. It's a thing of beauty. That's true, Gabe noted with pride. He was sore, sunburnt, and had blisters. There was dirt right through his sneakers and socks. However, he was proud of all the work they had done. Never would he or any of his acquaintances have thought Gabriel Ramsley would do manual labor. However, we couldn't have done it without help from the contractor and his assistant. We did learn how to use a skill saw, beamed Tom as he held up his bandaged hand. Gabe winced. I would still like you to get the wound looked at. It probably could use a couple of stitches and a tetanus shot. I promise I will cover the bill. It's just a scratch. Tom waved away his concern. It was worth it. It's our blood and sweat in this yard. Thank you. Gabe truly was thankful. He gave Tom a nod of appreciation. I couldn't have done any of this without you. You would have found a way. Always important not to disappoint the missus, Tom said jovially. He looked around the yard, missing Gabe's pensive look. So we've done everything except the play set. Yep, nodded Gabe. He didn't know why he hadn't told Tom Brittany wasn't marrying him. He supposed he was still hopeful. Gabe gazed at the pile of wood, plastic, and bolts. The rest of the yard looked good. Not great, and certainly not perfect by any means. But even the contractor had been impressed with their work before he had left. The house was finished to perfection. Now all that was left to do was tackle the playset. I'll grab the instructions. Hopefully we can figure them out. I've built the Ikea furniture, Tom mentioned hopefully. Maybe it'll be similar. 
Then you are the expert and can take lead on this part of the project, Gabe offered as he grabbed a booklet from the pile. Returning to his chair, he and Tom poured over the paperwork. Looks like hieroglyphics, muttered Tom. It only has diagrams. Gabe was aghast. How is anyone supposed to put together a large, safe playset for a child with only pictures to follow? For the instructions. I think this is Spanish? Tom squinted over a sheet. These symbols might be Chinese. I have no idea where the English is. Gabe leaned over to read. It says to put the playset together and use at your own risk, not liable for any injuries. That's encouraging, snorted Tom. Well, looks like sturdy material. All we need to do is figure out how to read the pictures. Fifteen minutes later, the two men had a plan of attack and began. Saturday, the day of the wedding. Are you sure you want to do this? questioned Tara in a gentle voice. I need to say goodbye to it. Brittany took a deep breath as she inserted the key into the lock. It's part of the griefing process. Then I can hand the keys over to the realtor and we'll never have to worry about it again. Okay, Tara said doubtfully as she followed her friend into the foyer. She looked around the space. It is nice. The house is walking distance from the park and a ten-minute drive to the school. Brittany wandered into the furnished living room, running a hand over the plush couch. Tara went to the kitchen frowning as she caught sight of a couple of sticky notes on the counter. She lifted one off, reading the scrawl on the slip of yellow paper. Space for Brit's mixer. Replacing it, Tara read the other one, which was taped to an empty wooden crate which was sitting on the end of the counter. Spot for Brick's cookbooks. Frowning, Tara caught a glimpse of an open doorway where there were a ton of sticky notes and other papers on a wall. Investigating, she found the office. Papers, magazines with sticky notes, diagrams of the house were pinned on the wall. A list on the desk caught her eye. In Gabe's masculine scrawl, there were notes on what Brittany had shown preferences for in furniture, paint, decorations, fabrics. A pile of magazines with sticky notes sat beside the list. Tara flipped through the papers on his desk when another note caught her eye. Make Brit happy. On it was a list of things to do for the house, the honeymoon, to discuss whether or not to put a treehouse in the backyard, etc. Tara rolled her eyes as she set it down. It was such a man list. Women would try to find ways to say they loved a man, to show affection and care. Men just wanted to see if they could provide things, as if that was the answer. She tossed the list back on the desk and went to find Brittany in the nursery. Tara hesitated in the doorway. Oh, Britt, I knew this was a bad idea. Brittany shook her head as she flipped pages in a book. He highlighted names. Excuse me? Tara came over to her friend's side and looked at the book. Baby names. Britt had a watery sigh. He highlighted some. He's just trying to get into your head. Tara pulled the book out of Brittany's grasp, setting it down on a dresser. He did up this whole house to get into your head. It's everything I would have chosen. Brittany stroked the wooden crib rail. She loved the blue and plaid accents. Exactly. Tara tried to talk sense into her. He had your magazines and got a decorator to do up the house exactly as you wanted. He's trying to get you back, just like he always does. However, once he has you, Gabe doesn't know what to do and just leaves you. He does it all the time. He's never had me before, Brittany pointed out wryly as she picked up a stuffed bear. He always had you, Tara sighed. Remember when you were going out with Brandon? Brandon was ready to propose, and Gabe inserted himself just enough so that you would break it off and be available, which you did. Then he pulls a disappearing act and wants nothing to do with you. He is incapable of loving you, but he doesn't want you to be happy with anyone. I'm telling you, the guy is poison. He has never done this before. Brittany touched the tiny sheet in the crib with the giraffe pattern. He never told me he wanted to love me, that he wanted to try, that he would be there for me. He will say anything, 
sighed Tara. He does it every time he gets close to losing you. Gabe dangles a carrot of mediocre affection and you come running. Then he turns it around so you are alone and embarrassed while he's off living his life without a thought of you. Brittany digested the words quietly. It was true before. This time he seems to mean it. Tara wrapped an arm around Brittany, sighing. Trust me, this is no different than all the other times, even if he did buy the house. He can afford to. He gave me back my shares. Brittany gently put down the stuffed bear. A smooth tactic on his part. I have been watching him break your heart year after year. You're better off without him, said Tara in a firm voice. You're probably right, repeated Brittany woodenly. Come on, let's go. Tara led Brittany out of the room. After they had descended the staircase, Brittany stopped. I want to see the backyard, she mentioned as she caught sight of a children's swing set outside. Tara nodded, and the pair exited through the living room French doors onto the back patio. A newly landscaped yard greeted them. Not only was there a swing set, but a sandbox and a treehouse had been added. There's something a little off. Tara frowned as she looked around. Is that ornamental tree crooked? Good morning, called out a cheery male voice. Brittany and Tara turned to see a man walking across the yard. Blonde and a little heavy set, he had a round, happy face. Um, hello? Tara shot Brittany a look. Brittany shrugged. One of you must be Brittany. The man held out his hand in greeting. I'm Tom. I live next door. Gabe texted me this morning asking me to water the sod and plants. Guess he thought you weren't going to be here yet. Isn't there a sprinkler system? Tara asked a little suspiciously. There's a break in the line somewhere, so it's not working, smiled Tom. It'll be replaced next weekend. Brittany quickly took his hand in hers. I'm Brittany, and this is my friend Tara. Nice to meet you, nodded Tom. He looked over the yard in satisfaction. You know, this is the first yard I have ever landscaped. I kind of enjoyed it. Might have to change my profession from accounting to gardener. Pardon me? questioned Brittany. I thought a landscaping company was hired. Oh, they were, but they bailed, Tom informed her. Everyone else was booked up, so your fiancé started to do it himself. I came over to introduce myself and decided to volunteer to help. Two days later, and a little advice from the contractor, who was overseeing the inside work, we managed to finish the yard. Gabe was determined to get it done for you on time. Gabe did manual labor? Disbelief tinged Tara's voice. Sure did. Good thing he can figure out instructions, laughed Tom. I would have put the playset together all backward. As it was, we both have a few blisters for our efforts. He really helped to create all this? Brittany looked over the yard with fresh eyes. Tara was right. The color scheme was wrong, with plants planted in groups which didn't match. There was a crooked dwarf ornamental tree. Helped. He made it happen. I was the helper. Tom gestured to the treehouse. The only thing Gabe couldn't do was the treehouse. We hired a construction guy to help us figure that one out. Didn't want the thing to come crashing down once your kid starts using it. Brittany's lower lip trembled as tears came to her eyes. She sniffed. Tara sighed over the inevitable. You are going back to him. Would you think less of me if I did? Brittany gave Tara a pleading look, wanting her to understand. No. Tara gave a small smile before giving her friend a hug. I know you have a big heart. I just hope this time Gabe means it. He does. Brittany smiled and wiped away a tear. He did all of this for me. Gabe may not be able to say the words, but this time he used actions to prove he's capable of putting me first. We could have an equal relationship if he keeps trying, and I want to give him the chance. Okay. Tara nodded and looked concerned as she checked her watch. The wedding is this afternoon. We'll never make it on time. Who cares if you're on time? Tom asked rhetorically. I waited three hours for my Nancy to make it down the aisle, and it was worth it. Just get there. I'll need my dress. Brittany grabbed Tara's arm as they hustled through the gate towards the driveway. You need your dress. What about the flowers for our bouquets? You need to call Rex. He has to be there. And my mother. What am I supposed to do about her? 
Don't invite her, advised Tara. She would never make it on time. Good point, conceded Brittany. Tom opened the door of the car for her. Drive carefully. You don't need to be in an accident on your wedding day. Wait, Brittany pulled out her phone. What is your phone number? I'm inviting you and Nancy to the wedding. You don't have to do that, a humble Tom told her. Yes, I do. I think you're the first friend Gabe has made outside of family since college, so you're invited. Brittany got his phone number. I'll text you the location. Go get married. Tom carefully shut her door, and Tara backed out of the driveway as he waved to them. Who were they? A woman called from the neighboring porch. Brittany and her friend, Tanya or something, Tom shouted back. Could you get out my suit and a dress for yourself? Call the sitter. We're going to need one after I'm done watering the yard here. What for? Nancy questioned. We're going to a wedding, grinned Tom. Chapter 11 After the Wedding The Wedding Supper Your tie is crooked, commented Gabe. Is not. Marshall quickly went to look in a mirror. You're lucky you escaped, Parker muttered dryly. Gabe gave a non-committal sound. Shouldn't you be with your brides? They're scoping out a spot for pictures with the photographer and mom. Parker had a sip of whiskey. It's nice of you to let another couple take your spot. Well, I figured someone should be happy, shrugged Gabe. Are you really resigning? Marshall joined them, picking up a tumbler of amber liquid as a waiter passed them. I didn't honor Dad's wishes, so yes, I have resigned. Gabe had a grimace. The position doesn't hold much appeal anymore anyways. Three weeks ago, you were willing to marry Brittany Crawford to keep the job and the money, pointed out Barker. Three weeks ago, I was an idiot. Gabe put down his drink. You're both idiots, too, if you think you can do this without any repercussions. You fell for her, crowed Marshall. It's about time you admit it. We are not talking about me, growled Gabe. He had discovered in the past couple of days with explaining to his family he wouldn't be getting married. The whole topic was a sore spot with him. We are talking about the two of you. I'm fine, Marshall smiled happily. I'm great, even. Got it totally under control. Really? Parker rolled his eyes. I highly doubt it, says the guy who is married to a total stranger. Marshall grinned. I, however, actually know the girl I've gotten hitched to, and we will be fine. Parker gave a disbelieving snort before taking another sip of whiskey. How can you really know? Gabe looked at Marshall with interest. What makes you so certain you'll be fine? I just do, shrugged Marshall. She makes every day a little better. I look forward to talking to her. I want to make her happy. She's my best friend. It's pretty simple, really. Parker rolled his eyes. Why didn't you introduce her to us if she's your best friend? Sometimes I like to have a little mystery, said a smug Marshall. Parker snorted. Hey. I'm not the one headed for divorce in five years. Marshall gave his brother a stern look. If you don't get it together, you're going to have one unhappy wife and then good luck with the kid. What do you mean? frowned Parker. Your wife could pack Junior up and whisk him away to her home country, Marshall advised him. You better keep her happy. That's not going to happen, rejected Parker. We have an agreement. And after five years, all bets are off, Gabe agreed with Marshall. Better it be in her good books, or at least try to be friends. This is a business arrangement, insisted Parker. We have a contract. Things will be fine. If you say so, Marshall innocently replied. It will. Parker was annoyed. I'm going to see what's keeping them. Dinner is due to start soon. I will join you. Marshall smiled in satisfaction as he followed his brother to find the photographer and the rest of the wedding party. Gabe leaned on a column, looking out the window to a perfectly manicured topiary arrangement in the tiny interior courtyard. There was a small dusting of snow on the ground. A green Christmas was predicted. The kids in the family were sure to be disappointed. It's a beautiful view, a cold voice said beside him even if it is all covered in snow. Gabe turned to look at Agent Kepler, who was gazing out the window. 
What do you want? What a way to greet me. Kepler turned icy eyes to Gabe. You skipped right over all the formalities. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? You don't strike me as the formalities type. Gabe narrowed his eyes. I think you'd much rather get to the point. True. Kepler had a small smile. Passports. Excuse me? asked Gabe, a little confused by the sudden change in direction of the conversation. Tomorrow morning, I want the groom's passports, stated Kepler, idly picking a piece of non-existent lint from his sleeve. You're kidding, frowned Gabe. They're about to go on their honeymoons. This is harassment. No. Kepler had a satisfied smile, his eyes still hard. It's a court order, one that will be issued early tomorrow morning. In fact, I would like everyone in the entire Ramsley family to have their passports ready and in hand so I can obtain them. This way, no one gets any ideas about fleeing the country before my investigation is concluded. I figure if you give them a heads up, it will be easier to collect them in the morning. If anyone has any ideas to make a break for it, they should think twice. The resort is being watched by some of the Bureau's finest. This is ridiculous. Gabe shook his head in disbelief. Why now? Why at the wedding? You could have done this at any time, but you chose tomorrow morning. You're not going to intimidate us this way, Kepler. Says the man who recently resigned from his position, shrugged Kepler, unconcerned. Finding it a little difficult in the hot seat of the family business lately? I resigned for personal reasons, scowled Gabe. Whatever you say. Kepler looked Gabe over, seeing far more than Gabe would have liked. Just get all the passports available tomorrow morning. I would hate to embarrass the family on the wedding weekend by having this leak out to the press if anyone decides not to cooperate. I'm going to find out who your supervisor is and inform him you are harassing us, Gabe advised him. By all means, Mr. Ramsley. Kepler didn't even blink. Have a nice day. Gabe watched as Kepler walked away. He ran a hand over his face, wondering just what Kepler's deal was. The man was like a cat, and they were all mice being toyed with. Gabe didn't like it, but he wasn't certain what could be done about it. Irritated, he went to join the others at the rehearsal dinner. Finding his seat, Gabe listened to the conversation around him. This was his family. This was supposed to be one of the happiest moments in his life. Yet it still wasn't. Brittany was missing from the chair at his side. An empty seat stood as a reminder of what he had lost. Not that he was giving up. Gabe was about to make Brittany's overtures at getting his attention all these years look like child's play. He had plans to do whatever it took, all sorts of grand gestures to get her back and convince her to love him. He could admit it, if only to himself. Gabe wanted Brittany to love him. He wanted her back in his life forever. Gabe had even made a list. He might even have it laminated, just to prove something. Not like he would go as far as Britt had at prom. No one should go that far giving food poisoning to all the attendees except Gabe, so only he and she had been left feeling well. She had drugged everyone, so no one was left to dance with but her. Not that he had danced with Britt. Perhaps he should add a prom-like event, minus the tampered punch to his list. Dragging his thoughts away from Britt, Gabe surveyed his family, who seemed to be having a good time. There was an empty seat beside Marshall as well, but his brother didn't seem to be worried at all. "'Hey, Marshall, where's your bride?' asked Everett with some amusement. "'She hiding from you?' "'She's getting ready with her family,' Marshall responded patiently. "'If you'd all enjoy your supper, you will enjoy the second wedding with her traditions.' Two weddings?' asked Aunt Mary in surprise. "'The first wasn't enough?' "'We are honoring her traditions as well,' smiled Marshall." It just seems a little odd, persisted Dottie. They should be here. Adriana's family is. Gabe glanced over to see a pained Parker, trying to make out what one of Adriana's uncles was saying. Parker looked confused, 
no doubt by the heavy accent the man had. Parker's thin bride sat beside him, poking at something on her plate with the wrong fork. Next to the Ramsley family, Adriana's family looked underdressed. However, they seemed to appreciate the food and beverages. One of them stood to make a long and rambling toast in their native language. Parker was in for an interesting life, Gabe reflected. Whether his brother's temperament could handle it, Gabe didn't know. He could see his Aunt Mary puckering her lips in distaste at the display. While the uptight Mary had married the laid-back Oliver Ramsley, she herself was a stickler for propriety and standards. Mom, gently admonished Marshall, they've ordered trays in their rooms for supper. I guess it's supposed to take hours to get ready, but they are managing on a much smaller time frame to accommodate us. I offered to help, but was turned down. My bride has it all under control. I am happy for you, Dottie hastened to assure him. She turned to whisper to Gabe. I worried a little bit about Parker, but after having a chat with the lovely girl he's chosen, all my fears were laid to rest. Adriana will do nicely. I'm sure Parker would be pleased to hear it, Gabe said a little dryly. He had some doubts about the whole thing, but Parker could make his own decisions. Gabe, are you certain Brittany won't be coming? Dottie tentatively asked as she gave him a hopeful look. I do like the girl, and she comes from good family. Gabe swallowed down his own unhappiness with the situation, understanding his mother was disappointed as well. Brittany is a wonderful person. I'm hoping to change her mind, but it's not going to happen today. It's okay, dear. Dottie patted his hand wistfully. It was nice of you to give one of the other couples a chance to marry today. Gabe nodded. Is Dad going to be at the send-off tomorrow? He needs to rest up, but your father assured me he would be there. Dottie smiled fondly. The man can't seem to sleep anywhere but his own bed. Plus, he gets so tired these days. We thought it best for him to skip tonight and the breakfast tomorrow. He'll be here for the send-off. That's good, murmured Gabe. He decided he needed a little fresh air. Excusing himself, Gabe made his way through the lobby, down the stone steps, and out into the street. It was cold, and he wished he had brought his jacket. But dinner had been less formal, and he had taken it off, setting it on the back of his chair. Gabe breathed in the crisp winter air. It was quiet for the city. Construction had blocked off this road, and everyone had to go around it. Other than the doormen, Gabe had the street to himself. He dragged in a deep breath and looked over to see the sun starting to set between the buildings. She wasn't coming. He had lost his job. He had very little in savings. All he had was a list of ideas to try to win her heart. There was a gaping hole in his life. If Gabe were honest with himself, the hole was where Britt should be. He had been so concerned with keeping himself safe, he had lost something precious. A hollow feeling permeated his chest. Maybe he was in love with her. Wasn't that the irony? Britt had been in love with him all this time, had fallen out of love with him, and now finally Gabe could admit he loved her to himself. He loved her. The thought brought only misery. Not of the risk he had left himself open to, but the regret of what might have been if he had only tried. Well, he was going to try even harder now. The question was, would Britt respond, or would she just do as he had done all these years by ignoring her? Everything okay? asked Max. I saw you talking to our not-so-favorite FBI agent earlier. Who? Gabe dragged his thoughts away from his failed relationship with Brittany. Oh, right. Kepler wants all our passports by tomorrow morning before the family breakfast. Max frowned. Seriously? I doubt anyone brought theirs. Why would he want them? Something about how there is a new break in the investigation and none of us are to leave the country, sighed Gabe. That guy really does take the cake. Max shook his head. Maybe Bree can talk some sense into him. She seems to be friends with Kepler somehow. I wonder why he would tell us he wants our passports so long in advance. I think he told me so he could see who tries to flee, snorted Gabe. 
The guy is playing games. I vote we don't even tell anyone he wants the passports. Do you think someone would make a run for it? frowned Max. He looked at Gabe in concern. Do you know something I don't? Gabe sighed. I hope not. We did have a break-in at one of the labs in our hospital. Parker has been leading the investigation. It might have been Garrett. Why would you think that? Max frowned. There was video evidence, admitted Gabe. It was grainy, but Parker thinks it was him. A drug was taken. I can't understand why Garrett would go through such trouble to steal a cardioplegia concoction. What is the drug used for? Do you think Garrett has an addiction? wondered Max. That's the thing. It isn't a drug which gets anyone high, explained Gabe. It's a chemical agent which contains potassium ion. We use it in operating rooms to stop the heart during heart surgeries. Has anyone spoken to Garrett about this yet? Maybe it wasn't him, ventured a hopeful Max. It is Garrett. He got a key card and a code somehow. Parker is going to talk to him since he's now the head of Ramsley HMC. Gabe shrugged. Hopefully it was all some big misunderstanding. We're trying to keep it quiet within the family for now. Maybe Garrett has a reasonable explanation, hoped Max. Maybe, muttered Gabe with some doubt. There was no reason Garrett should be taking anything from one of the family hospitals. A woman caught his eye. There was a brunette walking at the cross street. Gabe's eyes followed her, but in his heart he knew she wasn't Brittany. How are you holding up? quietly asked Max. You know, losing your position with Ramsley HMC and not marrying Brittany. I'll get another job, shrugged Gabe. As for Britt, I only can hope our relationship is not beyond repair. Gabe the Mighty has fallen. Max gave a low whistle. Wasn't sure I would ever see the day. I'm going to win her back, murmured Gabe. I recommend groveling, a sympathetic Max advised. Flowers can help, too. Candy, anything she likes, is a good start. Promise things, but not if you don't plan to deliver on them. Did I mention groveling sometimes works? Somehow, Gabe didn't think it would be easy. He wasn't charming like Max, and Brittany had been pretty clear in voice and she wanted to be left alone. Do you mind going back inside? I would like a few minutes alone to think. Sure thing, but if you need more advice, just call. Max nodded agreeably. He gave Gabe a pat on the shoulder, then re-entered the hotel. It was just Gabe and the doorman again. A couple of pigeons cooed nearby. Gabe sighed, feeling the weight of the entire world settling on his shoulders. How long he stood there contemplating the sunset, Gabe didn't know. A movement caught the corner of his eye and he looked as a car pulled up at the construction barriers at the end of the street. Squinting against the sunlight, Gabe could see someone in a tux exit the vehicle, holding the door open for a woman in a blue-colored dress, someone who was late to the wedding. Or trying to crash it, Gabe surmised. Then the woman in the blue dress put a couple of bouquets in the man's hands, she turned and helped a dark-haired woman who was wearing a white dress out of the car. The blue-dressed woman fussed over hair, took back the bouquets, handing one to the woman in white. The trio started walking toward the hotel. Gabe's heart skipped a beat as he recognized Brittany. He stood frozen, watching as she and Tara approached. It seemed almost unbearable to breathe. Gabe had been looking for Brittany all night trying to spot her in the crowd, and here she was, coming towards him. Brit? He managed to croak in disbelief, hope starting to rise within him. Brittany stopped within a dozen feet of him. A tremulous smile graced her lips, uncertainty in her eyes. I saw the house. It was beautiful. Compromised on the shower, Gabe cleared his throat, feeling nervous. Did you like the yard? I like the yard the best, Brittany replied, especially the treehouse. Gabe had an uncertain smile. I thought you would like the pantry the best. The pantry was a surprise, nodded Brittany. You had to reduce your office. It was worth it, Gabe stated firmly. 
If it made you happy, then it was definitely worth it. Brittany pleated her dress with her fingers. That's why I'm here. The pantry? questioned Gabe. No. Brittany had a little laugh. You compromised to make me happy. The shower and the pantry were proof. Then there was the backyard. I met Tom. He told me about all the hard work you and he did to make the backyard happen. The ornamental tree is crooked, muttered Gabe. No matter which way I try to angle it, the tree is always crooked. I'm sorry it wasn't done professionally. I'm sure a landscaping company would have done a better job, but I couldn't get anyone on short notice after the company I had was double booked. I love it more because you did it, confessed Brittany. I love you more because you proved you can be an equal part of this relationship. You made the house a home for us. It gives me hope that you'll keep trying and be half the equation of us. That's all I want, Gabe said truthfully. I know I don't deserve any more chances with you, but if you want to try again, Brittany, I would like to try again, too. Whatever you want, I'm willing to be a part of it as long as it's with you. Do you still want to get married? she asked hopefully. Gabe walked forward, drawn to her. He cupped his hands to her cheeks and bent down to give her a searing kiss. When he broke it off, Brittany smiled at him with delight. Is that a yes? You have got to stop proposing to me. We're going to do this right this time. Gabe took Brittany's hands in his own and knelt down on one knee. Brittany Helena Crawford, I've made a mess of our entire relationship. Ever since I've known you, I've dismissed you, and I didn't appreciate you for who you were. I was wrong. You knew exactly how things should have been between us, and I just wouldn't listen. I'm sorry for putting you in that position, for hurting you, and for making you wait so long for us. I'm going to change. I have changed. From now on, you're the most important person in my world. I promise to do whatever I can to make you happy. You're right, we do belong together. Gabe gave her hands a squeeze and took a deep breath to try to overcome the small pit of anxiety in his stomach. He was ready for this confession, Gabe realized. He was ready to risk everything, as long as he could be with her. Brit, I love you. Will you marry me? A joyful Brittany nodded as tears formed in her eyes. Grinning, Gabe stood, sweeping Brittany off her feet and into his arms, twirling her around on the street. You are invited to the wedding of the social season. This event is sure to be the highlight of the year, especially since no one is certain if all the grooms and brides will show up. Gabe and Brittany aren't getting married as predicted during the ceremony, so what couple will take their place? Will Adriana's family ruin the weekend? Just who is Marshall's bride? When a positive pregnancy test turns up, the Ramsley men try to sleuth out who it could be, while Agent Kepler from the FBI keeps sniffing around during his own investigation. It's never a dull moment with the Ramsley family as secrets get spilled, old enemies surface, and love blossoms in unexpected places. RSVP today 